Okay, good morning, everyone. It's very good to see everyone, and I'd love to see how everybody's uh, in good spirits today, being nice and social, getting ready to uh, have a nice discussion. My name is Alejandro Vivas. I'm from DTSC's Office of Environmental Equity, and I'd like to invite you all, or I'm sorry, welcome you all to today's Green Ribbon Science Panel Meeting. On behalf of the department, I'd like to thank you all for taking the time out of your mornings and days to be here. And I'd like to uh, announce or take this moment to announce the addition of those of us that are here in the room. Yeah, thank you. Um, in addition to those of us here in the room today, um, the public is also tuning in. Okay. Turn it down a little, yes. Yeah, Thank you, I think that might be a little bit better. Okay, thank you. Okay, so, um, excuse us. Uh, my colleague, Elsa Lopez, is also gonna be joining us. Um, she'll be assisting with the monitoring of the Zoom platform. If you are watching the discussion via webcast and would like to provide input, please email your questions and comments to Safer Consumer Products, one word, at DTSC. Dot ca dot gov. Again, that's safer consumer products at DTSC dot ca dot gov. If you wish to provide oral comments by using the Zoom platform, please register as an attendee at the link provided at the DTSC GRASP 2023 meeting website. In addition, you can enable the transcript function on the Zoom platform while attending the meeting. Today's meeting is being recorded and it will be posted to DTSC's public website once it's made available to the department. I'd also like to announce to those of you in the room, please mute your microphones and your speakers, otherwise we might be exposed to some uh, pretty heavy feedback. Uh, I also have an evacuation announcement for those of you in the room. Please look around and locate the two exits close to you if we need evacuation. For those of you um, over here to the left of me and in the back of the room, we have two exit routes. If we need to evacuate, which we hope is not the case, of course, um, please take your valuables with you. Our staff will work to guide you to the nearest exit. And I will also point out the signs of the ceiling um, if that time should come. Once you exit the room, please do not use the elevators. Instead, please exit down the stairways. If we need to leave the building entirely, please head towards the relocation site across the street at Cesar Chavez Park Plaza. A couple of housekeeping announcements as well. Uh, the nearest restrooms are located in the hallway outside this meeting room. The women's restroom is located at the end of either hallway and the men's restroom is located just outside this room. If you need a quick drink of water, the nearest water fountain is located next to the women's restroom. For those of you in the room, please remember again to keep your electronic devices, microphones, and everything else off so as to not disturb or provide feedback. We will be providing an opportunity for public comment later this morning. We ask that anyone who is interested in providing a public comment to please raise your hand or um, provide a public comment card for those of you in the room. For those of you tuning in remotely, you may email your comment to Safer Consumer Products. Again, that's one word at dtsc.ca.gov, and it will be read aloud. Again, that's Safer Consumer Products, one word at dtsc.ca.gov. If you wish to provide oral com public comments by using the Zoom platform for this meeting, please register as an attendee at the link provided on the DTSC Green Ribbon Science Panel Meeting website. Finally, I want to announce to all the attendees that today's Green Ribbon Science Panel Meeting is subject to the Bagley Keene Open Meeting Act to preserve public transparency of the public's discussions and decisions. So now I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over for our opening remarks um, to Kelly or Art. Or was it going to be uh, yeah. Dr. Meredith? Okay. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. It is.
There we go. It is fantastic to see everyone in person. Hopefully that, that sticks. Um, as always, a good agenda. I am very eager to hear your perspectives on where the program is, how it's going to move forward. This is a meeting that's going to be marked by change. It's um, change on a lot of levels. We're going to be, obviously, all of you have heard that um, Carl Palmer has announced that he will be retiring at the end of the month. So there's, this is his last meeting, and it'll be the changing of the guard. And um, more bitter than sweet for me, I'll be quite frank. <laughs> He's been a phenomenal partner, and I'm glad to have worked with him on this program. Um, it's the changing of the guard of our co-chairs. The entire time that I've been with the department, you two have been the co-chairs. Is that no? No, Ken Ken Geyser turned it off very short. Was that 2014? Is when you started, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. maybe six months. <laughs> oh um, and you've been on the panel since its inception in 2009, which is remarkable. And it's you've just provided such phenomenal leadership to the, the panel, um, steady guidance to the department and to SCP as we put together these conversations, you really shaped how it is that we think about how to get the most value out of the discussions we have with all of you. You've challenged us to structure the meetings in ways that really pull the, the depth and breadth of knowledge of this panel out and bring it into the program and help us implement the program. And it's just been incredibly valuable. So uh, it it's, was certainly my honor and privilege to work with both of you. Um, and I'm very, very, the state is grateful for the service that you've provided. Um, we've asked Mike Carangelo and Molly Jacobs to step into co-chair roles. And I'm um, happy to say that they have agreed to do so. Those are big shoes to fill, but um, I feel very confident about their ability to do so. Um, and so that's a lot of change. Um, I kept my comments about you short because you know if I get started, I won't stop, but I hope that I have more opportunities to sing your pra praises. Um, we, Again, change is coming. We will be recruiting more panel members in the new year. Um, we're going to be casting a wide net. We appreciate um, appreciate all of you and your net, tapping into your networks and people you think are thoughtful and would add value to the conversations here. We'd love to hear those names. Um, and I will be quite frank that it, it's a little harder to get the folks out of industry than it, than it has proven to be to get folks from the academic world. Um, and so if you can think of folks in that realm, we would especially appreciate that, those thoughts. Um, and um, we have a couple members who are, I, I, they've left or are leaving um, during this, during this Time period. So Becky Sutton is no longer on the Green Ribbon Science Panel, and I do want to thank her not just for her service on the pan on the panel, but she actually continues to be engaged with us, continues to plug into our issues, and um, so we're we have not <laughs> lost the benefit of our partnership with Becky. Um, and I, of course, have known her as a, a work colleague since before my time here, and I'm glad that that, that, continue, that relationship continues. And I want to thank Dennis Schusterman as well for his time on the panel. Um, as changes, as we grapple with the departure of, of our fearless leader, Carl Palmer. Um, we are, we know we're in good hands until we find a new deputy director. And that is to say that Andre Algazi, Jen Jackson and Nancy Ostrom will be shepherding the program on, you know, in the absence of a, de of a deputy. And I've, you know, I've been working with them for quite some time and feel very good about it. And we'll have fun along the way and um, we'll keep things moving. Um, so on that note of change, 
It is, again, a time of change. We've always had these three pillars of the program, and Carl's going to talk about those a little bit more. Um, but one of the key pillars has been to build capacity. And I can say that we have built some capacity. The program is almost, it's almost double the size. Uh, that Well, it is, I think, double the size it was when, when I started um, and getting close to double what it was even a couple years ago. And so that, again, we're poised for big things. As you talk about the priority product work plan, you're gonna see that increase in capacity reflected in what we are, our ambitious plans for that work plan. So um, we look forward to all of your input, all of your advice, and thank you for your service, for being here in person, making the trips that are not that easy to make and for carving out the time um, because we know how busy you are. Um, and so I think, did I leave anything out? I think that's it. You can always add more later. <laughs> I'm inclined to, so <laughs> thank you. Let me not take more time, thanks. Okay, thank you, Meredith. Um, uh, at this point, um, well, and thank you for your kind words. Um, you know, um, and thank you all of you. Uh, I wanna echo um, Meredith's um, thoughts and sentiments, particularly for Art and Kelly and uh, my great appreciation for all you've done for all these years. Um, and not just for this group, but I think um, our staff would say the same thing because they've benefited directly from your input and thoughtfulness and support. Um, and this part of this building capacity is so important because it's not just the number of people, it's the quality and it's the engagement that they have with all of you and in our community of practice, um, which is so important. So thank you for that. And thank you to all the members. It's great to see everyone in person um, and um, so grateful for all of your work. Um, so I'm gonna take a brief moment um, to talk about one of our, our colleagues who's not here. Um, Melanie Marty um, unfortunately passed away this year from brain cancer. Um, and um, Meredith and I had the opportunity uh, last month to go to a memorial service for Melanie, uh, which was really amazing. And um, I was struggling to think, well, what can I say about Melanie? But what I'm gonna do is just read briefly from the program from her memorial service. Uh, because one of the things that's, that was really obvious is it's hard to capture um, all of who Melanie was and all of the amazing things she did in a really short time frame. And so let me just read this and then I'll have a couple of thoughts. Um, and, and thanks. And I'm not, I don't see Lauren Zeiss here from OEHA, but she and her team uh, and the colleagues that her colleagues at OEHA put together, together this amazing uh, memorial service. Um, and this is from that. Melanie's impact on OEHA's work is present in every program and nearly every re report we produce. She was with OEHA since its inception in 1991 and touched so many of us by supporting our scientific and career development with kindness and professional acumen. As branch chief of ATIB from 1998 to 2012, she developed the health assessment on diesel exhaust, was instrumental in the formation of OEHA's children's environmental health program, developed the stochastic guidelines we continue to use for our risk assessments and so much more. From 2012 to 2015, Melanie served as Assistant Deputy Director for Scientific Affairs and in May of 2015, she was appointed as Acting Deputy Director for Scientific Affairs. Although she retired in 2016, she continued to work on various projects as a retired mutant, most recently on the Synthetic Food Dyes Report. She was part of the Green Ribbon Science Panel, which worked with DTSC on the Safer Consumer Products Regulations and other green chemistry related topics. She was also one of the key players for OEHA and the California Green Chemistry Initiative. She was very active in scientific communities. She served as chair of the US EPA's Children's Health Protection Advisory Committee for six years, uh, and they wouldn't let her go. Uh, she was active in Project Tender, which is targeting environmental neurodevelopmental risks, a group of scientists and health professionals focused on improving policy on neurodevelopmental toxicants. She recently participate, participated, even when she was in treatment for breast cancer, in putting together an amicus brief on perchlorate resulting in the manufact, mandate for EPA to finally move on regulations. Uh, she was also, as a survivor of breast cancer, she was an advocate for research and served on California's Breast Cancer Research Program Advisory Group 
and she taught legal aspects of environmental toxicology at UC Davis with George Alexeyev, um, inspiring and mentoring many future toxies and, and mentoring a ton of scientists here at Cali PA. She was a lawyer of hikes, long bike rides, skiing and outdoors with her husband and sons and friends. Her PhD work was on monarch butterflies, which is so cool. And her smile lit up any room. She will be greatly missed for her gentle spirit and dedication to bettering the lives of others and this planet. And I think that is a great summary of who she was. The, some of the sentiments that were shared there, um, well, and first of all, it was humbling and amazing to be in a room with some of the scientists and people that I've been working with or reading about and, and admiring for my whole career who were there to celebrate her. Um, uh, but her spirit was there and everyone talked about her smile and her kindness because not only was she a badass scientist and, and pardon my language, but, and she engaged in a regulatory manner with strength and wisdom and creativity, but she was just a joy to work with um, and to see her in the hall. And she was always supportive of our team and our work and she's missed greatly. I think the other thing that struck me that I mentioned at the memorial was that her contribution to our program was immense. So um, it doesn't get much attention, but our, our regulatory framework in chapter 55 of the California Code of Regulations is what we, we use all the time. What gets ignored often is chapter 54, which are, are OEA developed all of the, the hazard traits that we point to of concern, which give us the specific things that we're concerned about and that we can uh, pull into our regulations and regulate. So the fact that they creatively and progressively put persistence as a hazard trait of concern gave us the ability to look at carpets and rugs containing PFAS and treatment, card, treatment products containing PFAS. When we all know that the data on the toxicology on the traditional you know, endpoints was lacking but it gave us that ability to move forward. And that's so huge. So almost every document that comes across my desk and our desk references specifically the work that Melanie spearheaded and worked with their colleagues at OEA. So it's present every day here and it will be for, for long to come. It's an amazing legacy. She was an amazing woman. So with that, I'll just shut up, but um, I wanted to highlight that. If anyone has any. Kelly, do you have any comments? I, I just wanted to, to I appreciate that we're taking the time to honor Melanie and her, I, I can't agree more strongly of the importance of the work she did on the regulations for this program. I remember when I first saw them, I said, hmm, and didn't really understand them for a while. I had to read them a few times and talk to people about them. And then I came to realize how brilliant they were because they were so comprehensive, really giving the state the ability for decades to come to deal with all kinds of problems around chemicals and products. It's just incredibly powerful. And I, she's, she's helping all Californians and it's her, her, her fingers and her touch are just so powerful and gonna influence California for so long. So I'm very grateful that she's been part of this and really sad that she's not here with us today. We actually, I want to switch topics just a little bit and um, let you know what an honor it, it has been to serve as co-chair of this distinguished panel. And a big, big thank you to my colleague and co-chair, Kelly, because most of the time I have no idea what I'm doing. I make sarcastic comments <laughs> and Kelly would then use my sarcastic comments and build into something <laughs> that would help the program. So. <laughs> thank, thank you so, so much. Um, so at this point, let's uh, get going on. I do need to thank Art back. So it has been a very much a privilege. I'm looking forward to my final round as chair with Art at today's meeting and we'll stay with the panel. So you're not losing us from the panel, just from the leadership. It's been more, more than time to, to change roles and allow the committee to grow. Um, Art has just been such an honor and pleasure to work with and he's much too modest about his contributions. His insights, his guidance are just amazing. And it's just, been such a privilege to serve with you, Art. It's just incredible. And to serve with everyone here. So thank you. And you can go on. Okay. 
Um, at this point, I'm going to have the members introduce. Actually, before them. we go to there, just happy birthday, Kelly. Yeah. <laughs> Another celebration for Christopher's birthday today. <laughs> I was going to save that for dinner tonight. We'll sing at the break, Ann. Okay. <laughs> yeah, okay. At this point, I'm going to ask the members to introduce themselves uh, for the record. Um, let's put this in. Uh, Molly? Good morning, everyone. Good to be with you. Molly Jacobs, um, Director of Applied Research at the Sustainable um, Chemistry Catalyst uh, Research Institute at the University of Massachusetts Lowell. Thank you. Good morning, again, very happy to be here in person again um, and to see all of you. Uh, Mike Carangelo, uh, Director of Strategic Corporate Initiatives at SC Johnson. Hi. Um, I'm Tim Malloy. I'm at UCLA School of Law. Good morning, everyone. It is a delight to see everyone again in person. Um, Principal Environmental and Public Health Consulting, Anne Blake, and also uh, Executive Director of the Jennifer Altman Foundation. Good morning, everyone. It's great to be here for my first in-person meeting. My name is Suzanne Brander, and I'm an Associate Professor at Oregon State University. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Julie Shanung, and I have recently moved to Texas A&M University. Uh, so um, faculty member there. Uh, it's great to be back and see everybody in person. Good morning, um, Elaine Cohen-Hubble with US EPA in uh, Research Triangle Park. I'm in the Center for Public Health and Environmental Assessment. I am Helen Holder, and I'm um, extremely recently retired from HP as the chief technologist of their computer business. I should have introduced myself before. I'm Meredith Williams. I'm the director of the Department of Toxic Substances Control. Carl Palmer, deputy director of Safer Consumer Products. And for the record, I'm Kelly Moran, San Francisco Estuary Institute. And I'm Art Fong. I'm the technical leader for smart chemistry at Apple. Um, so this morning we're going to have. Oh, yes, Jeff. And yeah, um, let's have the members uh, joining us by video conference introduce themselves, uh, starting with Emma. Good morning, everybody. Emma Lavoy, US EPA, uh, Office of Research and Development. Emma, thank you. Um, so this morning, Carl will provide a program update and panel members will have the opportunity to ask any clarifying questions uh, we will then proceed with the public comment period. After the break, Carl will present a summary and highlight from uh, SCP's recently published 10-year anniversary report. The panel will have the opportunity to, re to reflect on and share their insights regarding the lessons learned and key achieve achievements from the program's journey over the past decade. Uh, in the afternoon, we're gonna continue our discussion on the theme of looking forward. Uh, this will guide the program's progress into the next decade. Uh, following that, we're gonna have a presentation from Andre Agassi, and I'm gonna need help pronouncing this next name because I've asked five um, staff members and they've all given me different pronunciations. Uh, so it's Teglet. Uh, it's Teglet Murat Khan. Thank you. Um, <laughs> on the 20. Uh, 24 to 2026 priority product work plan. The panel will then initiate a discussion on this work plan. So um, at this point, Carl, uh, oh, there he is. <laughs> Thank you, Art. Um, yeah, uh, I'm pleased to give a, a program update uh, as we usually 
have done in the past when we were remote, we did it uh, via video, but um, I'm gonna do it in person. There's a lot to cover. So I'm gonna um, touch on a lot of things and we'll have an opportunity if you wanna ask questions, but basically gonna be going over what's going on with the Canada chemical list, what we're doing with re respect to new priority products for listing, what we're doing in, in ramping up our alternatives analysis capabilities and our regulatory response work, which is just starting uh, a, a brief touch on some of the legislative action of relevance, and then talk about uh, building the program and leading. So um, the candidate chemicals list, um, we have proposed this year to add two classes of chemicals to the candidate chemical list. And we discussed this previously in uh, a couple of years ago with the, the Green Room Science Panel about our thoughts on microplastics. So we've, we've had two workshops this year, one on microplastics proposal and one on a proposal to add PPT derivatives. Um, and so we've had put out documents on this and requested input. Uh, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about the rationale. I'm gonna focus on PPDs because that's more timely and in the front of the line. Um, microplastics, there will be more discussion on certainly later as we move forward. But um, why PPDs? Uh, basically our interest in, we've recently listed tires uh, automotive tires containing 6-PPD as a priority product. So um, it's important that we look at alternatives to PPDs in tires, and as the industry moves through that process, uh, one of the obvious places to look is at PPD derivatives as alternatives. Um, our concern is that uh, many of those alternatives, if you look at that class of chemicals, have uh, very similar characteristics. And so, um, and, and those characteristics and the endpoints, and particularly in the environment, are of concern because of aquatic toxicity and impacts on the aquatic environment. Um, and so, it's important in going through the AA process that um, that class of chemicals be considered in the alternatives analysis. And by uh, listing these chemicals in our CC list, that um, puts a front and center the research on that class uh, and will help the manufacturers uh, move through that process. Importantly, it will also um, give us the ability when we get to the, the last part of the rulemaking process in terms of potential regulatory responses, it gives us more latitude to impose regulatory responses if appropriate, if um, those chemicals are on the list and they've been identified by the manufacturers of something they want to move to. Um, and also we recognize as we start looking at this class of chemicals that they're used for a, in a variety of other types of products. Um, and uh, we've gotten a lot of information from the industry themselves and, and our staff have done a lot of research and found that eight of the derivatives are actually high production volume chemicals in the US uh, and using a wide different wide array of different types of products. Uh, we haven't looked much at this yet, but it is certainly something of concern when we look at um, uh, the exposure and, and fate of these chemicals in the environment that we may in the future wanna look at some of these uh, products as well. Um, the next steps really are th that we're going to um, collect all the information we've gotten through our workshop and comments on our, our, our public technical documents. Uh, we'll then start putting together the rulemaking package uh, to list these chemicals on the CC list but that will go through external scientific peer review and we'll initiate rulemaking next spring. So we're excited about this. It will be the first time the department has actually um, added chemicals to the chemical list. And then we'll uh, follow with a similar process with microplastics um, in the new year. Um, also just I'm not highlighting all the specific changes to the list, but what we're also in the process of doing is developing a, what we call a change log so that everyone will be able to see the changes in the list on a regular basis. We curate that list pretty much continuously. It's a fair amount of work. Um, so we'll be able to share that so people can, can see. Um, and another really important and, and interesting um, thing that's happened this year is that we found last month that uh, the department's website, the, we had the most hits on our website from people actually looking at the candidate chemical list. Um, and when we looked at who was looking, it was clear that those were manufacturers of cookware products and people who sold cookware products. And the, we believe the reason is that because AB 1200 requires that beginning next year, manufacturers of those products in Cal that sell them in California must uh, identify if any of those list chemicals are in their product. So this is important and, and it's uh, good to see that the list is actually being useful for people who are trying to uh, be in compliance with the laws of California. Uh, moving on, um, we've adopted two 
priority products this year, the first one being nail products containing toluene. We've been working on that for quite a while. We actually did two rulemakings on this because as we went through the process, we got input from uh, the manufacturers about um, our alternatives analysis analysis threshold, which is the, the level under which you um, do not have to be subject to our requirements. Uh, we found that that was an issue in, in our research on nail products because there's a lot of toluene contamination out there and it's unintentional. So we had to be more specific about how um, the methodologies that would be used by manufacturers to document that threshold. Um, and so we did two rulemakings on that actually, uh, and that's now in place. Um, and the other rulemaking we did this year was, as I mentioned earlier, automotive tires containing 6PPD. That was based on our concern about their, the acute impacts on coho salmon in the Pacific, on uh, the Pacific Northwest. Tons of work going on that, more on that later, but um, we accelerated that um, process pretty significantly. And now that it's in place, those folks are moving towards doing the AAs. Um, and, um, uh, so that there's work to be done there. Um, and then there's a variety of things in the short-term queue here. We, we're in, right now in public notice period for laundry detergents containing nonophenol ethoxylates. That's another one that had been on the back burner for a while. This one we believe should be relatively easy because um, most people have moved away from these, but there are certain industrial users that um, are manufacturers that still use these, these products. And we think there's uh, safe alternatives. Um, we'll then be going onward and looking at tires containing zinc, which we were petitioned to um, uh, list and we approved. Um, and we'll be working with the tire industry and the zinc folks on that. Uh, additional nail products containing MMA planned for the early next year. And then there'll be some rulemakings that are really different. They're not listing rulemakings, but they're to um, implement the requirements and, and authorities that we received in SB 502. Um, and we can talk more about that later, but essentially that authority gives, gives us the ability to point to other people's good work and accelerate the process that we have. So we, rather than us uh, having to have a manufacturer to do an AA, if there's another great AA out there, we can point to that. But there's some nuances in how we would implement that that will, will require some rulemaking. Um, and then we're also planning to start cleaning up some of the the, the framework regulations, there are some anomalies and inconsistencies that we need to address. Um, and we'll have more discussion on, on that early next year. I won't spend much time. There are a variety of things still in the queue that we've been working on, everything from artificial turf, where we're hoping to have a webinar early next year. Um, and, and our colleagues at OEHA have been working on other aspects of that. Uh, personal care products with 1,4-D, hair relaxers, additional nail products, We've been doing a lot of work on quaternary ammonium compounds or quacks or quats, depending on your perspective. Um, and we're completing work on children's products uh, that will, will point us towards adding uh, new products in that realm. And you're going to be hearing later about the priority products work plan, which will outline these, these categories as well as others that we're planning. Just a reminder that um, one of the best places to get information on what we're actually doing day to day, quarter to quarter, is our SCV timeline, which you can go to our webpage uh, and get. And you can sort by category, you can sort by specific product, you can sort by um, you know reg where we are in the regulatory process. It's a lot of information. You can't really see it on this slide, but go and play with it. And if you have questions, let us know. But we're being very transparent about the major projects we're working on. Um, and then we found this be helpful for all of our stakeholders to know where we are in the process um, and to keep us accountable for what we're doing as well. Um, alternatives analysis. We're really um, excited to have augmentation of staff and leadership to work on alternatives analysis. We're going to be actively working on with the tire industry on their alternatives analyses for tires with 6PPD. That's going to be a lot of work. Um, we're also going to be implementing our EPA grant on AA tools for EJ communities, looking at updating our user guide, and then we will continue to work in the community of practice. There's a lot going on in this space. We were fortunate to send staff to the recent uh, international symposium of A4 held in uh, Tacoma, Washington, um, which is a great group of folks. And Molly, thanks for your leadership with that group. Um, and um, there's a lot to be done. So we're excited about that. Um, just some specifics on the details. Um, the process is robust and a lot of work. So we received 83 notices from manufacturers 
um, that say that they sell tires in California that contain 6PPD. Now, we worked very closely with the U.S. Tire Manufacturers Association, who only represents 18 or 20 uh, manufacturers. So there's a lot of players in the space. There's a lot of process. We've done a lot of work to you know, help them get through the process on how to do the notifications, how to navigate the regulations. We've done training, and we will continue to support that work so that they can do good AAs. Their first preliminary alternatives analyses will be due at the end of March. So we're looking forward to that. Um, and in that space, there is a lot going on. Um, and this is really exciting, uh, both with the manufacturers, but with our colleagues in Washington and other states, with US EPA, uh, with the tribes, with the chemical manufacturers, we've been uh, very engaged. Uh, and I just put up a, a clip here from US EPA's recent granting a petition for tribes to take action on 6PPD and tires. Um, that will be a long-term effort. We'll be coordinating with EPA um, on what they're planning to do under TSCA or not. Um, um, but safe to say there's a lot of activity in this space and we're actively engaged in um, a lot of great work going on. Um, the other thing that I wanted to highlight, and you're gonna hear more, more about this tomorrow, um, is our work on regulatory responses for the spray polyurethane foam uh, industry. Um, I'm not going to go into details about the steps, but we've, you know, we um, are happy to be where we are. Um, you may be aware that we were sued by the American Chemistry Council and others uh, challenging not just the SPF um, a listing that we did, but fundamentally challenging our authority and the way we've implemented our, implemented our framework regulations. I'm happy to say that uh, going through the California Superior Court and the Appellate Court, uh, the department won on all counts. And so it's really great to get that affirmation that um, the, what we've constructed in regulation and the way we've implemented it is legally defensible, which is one of the key criteria we use in adopting the regulations, um, which was that, you know, are they meaningful? Are they practical and are they legally defensible? And now we can definitively say to that last question, yes. Um, the other thing is compliance assessment. Again, with our build out of staff and, and capability, we're gonna be doing more to assess compliance with our regulations. Um, we've done work, uh, we recently published our, our report on nail products uh, content. We are in the midst of right now, sampling and analyzing carpets and rugs for PFAS. And we'll soon be looking at treatment products that were also listed um, in, and ultimately uh, additional work on nail products. The commitment here is that we're not just asking people to do this, we're gonna make sure that they're doing it, right? So that's a fair amount of work. We're gonna have the resources to do it. That means we have to go out and purchase and collect materials. We have to work with our colleagues at Environmental Chemistry Lab to develop the methods and ability to sample and analyze and then circle back with the manufacturers to help them make sure they're in compliance. Briefly, um, there've been a wide variety of laws passed in the last year. Many of them related to PFAS, the uh, last two years actually, um, and some vetoed. But uh, the department's concern on, on many of these were was that while well-meaning, they were put in what we call the orphan code, which didn't identify a specific state entity responsible for assessing compliance or taking uh, enforcement action. So um, we've been actively engaged with the legislature and our colleagues at the attorney general's office to look at, you know, how are we going to, as California, ensure that uh, people adhere to the, to the laws uh, and that we're addressing PFAS in an appropriate and meaningful way. So, um, more to come on that as, as we work through the legislative process. Um, uh, I did want to do a this is a shout out for Kelly. Uh, you know, I, it, w it wouldn't be a grass meeting if we didn't talk about brake pads. Uh, and, um, but uh, I wanted to highlight that this year, um, our staff put together, as was required by the statute, a report to the legislature on the success of the brake pad uh, laws, which were required uh, the reduction of copper and other heavy metals by manufacturers. Um, and Kelly and others did uh, really important work years ago to identify the concerns, particularly to the aquatic environment and fish um, that resulted from um, break friction material wear that got into our aquatic environment. Um, we are happy to say that the industry, from our assessment, has done a pretty good job of, of meeting those requirements and continue to do so. Um, we did recommend that uh, the, the, the legislature consider 
uh, enhancing the ability for California to do a more comprehensive environmental monitoring um, and to get the data to support the success of the policies and, and regulations that we and the manufacturers are implementing. So that was a, a good milestone. We continue, we also note that we received uh, two staff um, to actually maintain our work with brake pads uh, and to ensure that um, they stay in compliance. And if they, there are certain provisions in the law which allow them for extensions to meet some of the deadlines, but that's a fairly rigorous process. And if and when that comes, we'll be prepared to work with them on that. Um, and to building capacity, um, you know, you've heard from us before about um, the, the efforts led by Meredith and others for, at fee uh, uh, reform uh, for the department and addressing a broad array of needs, um, including those in this program. We we're fortunate to receive new resources, uh, 37 new positions. Um, and this is sort of the mix of how we're allocating them. This has um, been an amazing opportunity um, it's been an amazing amount of work, um, but um, I'm really happy. And you can see here, our leadership team uh, is now in place. Uh, and I'm really happy that Jen Jackson and Nancy Ostrom have joined Andre as our, and our branch level managers. Uh, we've also hired a bunch of amazing supervisors and staff, uh, and we're about halfway there um, because we still have more people to hire, but um, it's, 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 Navigating the state hiring process is a challenge, but we've been very, very successful. I can say with great confidence that um, we've hired some amazing people and we have an amazing team. Uh, and um, I really feel that when you hire amazing people, uh, they hire amazing people and bring and work with amazing people, including all of you. So it's really um, gratifying that we, uh, and I'm thankful that we have the resources to fully implement our program. Um, and as Meredith alluded to, there's expectations that come along with that. Uh, and I can safely say that our staff have high expectations as well. So there's gonna be a lot of work moving forward and we're really happy about that. Um, again, just about collaboration. It's so critical to everything we do. Uh, it's on, continues on an ongoing basis. Uh, we have our, our MOU with EPA. We've signed our West Coast MOU with Oregon and Washington. And we meet with them every month. Um, um, we uh, are participants in the Tosca work group of other states and local governments that Jen Jackson helped coordinate before she got here. And we're, and we're continuing to work on. Um, and then the myriad of you know, industry, academic, advocacy groups that are in our space that have brilliant people that we can, can learn from and, and help us meet our mission. So that will, all continues. Um, back to the graphs, um, ongoing encouragement for us to engage in the scientific leadership and community. We continue to work on publishing more documents. This year we published four papers. Uh, I've highlighted them here. Everything from alternatives assessment work to work on um, uh, quacks or quats, um, and then um, is critical issues in terms of policy for PFAS, including looking at the essential use concept uh, and looking at 1,4-dioxin um, contamination in drinking water. Um, and I would point to our webpage where we've highlighted all the various papers we've published, uh, and we're also doing more to, to put out educational materials, including fact sheets and videos, uh, both for the people we regulate and for the general public. And here's just a, a snapshot of some of those that we did for PFAS because there's so much going on. There's a lot of information gaps and misinformation that we we're trying to fill. Um, and so we've, we're working on that. So this is just really a snapshot of a lot of things that we have going on right now um, at a high level. And uh, with that, I'll say thank you. Um, and we have a little bit of time now. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for the update. Uh, before we go on to the clarifying questions from members, I was just informed that another member of the panel has joined us virtually. Jack, uh, would you mind introducing yourself, please? Uh, thank you, Jack Leinard, uh, consultant to the personal care industry. Uh, spent most of my career at Unilever. So just want to let you know I'm here, so it's on the record. Thanks. Welcome, Jack. And uh, in terms of asking uh, clarifying questions, uh, for members who have not been to actually an in-person meeting, we use the name tent method. So to get into the queue for asking clarifying questions, are there any clarifying questions for Carl?
Yeah, Mike. It's an amazing job presenting that, Carl, and, and encapsulating a whole lot of excellent work into a short presentation. So, so th first, thank you for that. Uh, just a, a clarifying question. So with um, tires with 6PPD and then tires with zinc and then nail polish with toluene and nail polish with MMA coming at different in different timings, how did, how did you consider, is that gonna impact the alternatives analysis when you're, when you're gonna reopen the same priority product potentially? Well, I, let me make sure I have your, your the question. Well, uh, what you highlight is that we're always juggling um, and, and that the process um, is sort of linear on one hand, uh, but there's overlap sometimes. So for example, with the tire industry, um, we prioritize six PPD and tires. We'll be working largely with the same people on zinc. Um, there, we, one of the things we've learned is the complexity of products. Um, there's a lot of overlap and you, there's not, there are very few isolated things that you can just remove and plug and play and they're related. So there's a, you know, how zinc relates to six PPD is a good question, but our perspective is that we're all learning and that when we get to that point with the tire industry, they'll be better informed through the process of six PPD. Um, and then on the other side of that is on our side of, of the house is that, uh, these all have their own process. Um, and there's overlap in time and, and up until just now, what we've been doing is literally juggling staff back and forth and shifting because we had to shift with the regulation. We didn't have enough people. Now we have staff dedicated in, uh, in their, each of the branches for parts of the process. We're still matrix managed in terms of we're, we're benefiting from the wisdom across the program, uh, but we'll have people who are dedicated to those steps in the process. Um, we feel that we're, our target is that we think, and we've committed to doing five priority products a year uh, when we're fully staffed. We're not quite there fully staffed yet. We think that's very realistic. Um, we're yet to know the level of effort that's gonna be required through the regulatory response process, some of the compliance enforcement process, and, and certainly in the AA process um, that can, vary a lot because there's a lot of different pathways. So the long-winded answer to your question is we're not entirely sure how it's all going to work out, but we're committed to doing it and we're going to keep our pedal to the metal uh, and we'll adjust as, as we have to. But um, I'm not sure if I answered fully answered your question. Yes, you did. Thank okay. you. I knew you had considered it. I was just curious what the process was. Mm -hmm. Okay. Can I just jump in and uh, just add a little something to Carl's answer, which is we do regularly meet like on a at least monthly or might be bi-weekly basis to sort of look at our priorities and see where we need to potentially, you know, put more resources or emphasis on certain projects over others. Obviously, there's some timelines baked into the uh, all of the regulatory response process, but we, we do try to check in. Um, regularly to make sure that we can meet our, our commitments and, and get the high priority stuff done that we need to. It's been um, amazing looking through all the materials for the meeting, so this is wonderful. I actually am just curious um, on legal challenges, so that, that is exciting that that one was challenged, yeah. <laughs> um, was successful for the, for the program. How are you, or do you, um, um, how, how are you thinking about future challenges? Do you see things on the horizon? Are you um, doing things to anticipate, mitigate future challenges? Thanks, Elaine, good question. Well, you know, we, we have a, a, a lot of history in the department of, of regulating. And so we're very conscious when we do regulations that we need to be uh, legally defensible. Um, and we, we have some experience in that. I think that uh, we were pleased with the outcome of that lawsuit because fundamentally there were four causes of action. One was a CEQA issue, which was relatively minor. The other ones were really attacking our, our framework. Uh, and uh, 
the courts said, no, we follow the rules and we operated, you know, with our decision making was sound. So um, we know that we can still be challenged and, you know, we can be sued and we probably will be. And we're, we always prepare for that. So I don't know that I don't know that we are concerned about any uh, legal aspect that we're moving forward. I mean, there are other things that are going to be potentially in question, everything from federal preemption, potentially down the road. But again, those things take so much time um, that we're just going to keep moving forward and doing what we do. And if we get challenged, we'll address it when it comes. I don't know if anyone on the team has any concerns or I'm going to look to my legal counsel, uh, Lynn Goldman, if there's anything you think we should. Uh, we don't have any Yeah. Yeah. And I, just a shout out to our legal team um, and the AG's office is that was a, a three year process. It was a lot of work um, in dealing with the lawsuit. Um, and um, and I, it's very gratifying that um, we were able to really document that the work we put in the front end to make sure that it was legally defensible uh, was done well. And so, so can I just follow up then on timeline? So tip this is me paying attention or fully aware, but what is, so typically now, especially now that this fundamental piece mm -hmm. is, I think it is a really significant accomplishment. So then going forward, how does that impact timelines on the regulations, right? So if it, somebody does take things to the courts, up the regulations for that it, period it's that three-year period oh well it, it depends on what they challenge us on and okay. and you know in that case that we still were concurrently moving forward to get through the aa process what and then once we got to that point then we stayed our activity until the, the lawsuit so um again we're prepared and and certainly you never know if someone's going to sue you um but we're it's something that we're constantly aware of um in terms of making sure that what we do is legally defensible okay. Uh, Meredith, did you have something to add to that discussion? Yeah, I would, I would just add that because of, number one, the regulatory threshold, which is, is there a potential for exposure and is there a potential for that exposure to contribute to or cause um, harm? That's a very, that gives the department tremendous discretion. So from that point, we're very confident about our priority product listings. And then you add on to that the scientific rigor, the fact that we go through the external science peer, scientific peer review. We are very confident about uh, on the priority product listings, our ability to withstand challenges. So um, from that fundamental standpoint, I think that what we may start to see is challenges for other against other parts of the regulations. And, and let me just add to Elaine is that importantly, as Marilyn Meredith pointed out, from the very beginning of the program, we were very conscious that because this was a very different approach and we had a lot of discretion, it was really critical that uh, our work could be reviewed and subject to the questions of rigor, uh, completeness um, and and quality. And in some sense, we can look at that. Maybe we went overboard on some of these things. I think the other thing is we also, from the get-go, had a, a, a significant commitment to transparency and public engagement for all of our decision-making processes. And frankly, that slows things down, right? So one of the things we'll be looking at moving forward is, you know, uh, we sometimes hold workshops, we put a lot of work and we don't get much feedback. Um, so the, there's, a, there's a value question there is like, well, we want to be transparent. We want to be, people understand the rationale for our decision making and give them an opportunity. But sometimes it might just be better to go a little faster and maybe not work as hard to be that defensible. So something we're, we think about a lot. Go with Anne and then I'm going to ask if the members joining us uh, remotely, if they have any uh, clarifying questions. Anne? Thank you. And thank you, Carl. It's um, being among the few that uh, lingering folks that have been on this committee since 2009, I believe, it's really heartening to see the growth of this program and the capacity that you're building. So thank you for covering that. And of course, you had to cover a lot in a short period of time. So my, my clarifying question is, uh, where are you on the hiring process? I know you've got a lot of balls in the air and you've promoted a bunch of folks. Congratulations and congratulations on some of your, your new members who are real gems from the field and for promoting your internal staff. But yeah. uh, where are you on filling the rest of the spaces? 
We're, we're roughly about halfway. And what we did was we spent a lot of time up front, which really paid off in terms of recruitment and education. So we held a number of uh, virtual open houses and we created our own little ambassador program so that all of our staff who have connections to both uh, academic institutions and professional organizations, we could get word out. And we and it turned out that our first wave of hiring, a large number of the people we hired actually had attended some of those because it's difficult, as you can appreciate, I know, and that how does it, the state hiring process work? What is the, this classification? What do we pay people? What are the, you know, these are really important questions to people who are looking for a job. And so we invested a lot in that. We had great partnership from our admin folks and our, our HR shop to, to hold those workshops. Um, and we also were cognizant that we wanted to get diversity in our, our workforce. So we reached out to HBCUs, we reached out to uh, communities where we felt we could benefit from that. We had some traction on that. It's difficult. It's hard to hire people into the state at the salaries we pay, scientists in particular, um, but it really paid off. Uh, but it was somewhat slow and it was a lot of work, particularly on our management team, our supervisors doing the hiring. It was a collective effort. Um, it slowed some of our work down because um, of the investment we made. Um, but uh, we've got our, our branch managers filled. We've got five more supervisors to fill of the 12. Uh, I do want to also acknowledge uh, Tony Luan, who was a long-serving member of our team and for the department, retired this year. And Tony was, was instrumental in particularly the development of our alternative analysis framework components and with his team. And so that's a loss for us. Um, but we also were able to promote into the supervisor position some of our outstanding uh, staff, which is also important for succession planning, long-term investment, and to give people... Uh, the investment we make in hiring is huge, uh, and we get great people, and we want to keep them. So, But that then creates vacancies behind them. So we've got now most of our scientists filled. Uh, we've got um, five supervisors, and then we've got some engineering spots to fill and a couple uh, like a, um, uh, economist position and a couple of analyst positions. But now that we have the supervisor in place, we've got experience. It'll, it'll go a little bit faster the second part of this, but... Um, yeah, thank you. But, um, and thank you specifically to our management team who not only, like, I must say, is like, if we worked in the state a long time, is it's not just hard putting butts in the seats. We really work at, at getting people who we know can collaborate, who are team players, who know how to deal with adversity, who can engage with all of our stakeholders, engage with all of you, and be ambitious and mission driven. And, and they've done a great job of, of doing that. So I'm very grateful. Um, Jack, Emma, do you have any clarifying questions for Carl? If not, uh, let me- not, I was just gonna say not in particular, but it's, it's really impressive to hear um, the summary and, uh, and, and well done. And this is Jack, I think, as, I, as we look forward into the next year or two, the regulatory responses, I think, are going to become that much more important and how you go about writing those, what are the things you take into account. That's going to be a big issue, I think, for manufacturers. Uh, now that they're doing the alternative assessments, but what is your response to those is going to be really critical. Thank you very much. Uh, at this point on the agenda is the public comment period. Thank you. Um, okay, so for before today's panel discussion, we're going to take public comments. Um, if there are webinar participants who wish to comment at today's meeting, please email your comments to saferconsumerproducts at dtsc.ca.gov, and we'll read them aloud. Comments submitted remotely will be read to the panel after we hear from commenters in the room. And then subsequently, we will additionally enable attendees to, to deliver any oral comments via the Zoom platform. The public is reminded that today's comments are directed to the Green Ribbon Science Panel and on the agenda topics. That is the materials that are presented to the panel. Public comments directed to DT DTSC are not appropriate at this meeting. And please note that the panel is not able to respond to comments or answer any questions as this is a working meeting. If you have not signed up to comment, you may do so at this time. Staff have commenter cards 
for you to indicate that you wish to comment there in the back of the room. Based on the number of comments, we may need to limit time, but it doesn't look like that's the uh, case today. So um, we'll go ahead and begin with the commenters in the room if we have any. You see any commenters? Okay, and, uh, it looks like we do not have any commenters in the room. Um, do we have any online? No, no online? How about Zoom? Anybody in Zoom would like to make any comments? I didn't hear anything on Zoom so far. Okay, so it looks like we don't have any public comments for this portion of the meeting. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and close the public comment period uh, for the moment. Again, last chance in case anyone has any. Okay, so um, at this point, then we're gonna go ahead and take a break until uh, 10.30. Um, so yeah, it's 10.05 now. So that'll be about a 25 minute break. Um, Does that work or we can go ahead and shorten it if you'd like, since we didn't have any public comments. Um, no, no, let's um, stay with, uh, come back at 1030. But before we go, are there any more comments or clarifying questions for Carl? Um, I actually have a comment on the uh, slide that you show about, you know, recruitment and what Ann said about the success that you've had. But you've mentioned in past panel discussions or meetings that recruiting is one thing, but retention is another challenge that the program faces. So could you talk a little bit about that? And also, is there anything the panel can do to try to help with the retention? Besides, you know, uh, salary increases, <laughs> which I think uh, is critically important for state staff. Um, yeah, thanks, Art. It's a good question. Um, I think that's there's, there's some layers there, right? Um, again, certainly, I can't speak to the salary issues. Those are subject to collective bargaining, uh, but they are real. I will say that. Um, and, and, you know, the bottom line um, is we benefit from the commitment of our staff um, to public service. Um, but it is a concern, certainly for us, when we look at um, the job market today, the, the, the hybrid workforce issues, the um, uh, mobility of young folks in the job market. Um, and you combine that with, in a good way, with their ambition, intelligence, skills, um, is that one of the concerns is when we get good people, we wanna keep them because it's a significant investment and we want the best people. I think what we're doing internally on that front, number one is with the hiring, is that we invest in that significantly so that we make sure that we're getting people that are not just skilled scientists and engineers and technically, but they're a good fit, that they align with uh, the goals of our program. Um, and so that's the first step. But the, the other one is a lot of what you don't see is our investment in our staff is, and that is in part of making them partners in what we do to give them all good work so that there's always a certain amount of not fun work, but to get, make sure that we're challenging our staff, that they are meeting them where they are in their specific concerns and interests. Um, and the managers do a really good job of that. We're fortunate to have very motivated and creative staff. They're always pushing us upward, which is a really good thing because there's always opportunities to do more and do to do better. It's a good challenge. At the same time, um, the work is hard and it takes a long time and there are, it's a large bureaucratic system. So uh, making sure that we support our staff and make sure that they get the training that they need, that they avail themselves to all the resources and that we have a, a culture of support. We've implemented our own mentoring program within the program so that not just the supervisor is the person that the staff can go to, but a colleague who they can inform. This has been critical, particularly when most of our work is remote. Uh, and we're trying to work through now, what are we going to be doing in the next coming months, years in terms of the hybrid workforce? Um, what the panel can do, uh, I would say, is continue to challenge us and to give us input and to engage with the staff. One of the things in the last few years, I think of the grass meetings that's been really helpful, is having more of a collaborative engagement, both during the meeting and, and outside of the meeting, for things that you, good ideas that you have. That is super critical 
Staff really appreciate that. Our staff want to be engaged with leaders. They want to be on the cutting edge. They want to be not just churning out widgets. They want to be making a difference. And those of you, are, you are all doing that in your own way. So that engagement is really key. Um, uh, and I think lastly, um, holding us accountable and keeping us challenging to, to pay attention to the why the people are here and what we want to do and supporting us because um, we're fortunate to have people who just don't want to do, you know, crank something out. They want to make a difference. And that's hard too um, in a regulatory environment. Um, and it's hard to be leaders sometimes. Um, so your, your support of that for the department and for the director who has the challenge of leading and balancing all, all our little program, we're always pushing Meredith, but Meredith has a much bigger plate that she's responsible and accountable for um, and other entities that she needs to communicate the value of what we're doing. So supporting the director uh, is also really important. But um, so keeping that up, I think is, is, is helpful. Thank you. Um, comment? Yeah, I just wanted to follow up on, on this, um, the issue of the scientist salaries. Uh, that's, I, for those who aren't aware, uh, the scientists um, within California EPA are, are have lower salaries than other employers like US EPA, other government agencies, as well as private agencies. Um, they also don't have pay parity with their coworker engineers. So it, it's a very significant difference. I know folks who've been supervisors who are getting paid less than the engineers who work for them. I mean, we're, we're talking, you know, sometimes 30, 35% difference. So this is a really big thing, which has caused me to have incredible respect for the personal contributions and sacrifices that state scientists are making, especially to be part of this program. So that's something I recognize every day. The quality of the work in this program to me amazes me that folks are doing that at the salaries that they're being paid. So I, it's just, I honor every single person who's here. Um, I see this as a long-term threat to the Safer Consumer Products Program and to science within Cal EPA generally. Um, it's effect, uh, it's to the ability to retain a talented team is really, really important for SCP. Um, in other agencies, I've actually seen the lower ability to have science involved in decision making actually change decision making in a way that's harmful for the state. So the, this has been going on since the 1990s. There was actually litigation that was won by the scientists that said they should be paid the same as the engineers, yet still our policymakers are not taking care of this. Uh, recently, there was a three-day strike. Uh, some of our colleagues went out on that strike. It was really sad to see that happen, yet I supported them because they really need to call attention to the importance of this. Um, the issue on this is not here at DTSC, and the staff can't talk about it the way I'm a little more frankly, <laughs> um, because it's, a, it's the governor and the California um, HR department that needs to do that. So I wanted to raise it publicly because I think it is absolutely crucial for this program. I've been talking about this since the 1990s in every forum I can and to all directors and leaders that I have. And I know many of you have also raised this. So I encourage you to continue to do that. Um, take those opportunities and to join me in sending the message to the state of the importance of paying scientists a fair salary an equitable salary, a competitive salary, so that we can keep them. And I also suggest that all avenues need to be pursued. That at this point, the department may need to collaborate, say, with DPR, which also has a chemicals policy program, and take a look at some of the position classifications, because there aren't good position classifications for PhD scientists in particular, hiring and retaining them. Um, the, the position descriptions don't match well with the kind of work that goes here. And I think DTSC has done an admirable job working within that. But it may be time to think about other HR solutions to uh, make sure that the depth and strength and education of the staff matches its demands. So um, thank you for letting me make that comment. And I, you know, I hope others will also join me in sending this message to the governor and Cal HR and how important this is for the future of Cal EPA and for this program in particular. Uh, thanks, Kelly. Uh, Claudia, do you want to respond to that? Or? Uh, I just say thank you. Uh, um, yeah, I, you know, I know Meredith and I appreciate the support that you have always given to our staff uh, and, and the importance of, 
of doing good science and 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 the work that we do in public service that that's so we really appreciate it. Zane? No, no. Uh, um, I I wanted to see if you could just give a few more words on the um, a grant to look at EJ incorporating. Sure. Um, yes, we were fortunate to get a, a, a pollution prevention grant uh, year before Jiang, last year, year before last. Um, and um, the the P two grants, it was fortunate that with the infrastructure money, they had an infusion of money. And importantly, there wasn't state match required. The state grant process is often challenging because of just the logistics and the match and the value proposition, but we felt this was a good opportunity. And so our proposal was looking at how we can facilitate the development and implementation of alternatives analysis and assessment tools with a focus on how meeting, uh, looking at EJ and, and disproportionately impacted communities. So when we look at products, you know, they're sold everywhere, but some of them were targeted for different communities and some of the impacts are disproportionate to different communities. So figuring out how, what tools we can do and how we can do that process is important um, and something we haven't completely figured out. There are, I think, three elements of the, of the, um, the proposal. One is, um, and, and this will essentially be looking, it's sort of pass through money to get researchers to, to participate and to work with uh, organizations like A4 and others to say, uh, what are best practices? What are some specific things that can address those types of concerns? Um, um, not just general AA, but when we're looking at those targeted communities, uh, we're looking at doing some pilot projects uh, and also some community engagement so that we can get some feedback from the people we're trying to serve about what this means to them. And this is, you know, sometimes in our ivory tower, we get the information we get from the internet, but we're not actually out there. But we are doing some things that sort of stimulate and go along with community science, for example, our colleagues in our environmental chemistry lab and some of our staff work uh, in East LA with high school students doing uh, a project to look at getting um, some of their personal care products and actually analyzing them and seeing what's in there. Um, and this was in uh, an EJ community. And so that gives us information. So that kind of thing, uh, building practices and tools so that we can say, if we want to prioritize these communities which are disproportionately impacted. How do we do that? What are the tools we can use? And that's a broad, I'm, I shall, I don't know if you want to add anything or if this. Okay. Um, and it's, I think it's a three year grant. So we're in the process now of trying to get folks to work on that with us. We haven't actually started the, the work. We actually have a question from um, a member of the audience as well. I just have a quick question about one of the slides. So it talks about there's a artificial turf. There's a webinar, it's gonna be early 2024. Um, maybe it's in the afternoon agenda, but I was wondering, is that the material is also related to tires, like re re the playground material from recycled tires? So it's also all related. Yeah, just high level. And then Andre, I don't know if you want anything is that, you know, we've been looking at uh, artificial turf since we started looking at carpets and rugs, because we got input saying that that was something that people wanted us to include that in our, our listing for carpets and rugs. We didn't think that was appropriate. But um, yeah, we've been looking primarily at the, the turf itself, not the crumb rubber uh, component of turf, because it's complex product. But and our colleagues at OEI are, are have been working for quite a while on, on doing a full-blown risk assessment, looking at the crumb rubber and turf. So we're hoping to put out a background document, have a public workshop, talk about what our, where we are and what the information we have and where we might go with that as potentially listing uh, as a priority product. Um, Andre, do you wanna add anything? Our focus with artificial turf will be on um, the blades and the backing and not the infill. But that's not to say we're not concerned about crumb rubber, it's just covered elsewhere in our um, work on tires. Yeah, and I would say that one of the things that this sort of highlights, there's a lot of crossover when you get in the real world, like tires and microplastics, right? Uh, and tires are end of life or recycled into a variety of products. Um, so, you, you know, when we start saying, well, uh, and when you hear about our, our proposal on the work plan about looking at 
uh, products that potentially generate microplastic. There's a lot of space. And so one of the reasons we want to have engagement is to hear from stakeholders about, well, what information do you have that can better inform us? And, you know, or is there something we should be looking at or, or information we have? But uh, we're hoping that that will come out uh, soon about when we'll plan for that. And Julie, uh, go, let's go to you before we take the break. Well, I want to start by commending the whole team uh, for tremendous progress. It's wonderful to see the staff increasing and see the, the rate of activity just ramping up exponentially. Um, I want to commend you on the publications. So there's a few there that I'm going to make sure I archive and share around the world. Um, but my question to you or comment is that you've also increased your online presence uh, in a really significant way with the chemical, the chemical list, your timeline, um, beautiful publications that you've shared with all of us. I'm just curious, is that also internal? Do you have good support for what you need for developing your uh, websites and databases and your communications network? Thanks, Julie, great question. Uh, when we um, went through the budget process to, build, to get these new resources, one of the things we identified was a need to have technical folks that are committed to communications and coordination on, particularly on, on EJ communities, because what we found is we have great, fantastic people. Steve right here is from our comm shop. Um, but their training is in communications and web development, things like that. And this nexus between the technical and the policy and the tools and the community is really important. We've made a lot of progress. We now have a unit, Simona Balan is our new supervisor for that unit that's in charge of communications. Part of her mandate is to work with our comms folk and our web folks and to look at how we're communicating with our stakeholders. We're, you know, we've got all kinds of ideas about doing podcasts, about we've, if you can go on our, our web page, you can see some of the videos we've done. And some of those have been very targeted, like the training videos we did of like how to get through the AA process and, and um, which are valuable, but a fairly narrow audience. The other big thing really is the general public. Well, a lot of the questions we get are, okay, you're regulating this. How is, what choices can I make as a consumer to, to help myself and protect myself? That's a challenging question. We have some, we're contemplating things like we have a, a concept called, called the pearl, which is really to facilitate innovators in, in the business industry and shine a light on some of the work they're doing in innovations that can then point to safer alternatives for consumers as well as for manufacturers. That coupled with some of the work we're doing with um, a company called Clearia, who's uh, scraping the web for consumer information, gives us a lot of information in terms of potential exposure, but also gives us an, a window into looking at how people buy things. So there's a lot of work to do there. We've made a lot of progress. There's a lot to do, but the good news is we now have some scientists and engineers and analysts that are really focusing on the value of that work and the need to work with our comms folk to up our game in, on many fronts. So thank That's you. That's great. Cause yeah, the, you need that cross communication Absolutely. within communications and yeah. you're doing really well so i'm good i mean you, many of you i know we over the years we've talked about risk communication it's it's hard you know when you're and it let alone when you start getting to like if you're going to in the target aisle how do i decide this versus that and, okay safer choice great program go buy that one but what about when you've got 23 ingredients on these other things you know so it should be done great uh thank you very much let's take a break and meet back at 10 35 10 35 thank you Okay, everyone, thank you for coming back from break. We're going to go ahead and start the meeting again. Those of you online, welcome back. I'd like to now hand things over uh, to Carl so that he uh, has a presentation for us regarding SCP's 10-year anniversary report. you all right well thanks um i'm what i'm going to do is in the time i have is is try to highlight um 
uh, the report that we just released this year uh, celebrating the 10 year anniversary of the adoption of the framework regulations. Um, and um, uh, what I'm gonna do is just do a little bit of history to set the, you know, to give us some context uh, and then do some high level discussion about not all the things we're doing, uh, but sort of some of the uh, important concepts and, and some examples. One thing I would encourage you to do is if uh, those of you listening and anyone here is to um, go and actually look at the report, because uh, as I was thinking about this presentation and you look at the report, it's relatively short, but there are links to much, much work there. And it's the kind of thing where you go, oh, what was that? And you start click on the link. There are many rabbit holes to go down um, and a lot of great work. Um, and I think the other thing uh, that, that speaks a little perhaps to uh, Elaine's question earlier is like the importance of communicating what we're doing with our stakeholders. And so this was a fairly rigorous effort on our part to reflect on where we've been and what we've done. And then we'll be talking more about where we're going. Um, so I'll just get started and, and we'll go and we'll have some time for some questions. So the report's online. There's also a storyboard. There's some fact sheets and there's some, there's a, 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 a vi brief video that also is kind of a good snapshot. Um, and I just want to do a shout out on the video is like when you watch the video, uh, the narrators for that video are our staff, which is for us was really cool because um, shout out to all of our staff who have really uh, have done this work. So it was an opportunity for them to speak to what they've done. And that was really cool. Um, historically, the department, which has been around quite a long time, I was I started in 1986 and we were just still in the division of the Department of Health Services. But still today, most of the department's 1,200 or so people work on cleaning up hazardous waste sites and regulating hazardous waste, which is super important work. Um, but um, as time went on, we also added a variety of toxics and products laws, uh, most of them banning or restricting certain things that are sold because of their concerns of the chemical exposure. Um, and also, uh, and we did a good job on most of these things, um, but it's a little different. And we also had a, an extensive pollution prevention program. Um, and, but in the California legislature, uh, there started being bills to ban certain products um, and with good reason, um, but there was a certain amount of chemical whack-a-mole going on, ban BPA in this only to be replaced by BPS, et cetera. And that led to um, uh, sort of a, a, an understanding of a need to change some paradigms and to the way we think of things. And certainly a huge part of that, I'm pointing back to uh, Paul Onassis and John Warner's book in 2000 and, and all the discussions about the concept of green chemistry. And now we've, we're evolving that into safe and sustainable chemistry and, and things like that, which is really important about how we, how we work in a regulatory environment, which usually comes much later than the concept. Um, but that concept was taken and built upon by Mike Wilson and Meg Schwartzman and others in the Green Chemistry Report in 2006 that was commissioned by the California legislature. DTSC then took that work uh, and did our own green chemistry initiative, which looked at ways we could um, actually work uh, and, uh, on these concepts and make a difference. And importantly, from my perspective is that uh, in Mike's report, um, they, he focused and they focused on the data gap and the safety gap and technology gap, and there were various aspects of that. But importantly, that, that nexus of, of those things uh, is some of the things we've really been trying to do in our program, right? Which is to increase transparency about what chemicals are uh, and ingredients are in, in products and both for the benefit of the marketplace and for regulatory purposes to look at assessing risks uh, in a different way uh, and to shift some of the burden away from government to have to prove everything before we can take action. And then importantly, also to look at the drivers that stimulate innovation and that help everyone make good decisions. And so we're a small part of that greater effort, which is ongoing on many fronts all around the world. Um, but in our way, we, we uh, were fortunate that um, uh, we, in, in 2008, uh, bills were passed that gave us the authority and the responsibility to implement our regulations under Governor Schwarzenegger and then subsequently under Governor Brown. Um, and then you're all familiar with the cornerstone of this was of this 
authority was the, what we call the eighth room criteria, which is that rather than having a silo of just looking at air or just looking at water or just looking at human health, but really did more comprehensively look at chemicals, um, you know, work in the environment and in products and their function and their impact. And, you know, I like to say that chemicals don't follow the laws of man, they follow the laws of nature, right? And so this is an alignment issue in some sense of trying to get our laws and our structures to really be more real. Uh, and so we're fortunate that when we had this mandate that we crafted regulations to encompass uh, assessing all these imp impacts across the entire life cycle of products. Um, that process to develop our core regulations was long. It was five years. We had starts and stops and lefts and rights. Many of you were involved in that, thankfully, um, and uh, a lot of uh, work that, that got us to the 2013 when we actually adopted the, the Safer Consumer Products Regulations. Um, and when Meredith came on as deputy director, the the then question shifted from, okay, now we've got these regulations, how are we gonna do it? <laughs> what are we gonna do? And this is where um, she and we developed this concept of what we need to do was build capacity, execute our mandates and do the work and lead the way. Uh, and so that's sort of been our overarching framework and implementing. Um, and so that's what we've been focusing on when we look back on the last year, what have we actually done? Well, we started with, as Meredith alluded to, <clears throat> a smaller group of roughly uh, you know, 35 or so people. Um, and they, they were cannibalized from our pollution prevention program, which we um, had spent, done a lot of great work on. And some of you were instrumental in that. But at the time we recognized that a lot of that great work hadn't been implemented, that we didn't have the ability to compel people to do it or force people to do it or incentivize people to do it, good work. So we shifted gears because we had very limited resources. So we started out with a small team. <clears throat> um, and then we said, what are we gonna focus on? We started looking at our first priority product work plan, which you're gonna hear more about our next one. But we started out with these categories, um, some of which we're still looking at, uh, others which we abandoned or researched and found that it wasn't gonna be fruitful. Or in the case of fishing and angling equipment, <clears throat> again, we learned a lot. We didn't think that was a big deal. And we got 2,000 letters from California anglers saying, don't regulate my lead weights, knowing full well that there were safer alternatives to lead fishing weights. And there still are, by the way, maybe a discussion for another day. Um, <clears throat> but we learned a lot. Um, we also invested in this concept of alternatives analysis. And so <clears throat> with uh, Tony's leadership and Xiao Ying and her team, um, <clears throat> and a lot of collaboration with our colleagues at the Interstate Chemicals Clearinghouse and others in the room and across the country, compiling this guide of, of tools and methods and approaches to alternatives analysis or alternatives assessment as many call it. And again, it's a resource and we're gonna be building that up in, as we move forward as the community of practice builds. Um, importantly, the administrative processes are significant in our process. We built our CalSafer web portal and where's Balku? Is Balku in the room? <clears throat> Balku, her. I want to shout out to her and her team and our IT team who <clears throat> built this system from scratch and blood, sweat, and tears. Uh, and thank you, Kelly. Um, it's not perfect, but uh, it is a way that all of our stakeholders can see the process, can see the comments, can look at the CC list <clears throat> and search it. <clears throat> Um, so that was a major achievement. We'll continue to uh, refine that tool. And then just to touch on, you know, we're always focused on what are we done and what are we doing? And oftentimes that focus is like a number. So like, how many widgets did you do? Well, we did a lot. We've done a lot of widgets. We've done, you know, we're going into our fourth priority product work plan. We've got seven priority products listed for regulation. We've researched a bunch of categories. We've looked at class of the chemicals. We've published documents. We've um, engage on many workshops and public comments and dialogue. Um, and the last one on here is an important one back to Art's point about sustainability and recruitment. We started our own uh, early career scientist program where we are bringing in interns. We work with our colleagues at, at Berkeley and Davis and others in engaging with um, people, the, the, the scientists and engineers of the future. Uh, and to bring them into our world, both to get 
work out of them, which we get some amazing work out of them, but also to get them excited about service and what they can do professionally. <clears throat> um, I'll just touch on <clears throat> key milestones in terms of the priority of products. Um, <clears throat> we have seven. And you could, if you were to look at these in categories, you know, we knew with the first priority product, the children's products containing certain flame re retardants that were carcinogens, we knew there were safer alternatives. They knew there were safer alternatives. We didn't get any AAs because they tried to get out from the regulation. They did the right thing. They moved to safer alternatives. We went out and tested and make sure they had win-win, right? Um, compelling and encouraging the market to shift. Again, um, with methylene chloride and paint strippers, that had been work that we and EPA and others had been working on for many years, our colleagues at the Department of Health Services. Um, and we finally took action and that stimulated, I think, um, along with a lot of public support, US EPA to take action and collectively, now California has been protected from methylene chloride and paint strippers and other um, uh, products which historically have had very <clears throat> adverse and significant effects. Um, the spray polyurethane foam work that we did, and we knew going in, when I said to Debbie Raffel that we'd won the lawsuit and that we were now moving to regulatory response, she's like, well, that's exactly where we thought we would be. Because when we picked that product, we knew that it was a true green chemistry challenge, is that it wasn't so much of, of there's an alternative, you just need to move to it. It's like, no, this is a really good scientific question. We've gone through that process. And we're now entering the regulatory response phase and we're gonna continue that process and require the manufacturers to do more research and work to see if we can make safe and effective products in this realm. Um, and then I think all the work we've done on PFAS, uh, importantly, <clears throat> not only for specifically carpets and rugs and treatment products, but in the whole discussion about PFAS, the work we've done to say, look, we should treat this as a class of chemicals uh, and we should look for safer alternatives. And you see much movement on that front. Um, the work we've done in the nail uh, sector has been significant on many levels. I have a slide here that I'll talk about that in a minute. And certainly the work we're doing on tires was very responsive to emerging science that, that has been a problem for years. And we saw an opportunity to make a difference uh, and that's what we're doing right now, along with a lot of others uh, across the country and around the world. Um, so what are some of the impacts? Notwithstanding the numbers, how many widgets, we've, how many things we've done, what are some of the impacts? Importantly, when, we, when our staff looked at this, well, let's look at methylene chloride and PFAS. Well, can we figure out, it, have we reduced exposures through this process? And what we found was, and, and you can look at the report and the calculations are in there in the appendix about how we, the assumptions we made and the data we use. But what we see is that a, a, a reduction of over 1.3 million pounds of methylene chloride and a quarter million pounds of PFAS in California a year. That's not trivial. That's not just a number, that's an impact. So we're very proud of that and we hope to see more of that. The same thing with food packaging. We, it didn't go the way we thought. We'd spent a couple of years and a lot of engagement, a lot of work looking at specific uh, PFAS contain, uh, food packaging containing PFAS. Um, the California legislature came in and said, wow, Looks like there's, you guys have done a good job and they accelerated that process by passing AB 1200, which um, put restrictions on PFAS in certain food packaging. So again, and as I highlighted earlier, last month, that industry hit our website 15,000 times to look at our CC list to see um, what chemicals they have to report to consumers that are in their products. In the nail sector, I wanna highlight this one because we've been working on this prior to the, this program, um, but in the pollution prevention world, but also working with local governments, we're trying to do best practices in salons, but we've regulated certain products with toluene. We're looking at other products. We developed a he healthy nail salon recognition program, which has best practices and tools for local governments to encourage um, salons to use. Um, and we're doing the work to make sure that people are both in compliance, but shining a light on other things that could be done in that sector. Again, one of the points being is that um, our process by design and construct looks at one priority product at a time, a, a chemical and or chemicals in a specific product. It's not the Tosca approach and kudos to our colleagues from EPA who have that challenge, right? Is um, more comprehensive use of chemicals in every condition of use you can imagine. 
Um, so there's a certain whack-a-mole characteristic to our process as well, but what we try to do is leverage that in a manner that stimulates innovation, has an impact across the sector. Um, and so we send the message that you can make products that work in a safe manner um, and engage with everyone who has a decision to make in that process. Um, uh, another thing I wanna highlight is that um, one of the things that's exciting about having more staff and the nature of our scientists and engineers these days is that they have skill sets that are, that are cutting edge and current. Looking at the ability to collect and mine data and cross-reference information from different sources for different purposes and use it in our work is important. So this is a slide from uh, the work we've done looking at 1,4 dioxin contamination and aligning that with the Calvin virus screen information on impacted communities and seeing that, yeah, we know that there's contamination in drinking water of 1,4-D, does it matter? Yes, it matters. And it matters more in some areas than other. And that helps inform us about what we're focusing on. Another thing I wanted to show you <clears throat> is a project um, done by two of, uh, at the time of our interns. Elena, are you here? I thought, Elena, raise your hand, she's back there. She's now one of our hires, our, our new scientists, thank you. She and one of our other interns worked at looking at collecting data uh, on what manufacturing happens in California, uh, what, what is actually happening on the ground, and then looking through lenses, both through things like looking at TRI data and other data to say, which chemicals are they using? Are these in EJ communities? And what's the nexus between what they're doing and what we're doing? This is just another way of looking, of collecting data and using it to help us make focus good decisions about where we can be impactful. And this is exciting to me because what Elena brings to the table uh, and a lot of our new staff, as well as our existing staff, is <clears throat> this level of, of information and analysis, which can make us do better and do more. Again, uh, some of the, the things that we we've, we've dove into with good intention and not a lot of knowledge is how do we address consumer products that affect certain <clears throat> disproportionately impacted communities or sensitive subpopulations. Women's hair uh, um, care is an issue and, and women who have curly or kinky hair that use products to straighten it, we had concerns about it. <clears throat> we didn't have a huge knowledge base on this. We worked with our Office of Environmental Equity to learn about how to speak to people in that community, what, what People are actually using these products for who uses them, how often, what are their chemical ingredients as well. We held a workshop, we made a lot of progress on that, and now we're focusing on, is this an area where we can identify some specific products that, that are ripe for our regulatory uh, approach? <clears throat> and again, there's just a myriad of things that we're doing on, on levels um, from, as I highlighted earlier, what we're doing in the CC list. Uh, one thing I wanted to to point out on our work on 6PP and tires, while the initial focus was certainly the impacts on salmon, coho salmon, what we found is that dialogue has continued, is that there's more and more research happening out there that shows that these chemicals are of concern to a, a variety of fish, maybe not at the same acute level, but importantly also the nexus between that impact on fish and the impact in tribal communities where um, salmon are a key part of their culture, of their food source, of their um, uh, entire existence. And so it's a great opportunity to look at, we're not just talking about ecotox, and we're not just talking about human toxicology, we're talking about systems. We're talking about things that make an impact throughout their life cycle into things that maybe we hadn't even imagined. Um, and then as we do that, we're looking at the same thing with microplastics, which there's going to be a lot more work. What, is, what are the concerns? And the science is just rapidly going and Suzanne and others who are working in this space are um, really stimulating us to look at where might we be to say, how can we contribute to, um, to addressing some of these issues? And then again, um, PFAS is another area <clears throat> where we've done a lot of work uh, and I think made a difference because some of the things we published on the class approach, the importance of that, uh, we also published recently uh, along with other scientists um, on the concept of essential use. Uh, and when you start saying, well, are there concerns, but how can you navigate this broad array of chemicals and products and the variety of, of both their impacts, but their uses and their, the, the needs. So on that note, um, 
the the policy oriented things we're doing do translate into us taking action on a regulatory basis, but it also is important because it moves the conversations forward uh, with everyone in the in in the mix, whether that's the the manufacturers who make the products, the advocacy groups that are concerned about it, the consumers <clears throat> and academics who help feed the process for innovation. Um, so um, anyway, um, so we've done a lot to publish things. We are, are also engaged in, in communities. So we signed on to the principles for ingredients disclosure because it is important to us that we know what <clears throat> chemicals are in products. And it's, it's good to see that that I think the culture of that is changing across the country. Um, again, I want to point to collaboration. Um, it's critical to so much that we do. We don't have, even with the new resources, we have enough resources to reinvent the wheel. We don't want to do that. We want to be smart. We want to learn from our colleagues from every stakeholder group. And that takes work. And one of the great things now, and one of our, our objectives of the management team is to get our staff engaged more um, at the ground level with a lot of these organizations so that they can work on projects and they can be engaged. And it's not uh, a question of bandwidth at the top who knows the concept, but we have scientists and engineers doing the work with people in other areas. Um, and then um, again, back to transparency, um, we work really hard to uh, have a project management culture where we set specific goals and try to deliver. Um, and there's a lot of balls in the air. Sharing that with all of our stakeholders is important so that they know what's coming uh, and that we can benefit from all their work. Another thing I wanted to highlight is that we've worked hard over the last decade is to be accountable. Um, and so what we did early on when Meredith was first deputy director, we had an internal strategic plan. One of the goals was to document our work and to come up with an accounting system so that we could both <clears throat> better manage our resources um, and be accountable uh, to each other and to our, the people we serve. That paid off in, in a big way when we went through the reform process and we were able to articulate to both the legislature and the administration what we were doing with what we got and how we were, didn't have enough to do what we were asked to do. And so that was really important in a lot of work. Again, back to the capacity building. Um, the boxes on here is not, again, not just we move from one branch to three branches, from <clears throat> three units to 12 units, but importantly, what are they doing? You see on the right-hand column, midway down, market research. That's a whole discipline. We now have more people to actually economists that can go in and mine data, who can find sources of data, who can help us do economic analysis and impact analysis. Communications and environmental justice, it just doesn't happen. We now have a team that are working with our communications folks and our and everything we do to say, who do we need to talk to? Are we in the right space? Do people understand what we're, we're doing and are we effective? Um, data science and analysis. Topher Buck's in the room. His group now, uh, we're getting people who can go find data, mine data. We're gonna finish our, uh, our work to get authorization from US EPA for CBI information under Tosca. We're gonna to do things that give us more tools and information that is, are the coin of the realm in what we do. Um, compliance and enforcement and regulatory response with Jen's leadership and the people to do it, we're now gonna have the ability to do that. Um, and we've been doing it as we can. We've, we've done sampling analysis, we've taken compliance action, but it's been a one-off. It's been like, who do we have who can do this now? Um, and we've done a good job with that to the extent we can but we're gonna to continue to do more. Uh, and then toxicology and exposure. Natalie Pham, who's in the room, I believe, uh, Natalie, yes, um, and, and Lynn and her team, um, having the expertise to <clears throat> not just look at traditional toxicology issues, but looking at the use of NAMs and other tools that we can um, use in a forward thinking, precautionary and decisive way to use good science, not just the way we've done it for the last 30 years when I came on, but what we're doing on the cutting edge, but scientifically sound um, and, and just developing those tools that can make us better. And, and we're happy to start doing that. I, and, and we've already started doing that. So I, we had a workshop on the, uh, the PPDs uh, proposal for 
Can, and I was so excited. I was watching and, and Lynn, Nock, I, I forget, and I, one of our staff, Logan, or they were talking about, well, we've actually used read across to say, um, like, well, we've assessed some of these alternatives and we know there's problems there. And that's enough, right, on one aspect of this. It, the team didn't think that much of it, right? Because they're like, well, yeah, that just makes sense. But that's what we're doing now. That's the mindset we have now. It's like, we're going to use all the tools we can with the authority and the, and the discretion we have to make good decisions. And we're doing that already and we're going to do more of it. Um, and again, um, uh, I also want to take a moment to shout out to what we call our operations uh, group that's led by Baku. Um, this meeting getting a rulemaking done, hiring people, getting a contract, um, you know, paying for travel claims, it just doesn't happen. And, and the reality is in the state, it's a grind. And we're really fortunate that Baku and her team have been there for us along the way to support that, uh, along with all of the folks in our admin shops uh, and support here at the department, um, because it's a lot of work. Um, and so, it just doesn't happen. So thank you, Aku and your team. Um, and um, I think the other thing is the core work we established in terms of our product chemical evaluation and our regulatory process and our policy analysis will continue. And we've done a lot of that um, and we're gonna continue to do more. In terms of building the program and tools. So one thing I wanna stress is that the great thing about building the capacity is we're not doing it like this. We're not hiring a bunch of old white dudes with, with, with slide rolls. Some of you know slide roll is it was a tool, you know. Um, uh, so um, the point being is that we are hiring staff and we have hired staff who have a myriad of skills and capabilities and, um, and perspectives. Uh, it's a very diverse staff. And the same is true for the tools. We're not like resting on our loyals of the old risk assessment tools that we use. We're saying, what are the new tools? What can we do? And that's part of our culture that we've built and we will continue to build um, so that we don't all look alike and we don't all have the same tools. We're using a variety of uh, uh, tools from a variety of perspectives that makes us stronger. Um, and kudos to our management team who has worked hard to, to bring those people on board and to build the, the program that we have. Um, and lastly, you know, uh, Claudia Polsky, uh, who many of you know, who worked with us and continues to work with us, coined this phrase about um, our program being, you know, the shadow being bigger than our shape. That was a really good metaphor when we were really small. It's still true today. Even though we're doubled in size, we're still pretty small for our ambition and for the, the, the um, work that we want to do and we plan to do. Um, and I would say that if you took a little different spin on this, what we're hoping to do is add more people into the picture, right? To make the, the shadow even bigger for everyone. So that when we collaborate with people, when we get the input from all of you, is that it not just makes us stronger, it makes us bigger. And, and part of the great benefit of having uh, more staff and good leaders is leveraging, is collaborating, because we can't do it on our own. Um, and so many good people across the country and across the world are working on these things. So I think the, the shadow will continue to get bigger um, and, uh, and will also help determine its shape. Um, so just lastly, again, I get a little wonky sometimes when I think about we're changing the paradigm. We've actually, you know, back when we first started, um, you know, there was a lot of engagement about the, the, the core regulations. Like, what are you doing? What's the threshold you're talking about? What, how, what's the scientific approach there? And what we're moving from is not just the, and I don't want to discount the value of risk assessment and its, its quality and importance, but moving to a, a, a system that says like, not what's okay, what's the acceptable level of harm, but to a system of saying, how good can we be? Can we make products that still work? Can they be safer for people in the environment? Uh, how do we do that? Um, and what we're doing in our way is to leverage the authority we have to encourage and compel people to do that. So we moved, you know, when I first started in the department, we had a pollution prevention program. Again, it's, it's not rocket science. You know, it makes perfect sense. How do you do it? It's harder. 
The same thing's true when, you know, back then when we were talking about sustainability, now we're there's a lot of talk about circularity. All of these things make sense. But what we've started to do in our program is connect dots that allow us to be part of those discussions on circularity and sustainability and safe and sustainable chemistry uh, in the real world. So um, I think that lastly, uh, when we started, I, I put this up that Debbie Raffel, our former director who really was the shepherd of getting the regs adopted had these criteria saying, we want it to be practical, meaningful and legally defensible. And that really helped us get across the line to adopt the regs, right? And we've worked in that last 10 years to be meaningful, the work that we do meaningful and as practical as possible. We maybe have some work to do on that one. And we've demonstrated that it's legally defensible. Meredith and what we've done in, in, with our team in the last year is try to build capacity, execute and lead. And we've been doing that on a variety of fronts. There's still work to do. Uh, we've done a lot of good things um, and we hope to do more. Lastly, I just wanted to highlight um, again, back to our culture and our team is that we got together over a year ago and, and decided we wanted to talk about what are our values, what drives us, who are we as the Safer Consumer Products Program? And staff came up with a whole myriad of uh, qualities and aspects of who we were. And they distilled it down into this little acronym, SCP Rocks. And I think this is a good snapshot of who we are which is that we believe in scientific rigor and collaboration and perseverance, um, that we respect each other and the work we do and all of our stakeholders, whether they're in industry, advocacy, academia, the community. Uh, and sort of by definition, we're an optimistic uh, and creative crowd. You know, we believe that we can make a difference. And we're, we've done that on, on many levels to some degree, and there's more to do. And the bottom line is we all believe in service. Um, and um, I'm, I'm very proud of all we've done. And I'm very thankful for all of you. So that concludes my presentation. <laughs> well, Carl, thank you very much for the presentation. and for your leadership. Um, at this point, are there any clarifying questions uh, based on the presentation or the supporting uh, material? And uh, just, um, keep in mind that, you know, uh, uh, if, if this is for clarifying questions only, if you have questions that are more suited for the panel discussion, please wait until then. Um, let's see, Helen. No, no, go ahead, please. I just kind of, I wanted to um, reflect that, you know, you've asked the panel many things over the years and we've given you lots and lots of input and guidance. And really a lot of what, we're, what I'm seeing is how responsive you have been to us. So I made, as you were going, I was making my, my, my list. <laughs> and so um, we encouraged you to have scientific rigor. That's number one. I'm like, wow, that's awesome. Uh, we encouraged the publication, right? You know, that was like, like the whole first year was like publish, 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 and you're really doing that. Um, some of you will, will remember that one of my things was about economists, right? And, and data mining and all that. And now you're, you're doing that. Um, using existing AAs, another, you know, you know, broken record, uh, you know, and you're, you know, you're doing that now partnering um, with all of the different potential partners and you're being very um, maturing the tools and systems, which was a huge concern, huge concern at the beginning, especially with the, um, the list and the maintain maintenance of the list being sort of like a very big, big concern. And you've, you know, systematized that, um, another sort of, uh, recurring theme was how to do, how to structure a regulatory response when the, the regulations themselves are um, structured around responsible entities, individual entities. How could you have a coherent regulatory response when the, it really, there's no mechanism for that. It's really built around responsible entities. And you've actually managed to do that as well. Again, you know, 
just um, impressed that you were able to do that. And again, just incorporating the best practices of methods, you know, read across comparative exposure, all the different things that we've talked about from the technical guidance. And so um, again, uh, you have a trajectory going forward, which I think is and momentum. Um, but I also just want to acknowledge how, um, as we've given this input, as we've given you the feedback, you've really responded to it. And I just appreciate that very much as a panel member. Thank you. <laughs> uh, thank you, Helen. Um, anyone else? I, this isn't really a question, but I didn't earlier get to acknowledge Carl for your leadership. It's just been amazing, and I don't want to, I don't want to make anyone any sadder, but um, I, I think that your leadership has been crucial to this program. It's not just the directors and other folks that you cited, um, but particularly I always think about your optimism, your respect, your inclusiveness, um, your moral compass is really strong. In, in all things and um, the support of the staff. And there's so many things that you've done that's just been amazing that's made this program a success. So I'm very grateful to you for that service. And I also want to acknowledge the, the three um, branch chiefs who are here, um, all, all three of you, I've known you all for many years in various roles. And I, I think you're and just an incredibly talented bunch. I have deep respect for all three of you. And I'm really psyched that you have different skills and experiences. So the three of you together are stronger than any one of you. And that makes me very optimistic going forward that the culture the department has built um, in this program will remain and strengthen. So thank you. Kelly, thank you. Now, let me chat with our members who are joining us uh, remotely, Jack, Emma, do you have any uh, questions for Carl? I'm good, this is Jack. Yeah, no questions, thank you. See, before we get to the panel discussion, I also just wanna say that Carl, your career is what a public service Shining star looks like. I mean, that's just amazing what you've done here. So, uh, congratulations and thank you. But I couldn't help but help but notice that the slide that you have on a bunch of middle-aged guys with a slide rules. <laughs> um, that's from IBM, where I used to work. <laughs> so I, well, I was actually looking for a picture of myself in that. <laughs> uh, well, uh, let me just say thank you. I want uh, Helen, thank you for noting that because I think um, we we so all of us appreciate all of your input today and over the years. And um, I, I think one of the great things about our staff is that they look to leaders, right? Because they want to be leaders and they want to be on, you know, on the cutting edge. And so that input that you guys give, they take really seriously. And and it's it's great that we've you know, it's not always easy to figure out how to make progress on some of those and some of those like publishing, as you all know, it's it's a fair amount of work, you know, but it's been valuable um, and it's really strengthened our program. And, and in terms of uh, Kelly and Art, and thank you for your compliments. Um, it's been, a, I've been really humbled and honored to be here. And the best thing about being here is just all the amazing people that I've been able to work with that share that kind of commitment um, and, um, you know, you look around the world, there are many things that are of concern that are, can be kind of depressing. Um, but, um, I think in November when we all got together, our team, I was so energized and so optimistic. I'm like, I, they don't really need me because they're, they're, they're going to do great things. And, and to, um, these guys and everyone, I'm so thankful and to all of you and I feel really blessed. So, um, and I'm not, you know, I'll be around. So if anybody has any questions, I, you know, I always have an opinion, so, but thank you. Um, so at this point, I'm going to ask the panel members for their reflections on the Safer Consumer Products uh, Program's um, progress in the last decade. And uh, to be begin, we'd like to ask each member to offer their initial reactions and their preliminary thoughts on the questions identified in the background uh, document. And so the major themes 
uh, that are brought up in this initial discussion will inform the rest of the discussion. So let me start with um, Julie on your... <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I was going to say, you, you first have to ask Julie if she's on her sugar low, <laughs> if it's come. Yeah. Um, well, I just want to start by echoing the very positive comments, uh, Carl, for your leadership, everyone on the team. Um, I was going to put my card up, but then I decided not to. But the, I think the respect part of your SCP rocks is really important. It's a really tough job to recognize that the different stakeholders are driven by different things than what you are driven by. Companies in particular really don't want to be told to take stuff out of their products. And so I think that it goes a long way when they know that you're trying to do something good and help them along the way to do it right. And it's just been wonderful to see the change, um, the leadership of this program you know, the whole idea of that different paradigm to an alternatives assessment perspective is just um, very powerful. So I, I wanna echo those comments. Um, but I'm gonna pass on any other comments at this time, thanks. Okay, so um, I, I guess I'm just gonna pick a couple things. Um, I mean, the, you know, the contributions have been spectacular. You started out, um, Carl, talking about uh, one of the goals or a big goal stimulate innovation. And, um, you know, and I think your program's well on its way to, it has done a lot to stimulate innovation. Um, get a little or people or sometimes I hear concern about the um, whether substitutions are safer or you know whether regulations that ban things um, consequences but I think in in general having you know this you know the the list of chemicals there, there you send a lot of signals and those signals um, in and of themselves are, are pretty powerful. Um, so, so to me, um, just from the kind of very science side of things, the, the technical, so the chemical lists in general, the technical reports are uh, that, you, that you have produced are absolutely outstanding. I mean, I, I think those reports are gold. They're, they're incredibly, um, thorough, rigorous, comprehensive, and really informative. And then I think the, um, the, the one thing um, that I don't think I, that I don't hear um, enough is the partnership you have to, to measure chemicals products and the, the measure, the measurement. I mean, I think by the end of, by the end of the day, you'll hear me talk a lot about measurements. I mean, I've been um, with EPA now 27 years and um, for whatever reason, land in an exposure science and um, kind of been all over the place in exposure science and more and more and more and more, I'm uh, advocate of, we, we just have to measure. We just have to measure. Um, we can only guess so much. Um, and so I appreciate this, this program. I think there's a lot of other opportunities we can talk about in the future part, but I, I think one of the, um, the, the couple of places where you've actually gone, measured, and put out that information has, has been um, and just the fact that that's something that you can do and are, and are willing to do is, is. I'm Elaine, sorry for, sorry for interrupting. Would you mind moving the mic closer? Oh, I was just there. gonna say I'm, I'm done. Oh. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, nobody heard any of it. <laughs> um, um, no, they did not. Could you repeat the whole? <laughs> um, okay. So technical reports, and then measure, 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 and um, and then um, and then just the stimulating innovation through the priority products list, and and the other things that you're working on. So, 
I will leave it at that for now. Thank you. Thank you. It's not even working. Yeah, <laughs>
it's, it's an exciting proposition. Thank you. Uh, let me go back to Elaine. Okay, so, so thank you now that this is working. Um, so there was just one other um, connecting the dots in terms of what you've done and, and might be carrying through to the future. Is it, I, I've noticed um, that a lot of the um, chemical product categories that you've ended up going forward with or that have been particularly compelling have a um, occupational exposure component and it's a kind of peri-occupational like not a, a you know more um, people working in small firms or on their own um, and that I I think um, I think I'm raising this because first of all that's sort of what's jumped out to, uh, uh, to me as what has kind of bubbled to the surface when you've done all of this extensive amount of research into the different product categories. Um, but just something that I think we'll probably want to keep in mind when you talk about the work plan and what things can and, and you know, should be listed for the coming years. Um, great. Let me go to Kelly next. Okay. Thank you, Art. Um, let's see. Ho hopefully I'm loud enough without blasting it out. Um, I wanna come back to monitoring this afternoon when we're talking about looking forward uh, and also echo the comments of the um, prior folks that spoke, I, especially the publications one, because in addition to getting the talents and information knowledge out there, in the, it's also very helpful to have publications in the record to support regulatory processes, because that peer review gives it an extra level of credibility. Um, there's a number of things I'd like to commend. Uh, the most important thing is um, the accomplishment of the program in building its foundation. So building the systems, building the culture, uh, finding the funding to grow it to a, a fully functional program. Uh, these are huge accomplishments that are very much behind the scenes and made a lot of people feel like the program wasn't doing anything. And I I really honor those because I see how hard it is in government to do things and build those well. And this chemical policy program is the only one that I know about, at least in North America, that is so full of integrity and its approach is very unique. So I, I just really want to commend that foundation and systems and culture that I think will make the program a really successful program as, as a long term thing when, now that it has the, the funding. Uh, also the partnerships and the relationships with other state and the partnerships uh, with Kelly PA. So other agencies and how you all are learning to work together. That was one of the many fights with the pollution prevention program years ago was that lack of Kelly PA-ness. And now I think that's that has just been a really, really huge thing. Um, other things just to call out, um, there were two reviews of the program. There was a six year prioritization retrospective um, and the Public Health Institute report in 2018. I think that's something that's really great that the program has done, kept getting internal and external reviews of itself and its functions. And I hope that you'll continue that. Um, and the, um, let's see, the a couple of minuses. One was that I regret that it took five years between passing the bill and getting to the regs. Um, at the same time, I don't regret it because the right leaders were in place and a good decision-making framework was there. When we finally got to the regs, there was a big reg wrong direction that then got righted. But five years is a long time, so it makes people feel like the program is five years older than it really is. Um, and a plus minus the petition process, um, it, I'm really super, super, super glad it exists, uh, but it's been very slow. The pilot implementation isn't complete. You received a petition in 2018 that in 2023 still hasn't been responded to. So that feels to me like a little bit of a minus that going forward, things to think about. Um, and then finally, a huge plus. Uh, most programs like, like this or chemicals policy programs are really focused on human health exclusively. And the, it's both hard and extremely important that this program has hit a diversity of issues um, and particular elevating the environmental toxicity issues and making them equal to human health in terms of importance because the recognition of the long-term meaningfulness of them is with the tribal example. So those, that is just absolutely important. It has changed the conversation around product formulation. And I really want to commend the department for that. Thank you, Chair. Um, right. sure. Thank you. So as we get further around this table, I think there's some repetitive redundancies, but, um, and so I'll be, I'll be quick in, in many ways with my comments because there's been so many thoughtful remarks already provided. 
Um, so one is just to put another plus in the column of the list. Um, the candidate list, I mean, it's, it's so foundational to this work and it has so many ripple effects in terms of its impact. And um, it takes a lot to maintain it. Um, and so for me, that is a, a huge highlight of what this program has, you know, one of the successes of this program. Another plus column is for the class-based approach. Um, again, uh, the program is, being on, ha, is on the leading edge of implementation of what this actually means in a regulatory context. Um, and so huge to put out the model and to make it happen. Um, another plus column for the, for the prioritization of environmental justice. Um, it's, it's seen in how uh, the priority products are prioritized. Um, you know, it, it's seen throughout the entire program, um, moving from just principles to implementation and to thinking about um, the tools for assessment, um, the tools for organizing, the tools for engagement. Um, it's really comprehensive in terms of how this program is taking it on. So I commend, I commend um, that thoughtfulness and that um, um, uh, it, uh, in terms of that prioritization. And my last point is about prioritization. I think this um, program has been incredibly thoughtful um, in the prioritization setting process. Um, there have been so many um, uh, elements um, uh, involved in strategic considerations um, and the priorities uh, have been tested in the program itself, for, you know, just from what, um, priority products have been selected, what to take on first, in what order. Um, it's tested so many different elements of the program, um, and it's enhanced, enhanced uh, you know, identifying kind of the capacity needs going forward. So uh, it's a lot to take on this question of how to best set priorities. Um, and I think the program itself has been a model for how to do that. Molly, thank you. Mike? Thank you, and, and thanks, Molly. That was that was good lead into what I wanted to talk about um, with the prioritization. Yeah, I was thinking about this, and there there's so many amazing accomplishments over the years with the program. Um, and I remember years ago, back with, with the panel, and we were we were talking, and we were really focused on implementing at that point, and the whole concept of the exit ramp for companies. What, we, we just didn't want to talk about it. You know, it, it was it was it was no. We we want them to do an AA, um, and I think the adaptability with the transparency the agency has shown it has been amazing. You know, the the fact that you that people could take the exit ramp and there was still a benefit to California, and you could quickly redeploy the resources to come up with a new prioritization is, is totally amazing. And that, that's what you need to do. You need to adapt to what's out there and take advantage of it to, to gain more benefits. It's, it's a, a methodology that I don't think was originally conceptualized, but I think now that you've got a larger staff, um, it's gonna give, you, give that staff even more powerful power. I think not only the exit ramp, but, but your ability to influence, like with the food package, the PFAS in food packaging, and instead of you're gonna have to make that a priority product and go through the whole process, the AB 1200 is out there. Um, even more power for, for you. Um, your reaction to other external stimuli like New York having one for dioxane uh, in cleaning product regulation, maybe not as comprehensive as what you would do, but it, it's there, it gets you part of the way. So let's look at it in personal care products instead and, and hit it a bigger uh, area that, that's untouched. I think that that's extremely commendable and uh, I think that's the way you need to go. So thank you. Right, thank you, Tim. Thanks. Thanks, Art. Um, yeah, there's not really, from my perspective, much left to say. I, I have the opposite problem you had, <laughs> Julian. It's going to be worse for you. Um, but just a couple of thoughts. Um, I, one of the things that really struck me was <clears throat> how this, and this kind of echoes your thought, uh, Kelly, uh, the growth in the face of the headwinds in those early years with all that. Like you say, the program's first decade, and I think, aren't we in the second decade, like halfway through the second decade? So it's right, there's that reset for those first five years. 
And I remember it even at the tail end of it, after that reset you talked about, Kelly, there was a lot of talk about how the regs were too complicated, too many steps, they're not going to work. And I think you as a program have managed to take, there was a real risk of that, but you've managed to, in implementation, make it a dynamic kind of, uh, but also anchored program. Um, so I think that's a real, real, just an enormous accomplishment. Um, I'm really excited about your embracing in many different ways, new approaches and new tech. And uh, like the chemicals class, I also feel is just enormous. You're um, kind of embracing NAMs and, um, you know, new ways of thinking about data to assist decision-making, I think have a lot of promise. I'm excited to see where that goes. I think of the program in some ways as an example, and in some instances of what I would call bold incrementalism. Like you do stuff that seems kind of small, but it's subversive in a good way, I think, right? And um, it's quiet and it kind of creeps up and then you realize the significance of what's happening. And those kind of ripple effects of what seem like not conclusive ends of the whole process, like Mike said, but which have these repercussions that affect systems beyond you is uh, um, some of that I think has got to be sort of random that it just happens, but also I suspect there's some strategic uh, thinking and, and important resource decision-making, as Mike said. Um, I, uh, I kind of feel like on the compliance and enforcement end, it's a long time coming. And now that with the funding and the staff, I think that is an area where the program could really use more supplementation. So I'm excited to see that happening. I, this program's so big, it's hard for me to really get my head wrapped around everything that's going on. So what I'm about to say might be more a reflection of my ineffectiveness than any kind of uh, so-called minus on the program. But I still feel a bit of opacity uh, or opaqueness even in the actual decision. Like I agree, uh, like I see what's going on with the product, uh, you know, the, the planning and the prioritization and they all make sense to me, but I still don't feel like I have a handle on how you actually make you're balancing all these different factors and what's the opportunity cost of things that aren't being in the plant. Like, I don't have my head wrapped around that. And the thing I worry about it a little bit is as the program gets bigger and you have more capacity, so you have to kind of, your organization will change. And that balance of like um, being able to make good decisions, what I think of as substantively good decisions um, if the way they've been made was because there's really good people sitting in the room making these decisions, thinking about it, but then the program gets bigger and you have to figure out a way to um, kind of operationalize or institutionalize that good decision making. I just worry a little bit about, I don't know how the decisions are made, so it's hard for me to see how you're going to translate that into continuing good decisions. So I think that's going to be a challenge. Um, but from whatever I, everything I see, all the other things you're doing, it seems like it's a challenge that as a program, you're certainly capable of meeting successfully. So yeah, I'm kind of up on, uh, I'm a big supporter. Thanks, Tim. Anne? One of the challenges of having been on this committee this long with Tim is that I frequently have to follow Tim, which are, is an ongoing challenge, but thank you, Tim. He always starts with, I don't know that I have a whole lot to say, and then comes up with these incredibly articulate statements. <laughs> so thanks for setting the, the bar, <laughs> continuing to set the bar. Um, I don't know if it's a reflection of my age, the time on this committee, or where I am in my career, but there's been a lot of uh, conversations re recently reflecting, and I think it's a really useful exercise, so I really pre appreciate that we're taking the time to do that. And having been at the stage where, you know, watching, basically seeing this program from a collective twinkle in our eyes to what it is today, I'm, I'm with you, Carl, I get choked up, and, and it's, it's amazing what has been done, especially having had the experience of working in the P2 program, we won't say how many years ago, um, and seeing you know what, what this is today and how, what we're capable of doing. Um, 
and going through the crafting, you know, from the legislation. Oh my God, thank you for the reminder of the A through M criteria. That's I had totally forgotten about those. <laughs> I carefully deleted that from my memory, but that we went from that, um, which we swore had been created at two o'clock in the morning by a committee. Um, to what we have today and the implementation. And I would commend you particularly for documenting the processes. I know it was painful to do that, but documenting the building of this program has provided a huge service. I think somebody else talked about, um, was it even, we experimented with, was it even possible to do in a regulatory structure? And, and not, not only have you done it, you've documented it, which is phenomenal. Um, so lots of echoes from many other things, um, but the things I really wanted to highlight are the first, um, this is probably, a shout out to, to Claudia Polsky again. The, the selection of the first three product and chemical combinations, the thoughtfulness of those three, those were key. That was the bold incrementalism. Um, you, you got to test one of them to be legally defensible. You pick something that you knew was completely unnecessary. So it made the point of, is it necessary? Um, you know, children not necessarily smoking in their, um, in their, in their baby, you know, baby bumper air <laughs> cribs. Uh, we don't really need flame retardants there. Um, uh, and then the third, the you know, methylene chloride for which there had been clear safer alternatives on the market. Um, so just brilliant selection on those first three. I thought that was a highlight for us. One more plug for the candidate chemical list. Um, it, it has shifted the, the conversation globally, I can tell you, because what it's done is taken the worst of the worst and made it a relatively manageable world that then we can then tackle by sector, by functional use, by application. Um, and it also says, you know, if you're moving away from potentially hazardous chemistry, not over here either. So it, it's limited the regrettable substitution. It also was that early signal towards a class-based approach, which you've now developed and helped expand globally so powerfully. Um, I also wanted to put a plug in for the occupational exposure. I know I've been among others, a voice for, for labor and, and service, particularly in uh, service workers. Uh, thank you for taking those on and for, for highlighting how important those exposures are and how we, what we can do about changing them. Um, I agree with many others. Thank you for bringing the environmental justice piece in. There's a lot more there that can be worked on, but the combination of EJ and data mining is very exciting to me. Um, I particularly also wanted to commend uh, the awareness of who else is working and collab collaborating globally. Um, you, you're setting you're setting examples globally as the European Union is, and as the European Union is up against some pretty interesting oncoming headwinds, um, they're finally looking to us and saying, how'd you guys do it in a much different regulatory context? Uh, and then finally, um, Tim talked about a long time coming on the compliance piece, the targeted green chemistry investment. I'm so looking forward to talking. I feel like I've been waiting 15 years for that. Um, so, so I'm very, very excited about going forward, uh, the regulatory response piece, particularly investment in green chemistry. So thank you. Um, thank you for the period of reflection and for all these, all the strengths of the program that everyone has talked about and really looking forward to the next 10 years. Uh, thanks, Anne. Uh, Suzanne? Great. Thank you so much, and I'll try not to be too redundant here. So many wonderful things have already been said. Um, as one of the newer members of this committee, I just want to say that it's an honor to be part of a group that emphasizes the class-based approach, the precautionary principle, environmental justice, just in general, and approaching so many what I would call wicked problems of chemical regulation. Um, to be part of the Western Coast states that are working together to make products safer. Um, it's just really inspirational to be, to be part of this like-minded group thinking progressively about environmental protection. Um, for some specific examples, um, how quickly you've moved on PFAS, um, revolutionary work, 3M is changing its ways, that's definitely no small feat, um, on 6PPD, on microplastics as well. And like others have said, we are really um, leading the country on this, on these issues, California is leading the country on these these issues and on finding alternatives, on everything from working to reducing the use of intentionally added microplastics to other harmful chemicals, um, and just the the idea behind using an alternatives based approach um, in contrast to a risk based approach to try to move forward more quickly on some of these important problems is is so impressive. And I, I definitely think, as others have said, that we're setting an incredible example. Um, and um, in a lot of ways, making um, what John Lewis, um, former uh, congressperson would say, making good trouble um, to move environmental protection forward. So happy to be here. Thanks. Great. Thanks very much, Suzanne. Um, now let me check with the 
members who are joining us remotely. Um, Jack? Yeah, I've uh, just got a few comments. One is I just want to echo Mike's comments about the exit ramps. I think just make sure you give yourself credit for those when you publish a uh, priority product and chemical and some in the entire industry follows suit without you doing much work, make sure that's uh, you're giving some credit for that and going forward. Um, compliance and enforcement have been mentioned. Um, that's a big issue for a lot of regulatory agencies because it's a brave new world with all internet sales and things like that. How are you gonna manage that? It's just a caution for the future. Uh, one thing I think the entire program has done really well over the past 10 to 15 years with the Green Chemistry Initiative is stakeholder involvement. And it's not just environmental groups and other groups, it's really manufacturers of some of the products, some of the chemical manufacturers. Um, I'm glad uh, we mentioned A to M because nobody knows more about A to M than the manufacturers of the products that you're looking at. So I really think you need to uh, invest time going forward, especially as you have a lot of new employees to, to have training sessions or invite industry spokespeople in, uh, people who know the products inside and out to, to give their uh, assessment of the entire um, landscape for these products. Uh, that goes hand in hand with training of new employees. Uh, a lot of employees don't come in with knowledge about how products make it to market. It's really important because there are a lot more regulations that people re don't realize out there between federal and other states. So it's just important for them to be aware of that pretty quickly. Uh, and I think in the end, uh, I heard one mention of regrettable substitution. The more information you have like this, uh, the less chance you have for any regrettable substitution, because in the end, uh, it's substitution or lessening of a, of a risk that we're looking for. So I'll leave it at that. Thanks, Jack. Emma? Um, yes, thank you. I, I, have, a I have a few comments. Um, and was really uh, thrilled that Suzanne went right before me and, and said a lot of what I wanted to say. So I wanted to agree with Suzanne that um, seeing the program actively implement a non-traditional approach, right? Alternatives assessment is a non-traditional approach. Um, and to implement that from assessment to regulatory action. Um, and then as you pointed out, Carl, to find it in the courts that, that was defensible is huge can't be understated what a big change this is and how it's happened relatively quickly. So I want to highlight that. Um, and also connect it to Tim's comment of bold incrementalism. I think that's fantastic. You have been bold, you've gone for it. Um, you've, you've avoided being narrow. You've addressed a diversity of chemistry and products and shown that you can do it. You ask thoughtful questions and think big. I'm just you're reflecting on the questions that you're asking the panel today. You, you ask lots of questions, frame them different ways to get people to think, um, to think through their lens and to offer you useful information. Um, and I think that is, is really valuable as well. You're not just asking one question, you ask 12 questions. Um, and then I want to uh, amplify, amplify Helen's comments too. Um, for anybody who's engaged with the program, they know that you do uh, extensive research and evaluation before you make the steps through your pro uh, process and that you take the time to publish that and publish it in peer reviewed journals is a big undertaking and a really important undertaking. So don't stop doing that. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Emma. Uh, let me just add one other uh, point about success. It's um, the program's contribution to mainstreaming transparency in chemical content. Uh, I think that's really, really super important when it comes to making one material selection decision, but also regulatory de decisions. And you can see that now reflected in other, you know, uh, programs and uh, regulations such as, you know, transparency, like where PFAS is actually used in products here, both in the U.S. and in Maine and other states, and also in the EU. So, I mean, I think that's a really important contribution. And on um, more of a community level, one of the things I'd like, would love to, I want to point out is that what you, the slide you had about the nail salon 
and Tao Yuling. So you mentioned the A4 conference. So when we were at the, at the A4 conference, there was a presentation on workers in nail salons. So let me, I wanna make sure I get the numbers right. Um, so there are over 400,000 licensed manicures and cosmetologists in the state of California. And 69% of those workers are Vietnamese. And most of them are low income women workers of reproductive age. So right there, that alone, it's a major, major impact on the communities in California. It's just amazing work that you've done. All right, I, I wanna uh, thank you on that. I wanted to tell a short story of how far we've come. We've been working in with a lot of folks, including the California Health and Health Salon Collaborative and many of the local governments for many years. Um, and the first meeting I ever went to about nail salons was in Oakland. And I went with Debbie Raffel and um, some other folks. And um, the dialogue was sort of around, um, are there safer alternatives? And, and this meeting included some the biggest nail product manufacturers in the world. And <laughs> I, I was new to the conversation. And at one point, and, and not... Coincidentally, I think there were probably about 40 people in the room and 37 of them were women and me and these two gentlemen from two nail companies. Um, and they got into this debate about how, you, how something is safe or not. And one of them was a company that said they had a safe product and the other one was one of the big dogs. And <clears throat> they got into this argument. And what happened was to mine and everyone's amazement was one of them said, well, I could drink my product. And the other one said, well, I could drink my product. And one of the guys actually had, a, and they actually like in front of everyone, like one of the guys drank some nail polish. And I thought, and I thought, wow, talk about exposure assessment, or, you know, measuring, I don't know. But my point is, is that that was, that was where we were probably 15 years ago. Um, and because of a lot of people and focusing, and then everyone, both at the local level and the collaborative and others, um, keeping focus, on, because as you pointed out, the data is there, that we have a significant population of people in California who are at risk. And so we're doing what we can, everyone's doing what we can, but we've made a lot of progress. If you look at the recent nail report we published, there's still work to be done, right? Uh, and it's a complex, it's a big market place with a lot of players. Um, but I, I think that it takes a village, right? To, to get stuff done and we're making progress in our, our way we can and lots of others are too, but um, we've come a long way and, and but there's still a place to go. But I, Appreciate you highlighting that. Uh, we have a few more minutes. So, are there any additional comments before we take a lunch break? Well, since I'm, I want to put somebody on the spot. Since Julie started this, and what's, um, so I want to give her the, the last word. All right. Well, I've had a chance to listen to everybody else's comments. I'm going to save most of my comments for the afternoon. I have some thoughts on things I want to brainstorm about in terms of going forward, but I want to put two things out there. And that is um, my background is you know, material science and material selection. And I think this is a very powerful tool for that domain. And so that's something I want to bring up this afternoon is to think about how we um, embed it into decision-making, not make it regulatory after the fact. Um, and I think that there's, as an educator, we need to figure out how to get these tools in the hands of the students so that when they do come out, they've heard it before. And that's a big task, but I want to just echo and commend you for again, the journal papers, because we, those of us who publish peer review papers know how hard that is. And given your other work demands, I'm sure that that's been a challenge. And I don't want that to fall off the radar as you get bigger. Um, and your alternatives assessment guide 
I, I pull it up, I use it in my classes. It's, you know, you've defined this, the landscape, you've defined the terms, you've defined the methods and it's, um, and, and you did an excellent job. It doesn't need fixing, right? So you should be very proud of the effort that was put into that and creating that foundation and all of those documented archival things will outlast all of us. And that's something that even though, you know, we, I live in a publisher parish world and that's not why we do it, right? We, we don't do it so that you can climb the ranks as a faculty member. That's what some people think and why and you can get jobs. It's so that it's there for people later. Even if it's not the most impactful work, it's still important. So the big things, the little things, all of those things are good to have them out there. So between the peer reviewed and your excellent communication teams, I think that those are things you can't lose as you get bigger. Um, so I'll stop with that. I'm very proud. Really, thank you very much. Elaine, do you want to make your comment? I mean, I guess Julie just triggered a couple points um, in my mind. So um, on the lines of, of educating and um, the, one, of the, one of the papers, um, well, I, I ended up, cause you know, like you said, you can click and click. Yeah. And, and I ended up with a paper they think Molly and Tim worked on it, comparing different um, alternative assessment uh, regulatory par uh, paradigms. And um, so I think there, there were a couple things in there that I thought were potentially, um, you know, worth looking back at and, and seeing, you know, which, which of those things might be important in terms of the, you know, what historically has or hasn't worked and, and what would be important moving forward. Um, and so I think one of them was some of the, having some clear criteria and things. And so moving the alternative assessments process into something that can be, um, better translated into, you know, into our education system. And um, it, I think some of those, some of those things it, are important because I, I, I know we do this a lot with, um, I'm not a risk assessor just to qualify this next statement, but I know in terms of risk assessment too, you go into most of um, academic programs or there's, there's a lot of training um, and then still things do come down to sometimes pretty subjective um, decisions, right? And, and it's gonna be that way for almost anything we do because there's a lot of values that get imposed and there's where the science is and, and then where, they're, you know, where you're making choices and decisions. Um, but I think we're, we're running up, we're bumping up against that in alternatives assessment, but almost on steroids because risk assessment I see is sort of a little bit more um, compartmentalized compared to alternatives assessment, which you know then touches every uh, you know every system. <laughs> um, yeah, so there's any no one discipline. <laughs> there's no one discipline. There's no one um, decision, right? Because if you start to throw in, I mean, I mean, I know with risk assessment, there's there is um, you know cost benefit analysis too, and that's a whole other thing, you know. But but then you've got the, um, the you know the different um, uh, in energy use and greenhouse gas. And, you know, there's so there's so many things, and this stuff is just going to keep ballooning. Um, and so, just when I think about translating this into our educational system, um, it's probably an opportunity to you know sort of it, both directions, both having the um, educators help with you know making clarifying some of those decision points. Um, but it's also an opportunity, I think, since, since you all are leading to start to make some uh, inroads into where things still seem a little um, opaque. Thank you very much. And I want to thank the panel members again. This has just been really insightful and it's been a very productive morning. Um, Alejandro, do you want to make an announcement for lunch and what's up next? Yeah, we were just going to go ahead and uh, break for lunch here at noon uh, to come back at one o'clock and then um, we'll restart the meeting if that works for everybody. Okay, I believe that there is a lunch for um, staff in 1208 um, and then everyone else um, 
we'll see you when we see you. So we'll see everybody here. Um, it looks like we're a couple of minutes after, so about 105 will be perfect. And yeah. before we close out, uh, just a reminder, um, in order to comply with the Bagley Keen Open Meeting Act, we ask that panel, panel members refrain from discussing agenda topics outside the meeting. I know we all do this, and I just want to remind us that we need to respect that. Okay. Welcome back, everyone. Thanks for uh, joining us after your pleasant lunch, I hope. We're now going to have a panel discussion of looking ahead. For that, Art and Kelly are going to lead us in a discussion of our moving forward. Eric, thank you very much. Uh, this moving forward in our discussion, we're now going to focus on turning the path ahead for the Safer Consumer Products Program. Uh, this is a really important meeting, actually. It's a, we, one of the uh, roles of the Green Ribbon Science Panel is to review the program, and that's a legislatively mandated role. So it's really important that we're taking the time at this meeting both to look back and to look forward to advise the department, and that fulfills one of our key mandates. And plus, it's just a rich, uh, it's a rich discussion. Uh, the staff have teed it up um, excellently with so many questions. Um, I, as uh, chairing this session, I really wanted to take time and go through each one of these questions individually. Um, and given that we only have um, an hour, according, according to my watch, we have an hour and five minutes. So um, I, what I think we'll do is do what we did this morning and go around, including our online members, um, and let everyone say a few words, and then um, we can pull some threads after that together and um, double check in on any of the questions and um, see if staff want us to um, address any of the questions or any topic in a little more detail at that point. Um, so I'm hoping to start at the opposite side so that um, this does put Suzanne and Anne on the spot, and I don't think they're listening, so it's a great time to put Suzanne and Anne on the spot. <laughs> um, so our panel members will explore prospect strategies in areas that can be improved upon, all with the goal of making the progress and success in fulfilling the program's mission. So um, I wanted to go around the room like we did this morning, and that puts Suzanne at the beginning because she's a B. She's probably used to that. <laughs> So um, uh, you will, um, the folks at the beginning will, as we did this morning, have a little time to uh, weigh in at the end. Um, but if you could share your thoughts about looking forward, and um, if we don't address every question, there are quite a few here. I think there are nine questions in this group. Um, then we can, and we could go back and forth on those questions. Do you want to see the first ones? Uh, sure, that would be great. It, can somebody change the slide to may, maybe go back and forth through them? This is the first. Yeah. That is the first. Oh, first oh this forward. is okay. Yeah, I. I think there are more. Oh, okay. <laughs> there, yeah, that's one, and then wait. Okay. Yeah, starts with question five. Okay, so if you want to refer to those, please feel welcome to, but don't feel obligated to stick to them, and we'll make sure that we get the answers that staff need okay. before we finish the conversation. All right. So starting with question five. Starting any place you like. <laughs> <laughs> Those are some things that they like, love us to address. Sure, sure. Um, I would say for number five, in terms of key areas and initiatives to prioritize, I, mean, I, I may be a little bit biased here, but I would say the issue of microplastics is, is huge. Um, we've, I, I think that the group has made a lot of really impressive progress already in moving towards um, adding microplastics as um, a contaminant <clears throat> to the safer um, consumer products list of concerns. Um, but thinking about more specifically about what products these are going to apply to, um, what regulatory impacts these might have, not just obviously in the state of California, but nationwide, given that, that many other states are considering some of the same potential approaches, including states like Washington, Oregon, New York, I'm thinking of others too. Um, so really an important area to prioritize in addition to uh, PFAS. Um, again, really impressive to see that um, large companies like 3M 
are considering are, are planning to move away from PFAS, but you know the, the question of potential regrettable substitutions and you know, what what is the alternatives assessment there? What would they be? What are they going to be using instead? Do we have transparency on those on those issues? Um, in terms of enhancing scientific methodologies, um, I think anything that we can do to move more towards hazard assessment, especially for some of these new and emerging contaminants, is really important. Um, risk assessment is a fantastic tool when you have enough data to employ it, um, but it, in my um, experience, it's often used as a reason to delay action um, and that can be a problem so being able to use science um, in a rigorous way to promote hazard the use of hazard um, it often you know not instead of using risk but until we have enough data to do thorough risk assessments i think is really important using use of the precautionary principle um, in terms of research and data gaps um, the the biggest challenge there is funding and long-term funding and resources for the production of data on a lot of these chemicals. And often um, from, at least from the perspective of an academic, there's often kind of a flavor of the year or flavor of the every couple of years type of situation with funding opportunities. You know, the, a lot of funding for endocrine disruption in the early through mid 2000s and then now it's mainly funding on plastics um so it would be great if there were more continuous sources for funding to be able to produce those data and that's where the that's where the rubber kind of hits the road so to speak um <clears throat> in terms of um, expanding outreach and education efforts anything we can do to make consumers aware of what they're buying and to better understand the potential risks and um, hazards of exposure is really important. And I know they risk um, the potential of causing burnout and people, you know, kind of covering their ears, maybe not wanting to hear, but doing that in a way that is informed by the current research on science communication and how to successfully communicate um, these, these, this information to the greater, um, greater community cons to consumers um, is incredibly important. Um, and I think that SCP's regulatory framework is already adaptable and responsive, um, but not to repeat what I said earlier, but just the, the moving towards alternatives assessment um, while also keeping risk assessment in our back pocket, I think is a really um, important and valuable approach going forward. Thank you. So there, there's actually several more oh. questions. <laughs> yeah, is, is somebody able okay. to switch the slides back and forth just so that panelists who are walking through them, I'm not sure if everyone will want to do this. Um, yeah. There, thanks. Okay. There we go. And I, I don't have to go through every single no. one because some of my answers, I think, apply to, yeah. to these as well. Um, um, but I think if I'm I'm thinking about long-term goals in terms of prioritizing research policy topics for publications, I think a publication talking about the approach to adding microplastics to the candidate chemical list and doing that in a class-based way rather than regulating single polymers. You know, you see these bans on styrofoam, bans on, you know, X, and instead of going for single products. The approach of um, using using that class based approach, like was done with PFAS, I think, is an incredibly important uh, approach uh, strategy, and would would make for impactful publications that should be shared um, widely. I'll finish there. Thanks. Thank you. And of course, uh, talking about microplastics, PFAS, hazard assessment, research funding in particular, I think your experience there is particularly important. And you're up. Thank you. And uh, I'm just thinking as it's continuing to reflect on, you know, the power of, of the expertise in this room is that we don't all have to answer all of the questions. Um, so we, we each, I'm going to do a subset. I'm going to start with the first two and then uh, jump to the end there on some of the regulatory authority pieces and um, engaging a wider audience. So uh, to start with key areas or initiative to strengthen impacts, I think you probably all know what I'm going to say. Um, the data call-in is something we've been working on for a while. So as we work through, um, you know, how exactly we're going to use that 
um, authority. That's um, that's a really critical piece. That's another. It's another piece. No pressure, but you're going to be modeling uh, for a lot of other regulatory agencies what we can do about that. Um, and as I mentioned this morning, also the regulatory response, particularly the piece in green chemistry investment and how we design that. Um, there are some other efforts in, in train in, in our greater ecosystem, and um, just to be aware of some of those, and I can happily connect you with them, um, to make sure that we're in alignment. There is an emerging alignment that green chemistry investment has to be, to be effective, to, to scale, has to be at a sector level and even potentially at a, a functional, functional use of functional applications, so you're very much in line with what the thinking has been so far. Um, key areas that you've piloted, I mentioned, several of us mentioned this morning, um, but we're going to keep beating the drum on environmental justice, have that be an occupational exposure, have the have those be upfront lenses. Um, that's some of the power that you bring to the world, um, so continue to do that. Um, enhance scientific methodologies and approaches. Several of us have been reflecting that we have made a generational shift from the paradigm. And, and Carl, you talked about this this morning. It is a generational shift to move from the risk assessment uh, to a chemical hazard frame. It is much more, collectively, we have a chemical hazard assessment frame much more accepted. It is not completely broadly adopted. So I think that's a role that we can all collectively play, um, along with you know uh, allies such as the uh, collaborators, such as the uh, Berkeley Center for Green Chemistry that I know you all work with. Uh, so I'm now going to go to the end. You don't have to flip the slides. I think we all have them. Thank you. Um, and I'm going to go a little left field here, as I'm sure you all expect me to do at some point as well. What changes to statutory and regulatory authority would help push the market towards safer chemistry? Um, so I've just completed a piece of research on investor metrics for green chemistry and what would push, uh, push the investment side of the world. And I talked to someone in finance and said, what would be the most effective way of moving investment to green chemistry? And she said, Regula regulation. Okay, um, <laughs> I'm gonna go back to my regulatory folks. So I think it would be interesting to start uh, seeding some of those conversations going back and forth among investors saying, you know, what kinds of criteria do you need? What criteria do we need to pass sort of scientific laugh test as to what is an actual safer chemistry? Uh, and then what do we need to push from a regulatory side of things? So we'll throw that, uh, throw that out there. Um, how to improve safer consumer products throughput. I think adding staff, 78 staff, doubling your staff is probably gonna help. Um, and I would encourage you, as I said this morning, to keep documenting your processes because you're, you're building a model program. Um, finally, there is, as you all are well aware, what to prioritize for future publication to ensure a wider audience and impact on policy discussions. I think is to carve out what, what I'm seeing in, in both the philanthropic community and in the environmental health and justice movement broadly is people starting to wrap their heads around the intersections between climate impacts, uh, chemicals and products, environmental exposures, environmental justice, uh, economic injustice, historical inj injustice, and then trying to figure out What's the thread? What's their individual piece of work or their organization's piece of work? So I think that's what's ahead for all of us. All right. Thank you very much, Anne. And I, I just want to say, I particularly acknowledge some things we started talking about this morning about EJ and how it fits into the program. So equity, justice, all of those issues and occupational exposure. You know, that's something we started talking about this morning. I think you really did a nice job of emphasizing that. Thank you. Um, okay, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna talk by number. I just have a gestalt kind of the whole thing, um, and I agree with everything I've heard so far. So I have some kind of focus things, and then I'm going to swing big since you invited statutory changes. Okay, so one is I think uh, cumulative impacts. That's the next step. I think the AA stuff should really start, and there's folks on the panel who are already working on those sorts of things. But, and I mean that in two ways. One, thinking about co-exposures to chemicals, both in the prioritization and then also in terms of alternatives assessment. Uh, and then also thinking about non-chemical stressors, which overlaps with, to a great degree with the EJ stuff. So I think that's, there's a lot happening there. Um, and I think there's enough happening and it's tractable enough that it could be implemented, integrated into an AA sort of assessment. Um, the other thing I was like intrigued by Senate Bill 502 in their reference to um, making tools available and all. And at the end of that sentence, they talked about for consumers making purchasing decisions. 
So I think there's some real opportunity there um, to uh, kind of uh, empower consumers to do their own AAs based on a lot of the information that DTC, DTSC will have, and maybe even you know, creating a website and phone apps that consumers could use to make uh, informed decision among between alternatives. Um, I know there's there's some old stuff that was out there, and there's some new stuff that's out there. But I think you could uh, it would I think carry more weight if it was something that you were doing, and it could be done more transparently and better if you were doing something along those lines. I think if we want people to. Yeah, I think it's great the website and people call you and ask you questions, but I wonder how many consumers really know who you are and if they're really going to make use of stuff that's on your website, but they'll use something on their phone. Um, okay, so now I'm going to get a little bit thinking bigger, which is how to drive innovation and whatnot, and this cuts across a couple of questions. So here, thinking big, but also thinking old. So the Office of Technology Assessment used to be an Office of Technology assessment at the federal level and there's something like that at the south coast air quality management district and they did this interesting thing with perchloroethylene and dry cleaning where back in uh, oh golly over 20 years ago aqmd um, <clears throat> essentially used the air toxics rules to phase out perk and dry cleaning but they didn't just do it they kind of set the stage for it because they're uh, based on uh, you know tax on perk they funded studies to develop alternatives so it's kind of like the green chemistry innovation fund but more pro you know at the front end rather than the back end of regulation so you know having an having a part so maybe a fourth branch i don't know who the branch chief would be yet but we'll have a fourth branch which is proactive technology assessment hmm. And that would require another funding stream. Um, but I think there's a, a, a lot of um, evidence that that could work. Uh, and we've seen it happen already where you combine kind of proactive technology advancement efforts. And then when you get to a certain point that now really primes you for taking the regulatory step. Um, and then along the lines of uh, something similar in terms of like thinking about future challenges, there was a question that said, well, how do we know about what future? And imagine, you know, having some sort of a horizon scanning type function within DTSC where um, you're, you're looking for that next wave. And the, the indications are often there, like nano, uh, AI, CRISPR, all those things people you knew it was kind of coming, but it took a little while to get here. So some having an, a, a, a you know, folks devoted to kind of horizon scanning and uh, kind of creating networks within those communities in industry and academia and elsewhere, NGOs that do that sort of thing, it would be a useful function. Okay, so here's the big swing. Okay, so how to change the statutory authority. This is really simple. Um, to do, but it might be hard to get somebody to do. But right now, the definition of consumer product excludes pesticides. And I think it's time that that change. Um, the pesticide statute requires alternatives assessment as part of its actions, and it's not done. And part of the reason it's not done is the capacity is not there that, you know, there is capacity in California for doing AA. We know how to do it. It's in DTSC. And the only reason, well, maybe one of the reasons it's not done is pesticides are excluded from the definition of consumer product. To me, it does not make sense to have that stay. One, because it's a different kind of decision-making that could be done quite separately from registration of a chemical. And it requires a different kind of capacity and it doesn't seem to make sense to have two different agencies doing that kind of, uh, trying to develop that kind of expertise when you already have one that's developed it. It's just a huge issue in terms of, if you wanna affect the health of, of all sorts of folks, workers, residents, um, this is a big one, it's sitting there right in front of us. And especially if you're worried about EJ uh, concerns, 
So that's my big swing. I would change the statute to include pesticides as consumer product. Thank that. you. Oh, thank you, Tim. Oh, th those are actually some pretty big ideas. And I, I'm thinking maybe we should pause here for a second and just get the temperature of the group on this uh, because they're so important. So he mentioned, uh, you want to keep going? Okay. I want, so I'm going to ask you all to, 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 if you have a reaction to Tim's, can you say a little bit about that in your comments? Because I, I think it's important for us to give group feedback on these ideas. And Tim challenges us to think and advise the department. And if there's a lot of interest in these things, this is something that would be important for the department. So I'll, I'll, I'll let Mike go ahead, but um, please think about those things. Okay, first I wanna echo what Ann said earlier uh, about following Tim. Um, <laughs> especially then when you get Kelly throwing in an additional caveat. Um, uh, so it's, where to even start now? Um, yeah, I guess it, it, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I am gonna follow Tim's lead and not just going question by question because a lot of my thoughts hit multiple questions all at once. Um, a thing I think is interesting that, that, that you've been talking about is, is microplastics and, and the whole concept in my, my head around that. Um, and, and Suzanne brought that up, but microplastics don't fit necessarily that traditional, here is a chemical of concern, here is a, a priority product to, mac, to match it with. Yes, there are some microplastics in some products that are intentionally added, um, but they're not even necessarily an, uh, an impurity that's in there like 1,4-8-dioxane, but they're a result of poor management of those plastic components uh, long-term, not, not necessarily even within the state of California, but coming into the ocean, through the air, whatever. So how do you regulate something like that? That I think it, it, it's, a, it's a key concern for human health, for environmental health around the board. And I think that's where, where the department really needs to start to look is, is how do we start to, to really incorporate these larger term macro issues that don't necessarily fit within the regulatory framework. You know, how, how, do you, how do you hit the fact that part of why there is microplastic around is there's ineffective recycling um, amongst many, many, many other reasons. Um, how, do you, how do you impact that? Is th that's not something that you, that you can write as a regulatory response at this point in time. So I think that that's something to, to consider. I, I think it is wise to take that step back and say, just because it's not a traditional chemical of concern, it should be part of our mandate to look at these things that, that impact the, the people and the environment of the state of California, as well as the rest of the world. So I do think that sort of initiative, I don't know how you wrap your arms around it, um, even with additional staff, um, but, and that might be where, again, you need a, a regulatory change in order to, to grapple the entire problem. Do I think it's a value if you could even hit a small piece of it? Absolutely. Um, what, what I also think, and this is, I'm just jumping around question to question, uh, with number eight, um, and we talked earlier about getting industry members on the Green Ribbon Science Panel, and I think we've done pretty well um, with consumer product manufacturers. I think it would, it would behoove us to also look at the chemical manufacturers themselves. If we could have more input and partnership from them. Um, I know I, I used to work uh, within the chemical industry and I try and bring that, but they own a, a lot more information than those product manufacturers don't manufacture the chemicals that go in the product. They, they could bring more information regarding how those impurities get in there or what perhaps we could do about it. So that might be a, a, an area, a key area of outreach or education is, is to hit the uh, chemical manufacturers as well as continuing uh, the outreach to uh, international companies. You know, Carl was talking earlier about a lot of the response that came in from, from companies outside the US. A lot of product is manufactured outside the US and then brought in. Um, how do we make sure that 
that product that's coming in meets our requirements other than having to do another testing program uh, like with, with the uh, mattresses early, early on. Um, what else did I wanna try and hit now? That kind of hits, hits the, the broad uh, area of questions that, that I had and that hasn't been covered yet. Thank you very much, Mike. Um, did you want to react to Tim's um, comments on cumulative impacts um, and um, adding pesticides? I guess those are the two particularly was hoping to get you know, feedback I, on. Cumulative impacts, I think, is, is, a, is a key area. You know, you, you look at yeah, and it, and it, it goes it, with the microplastics, you're hitting it in so many different areas. All these things that we're looking at, you know, it's one on top of the other. And, and you tend to look at it as here is an isolated incident. And that's, it's truly not the case. I, I think that's, but I don't know how under the regulatory framework, you start to say, well, if you've got this one and this one and this one, you, you hit the cumulative, the synergistic impacts. Um, I'm not positive how you do that, but it, it's, I think it, it's key to moving forward. Adding pesticides, um, I will refrain from commentating. <laughs> totally understood. Molly, you're up. All right. Um, so I'll go back to Kelly's desire to take on question by question, but I won't go question by question, but I'll let you know what question I'm answering. So the first one is number five, um, key areas to strengthen. You know, I, I also am biased on this um, as I'm heavily involved in the Association for the Advancement of Alternatives Assessment, but I'm um, one area that I think needs to be addressed going forward in the program is to just try to figure out how we get more responsible entities to conduct an alternatives analysis process. Um, so many of our, our priority products thus far have used various on off ramps. And, you know, again, I'm, I'm biased about the process to be able to really illuminate options and to be transparent about the benefits and the challenges of various alternatives. It's made explicit during these processes. Um, there's so much to learn more about the utility of this process when we do it, um, but we're not doing it. Um, and so I'm really excited to see what comes out of the 6PPD entire alternatives assessment process. And I just think going forward to really reflect on how, how we can strengthen this part of the program. It's a key aspect of the program. It's just not being done. Um, and we can't assess its value or utility if we don't do it. Um, so that's one area that I feel that needs to be strengthened. Um, in terms of um, enhancing new methodologies and research gaps, question six and seven. Um, I really wanna lift up the needs around addressing engineered nanoparticles and nanomaterials. Um, in my work, what I'm seeing is that engineered nanomaterials are some of the best options providing the best performance functionality for a lot of these chemicals of concern. Chemicals of concern. They're um, emerging as replacements for a lot of functionalities of PFAS. They're emerging as replacements for a number of different types of flame retardants. They're in our sporting goods equipment. Um, and we don't have methods in place that we all are feeling comfortable with to turn to and to compare and assess and treat them the way that we're treating chemicals of the concern. We have to up our ante and get our methods in place to evaluate these because right now they're being overlooked and they're coming in full speed ahead and we're not doing anything about them. Um, there is some work that is emerging um, you know, through all the regulatory um, programs in risk assessment. There's a lot of methodologies that we can start looking at with regard to their utility for alternatives assessment. A lot of work on grouping approaches, trying to look at similarities of materials the way we do with PFAS and other chemicals. So I just really encourage us to dig into this and not wait until it's too late to do so. Um, I also want to lift up the issue of microplastics. Um, I've had the pleasure of talking to Suzanne over the last year about this, and I just don't want the program to overcomplicate this issue. Microplastics are a persistent pollutant. They are, we do not need to dissect um, the hazard attributes of microplastics. Consider them like we do with you know, particulate air pollution. Anything under 2.5 micrometers are considered harmful. And we were able to make incredible gains through our regulatory processes by just honoring that fact. Microplastics should be treated as 
as a unique new hazard attribute. It's not a chemical of concern, it's a hazard. It's a hazard that needs to be controlled, not as a new class of chemicals, right? So how do we rethink to, you know, to, to Mike's point, how we take this on? I'm not confident we take it on like a chemical of concern. I think we should take it on like a new hazard. Um, and the last thing I, I want to talk about is, and it might also be one of these questions about expanding the statutory authority. But when I think about the Safer Consumer Products Program, the vision is one of a safer product. We take on this issue, one chemical, uh, with an incumbent and its alternative. And I, uh, over the last year, through the Association of the Advancement of Alternatives Assessment, working with Elaine, working with Lynn here at DTSC, we're trying to think through, especially for formulated products, how do we make sure that that formulated product, which will have to be reformulated in order to accommodate this new alternative, is safer. It's the product that needs to be safer, not just the substitute to the chemical of concern. And how do we start expanding our horizon around the methodologies that can help us do that? It, and, and is it possible within the current regulatory framework to do so? Or do we need to expand the dimensions of that to do, to, to work that in that way? And to me, this, to, to Kelly's question about addressing Tim's point, this is another dim dimension of accumulative impact, right? It's, um, uh, and so yes, on cumulative impacts, especially from a mixtures perspective that might be very poignant to a consumer product. Yes, on pesticides, because when I think about our conversation next um, tomorrow, especially around what the program and the department can do about environmental justice, pesticides, I kept thinking about what pro you know, priority products can we look at with regard to environmental justice? And the thing that kept coming up for me over and over and over and over again is pesticides. So I just think there's a lot here to, to work with. And with that, Art, you're up. <laughs> Great, thank you, Molly. Uh, in terms of looking forward, uh, just I wanna emphasize one thing that Helen and I have mentioned in the past and that's um, AI, but, but actually the term AI has actually been misused quite a bit. We're actually talking about informatics. Um, so it's machine learning and uh, AI. And that's one of the areas that I feel not as comfortable with in terms of uh, the civic, uh, uh, consumer products program in terms of the capacity and expertise because AI is moving and machine learning, informatics is moving really, really fast. And I'm not seeing the kind of expertise that you have in house to actually keep up with the developments. So some of the things that are being used in terms of AI, especially as related to the you know, new PFAS regulations, is that people are developing um, alternative using AI in terms of, you know, what would actually work for the specific applications for which PFAS is serving a physical function. And so we're using AI to actually develop the next generation of materials. So understanding how that works it's really important. And AI is also being incorporated into, again, some of the questions about, you know, how to um, understand for you know, new um, chemical substances, their potential hazard. AI is also being used to, um, to uh, enhance uh, computational toxicology in terms of predicting what some of those hazards might be. So again, just really want to emphasize that I think it's really important uh, for the department to uh, think about building up the capacity and expertise in uh, informatics. And so one of the things I do notice that is that, you know, when I go, uh, get into discussions about informatics, um, I've never seen a DTSC or Safer Consumer Products staff member in any of those conversations. And so the, again, you know, that's where the direction of the science and technology is moving. Another comment I have about uh, what you're doing, I think it's just amazing. It's related to what's coming out of, uh, mostly out of Europe when it comes to chemical policy and uh, moving away from hazardous chemicals. It's safe and sustainable by design. I think the program has just a really good handle on the safe part of safe and sustainable by design, but I'm not seeing as much um, uh, a dive, deep dives into the sustainable part of that equation. So I think that's something you also need to um, consider. 
And uh, something Mike said about, uh, you know, getting uh, companies, especially progressive companies to be part of more engaged in this current process. I think that's something that's really important to do because not only do they have information that you might not have uh, access to, but just learning in terms of how they do switches when it comes to replacing, you know, one chemical of concern with a potentially safer viable alternative. Understanding the process is really, really important when you're trying to actually make a difference because most of the time it's not a job in replacement. It's the qualification that's needed in order to actually make that happen. It's really time consuming and costly. So for some electronics products, uh, so something let's say, uh, you have a chemical of concern, let's say in, in a battery, in an electronic device, and you found a viable alternative that, you know, on a bench top seems to work okay, but in order to qualify the material to make sure that the battery would, it's, it would work over the lifetime of the product and it's safe during use when you're charging and discharging it, the qualification process is like, you have to charge and discharge that battery thousands of times, and that takes months, if not years to do. So understanding how companies actually make uh, materials, you know, um, alternative switches or drop or replacements, that's really important to do. Um, nanomaterials, just, I think it's a really important area, uh, emerging area, but that's been going on for the last 20 years. And there's actually a lot of information about uh, potential hazards and exposures to nanomaterials that have been generated by the semiconductor industry because for the last 20 years, they've had a program in which they've been funding university and private research on understanding the hazards of nanomaterials and potential exposure. You know, Basically, when the stuff gets out in the open, what does it do? That actually, there's a really robust database on that. So I think that's something that you need to tap into if in fact, nanomaterials become uh, one of the you know, uh, chemical and product combinations. Oh, um, I, I, would, I would just make one, one other comment. Uh, environmental justice, I think that's a really great area, important area for the program to get into. And just wanna add uh, one thing about when people are thinking about environmental justice and you know, there are the maps that you show, there's more to, there, there's another way to, think about environmental justice, and that's on the educational front. Think about how to really promote the next generation of leaders among Black, Hispanic, and Indigenous uh, 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 students and next generation of leaders. That is gonna make a big, big difference. And I think, I don't know how you know this program would actually tap into that, but that's something that, uh, important to keep in mind and to do. I think I'll stop there. Wow, I that was so much. And I noticed Helen nodding her head when we started talking about AI and informatics. So I think Helen's a good person to follow up now. That's, uh... Actually, interestingly, that wasn't the fit where I was gonna go, although I completely agree. And I will, I'm happy to talk about AI and data all day long. Um, but the, one of the things that's been um, sort of top of mind for me um, as far as like a uh, strengthening your impact is, um, is the carbon mitigation industry that is developing right now. Um, I think that, um, that there's not necessarily the same practice and rigor of looking at alternatives in that space that, that we have so that, so for example, if you are moving from an internal combustion engine to an electric vehicle, from a carbon perspective, you win. But if you actually look at the chemical footprint and all of these other things, it's maybe not as clear of an improvement. And as mitigation techniques are coming, as alternatives are coming in the carbon space, I think that that is probably one of the more important areas to figure out how to take what is really primarily a very chemical and material focused um, approach and framework and how to tighten it. Because remember, A through M, 
Okay, it's RIM's got, it's there, right? So you have that obligation. And I just don't think that that's the practice today. And I think it needs to be because what I would really um, be disappointed is if we have something that does have a great um, carbon impact, but you know has a terrible footprint when there was an alternative that might've done about the same that we didn't need to have that chemical residual input um, an impact. So that's probably my number one um, idea to just leave you with. I don't have an answer for it, but I think it is a gap and everyone would be better for having these two things come together. Um, just a, so that's the big one. I'll give you just a few other notes here. Um, again, monitoring and good data. So this does get back to the AI. You can't do AI without data. And so you just have to be um, thinking ahead to what data sources you think you might want 10 years from now, because it's gonna take you a long time to get all of that in place. And so, um, yeah, I would just say, just always be thinking data, data, data. Um, now back to something that Tim said about innovation. You actually, you were right on. One of the observations as I've been reading the assessments is that we're not always uncovering true innovative alternatives. We're looking at chemical substitution still as the, sort of the dominant answer. And I, and I think that that has to do with, I was reading in, in the uh, MDI um, AA where there is an explicit statement to say, well, we, um, th there's an allowance within the regulations that you don't have to consider alternatives that are outside of your business model. Right, and it's the same thing in Europe, it's the same thing. So I, I used to work with a BFR, bromine and flame retardant company. And when we asked them for alternatives to flame retardants, they said, none, because we make brominated flame retardants. We have no way of making phosphorus-based flame retardants or other types of flame retardants. Even just in the chemical space, they couldn't do it. And so I think that that is um, an opportunity. And the way I kind of um, see the path forward is not to try to take companies that have a narrow business model and force them to do other things. I think it, it, it's a, an up-leveling of the concern to an industry level so that there's a regulation that does go across a whole industry. And then when there, it it's, um, incentivizes um, second and third tier, smaller companies, um, startups, um, other parties to do that innovation. My, my own observation is that the first tier companies almost never do that type of innovation, even the really good ones, because they have a business model and they make a thing and they're really good at making that thing. And so they wanna make that thing. So the hungry second tiers are great. They're the ones who are gonna come out with a new way of doing a thing. And back to you know, the point about um, the finished product being the safer, um, uh, in a, be a safer product. That's where you, again, get your second tiers who are hungry, they wanna break into the first tier. And so um, going straight for the, it's back to sort of this idea of focusing on a responsible entity who's already making a thing is gonna just only get you so far. It's gotten us this far and it's good and I don't wanna not do that. But if you really wanna have the big innovation, the breakthroughs of what's a brand new way of sealing a building that doesn't require SPF, you can't go to an SPF company and ask them to do that. Right. So, so that, and that I think is, is a real challenge because it's not really how, it's the trade-off you made to make it um, defensible. And I know, I understand that. But it's like, what, how far can we go in this up level at the, at the industry level? How far can you push it? And that, I think that's the challenge. Thanks. So, uh, do you have any comments on um, Tim's remarks about cumulative and pesticides? Um, what I would say about the pesticide point is that um, even if, it, if, it, if they can't be considered consumer products, I think there's an argument to be made that they could be. But um, I definitely agree that we shouldn't have two different processes. So even if it stays exactly where it is, the people who are responsible for that in their own group needs to be using this best practice. That's basically kind of, I don't know that it needs to converge, but it needs to use the same tools. You're up, Elaine. So I, um, 
don't necessarily have anything to add, but I'm going to try to say it a little differently or just say it again, um, because I, I think these all these points have been amazing. Um, and the thing that keeps sticking in my head was the way Carl started off with the, um, the goal of drivers that stimulate innovation. And I sort of see that as your true north or should be the true north in your next um, envisioning of yourself. I mean, on, on the one hand, you're now set up to do all these great things. And on the other hand, we're throwing at you like a whole nother universe. <laughs> um, and I think the one thing that just keeps nagging at me, and it's not just your program, but it's chemical management in general, is that we're still, even when we talk about emerging problems and emerging chemicals, they're not emerging, they've emerged. They've been around 20 years and we're just getting around to doing maybe something about it. So I'm still feeling like we're a little bit under the lamppost, throwing out as many um, cliches as I can. Um, and so to me, um, advances in chemicals management sort of, um, not sort of, but really is uh, chemicals management is just a place where we're needing, com you know, convergence research where you're, um, you're, you're looking at um, problems, you know, research on things that are driven by specific compelling problems that require deep integration across disciplines, which I think we keep hearing, right? And it's not your program's job to do research, but you are leaders and, you're, and you partner with people, you know, who can be taking this big problem that you're tackling and taking that convergence kind of a, um, approach. Um, and um, so just in terms of like a, an, an initiative, um, I mean, I, I kind of go back to that a little bit, but um, one of the things that I think you could sort of immediately start to do without having to do a whole lot of research is in how you're identifying chemicals of um, uh, on for the list. And I'm just going to go back to um, surveillance and more of a screening um, way. I think the non-targeted approaches were now, I'm kind of like, we're using these and they're working. Um, and it's, a, it, it's something, um, you know, looking um, chemical. Uh, so Identifying chemicals based on exposure, based on occurrence, it's in your reg, I, I checked. <laughs> um, and being able to do um, screening for unknowns using some of the non-targeted approaches um, in environmental media, including indoor media, biological specimens in, uh, in um, vulnerable ecosystems and communities and products. I think there's unbelievable opportunities to find these signals, get them on the list and, and, and drive innovation, drive some you know, solutions. So that's something um, 10 years ago couldn't have been done. And now I really, really think we're ready. Um, so, so that's, you know, that's kind of, that's kind of a six, seven, whatever, but something that can be done. Um, but then in terms of, you know, how, um, how do we address some of these societal problems through innovation and product design, which I, I think is what you're teeing up. You know, I think it's kind of the ambition um, is some thinking, some partnering, some papers where you're looking at more systems thinking and approaches. I think you're, it, it's almost like taking your A to M and, and um, putting it into um, something that's, that is potentially operational, you know, something you can operationalize, but first needs to just be done a little more rigorously. Um, I, and part of why I say that is because now if you're, you know, now if you're starting to talk about climate and which, which there's no way to avoid it. That is where all, all the, you know, more innovative, newer products and um, that's, where they're going, you know, it's it's going to be these building products for for climate solutions and and adaptation. Adaptation is really where all the products are going to be going. The the materials and things that are going to be used are are going to be part of that. 
So being able to ask questions about, um, and I, I read the article on essential uses of chemicals, but I, again, products, essential uses of, you know, what's an essential product? Um, and that kind of gets at this industry level thing, right? Is the product essential? And, um, and that's a real intersection of social science and engineering and, you know, very transdisciplinary. Um, so is the product essential? Are the processes sustainable? And that's this whole thing too about some of the newer advanced materials. Um, and, and it's not just uh, evaluating the material or the chemical or the, you know, nano or the microplastic book is the process for um, manufacturing chemicals, materials, products sustainable. And then um, are the chemicals and materials safe? And answering that question sort of gets at this kind of whole one health planetary boundaries. I mean, the thing is, I think you like this, you're touching on something that, that goes so big um, and the question is, how do you just um, lay that out that here's your, you know, here's where you have leverage, you know, you can't act on all those spaces and you certainly can't characterize and quantify and assess all of that. But if you're not able to really define your boundaries and, and show where the decisions you're making and the analyses you're doing and the questions you're prioritizing are you know kind of feeding into that? I think it just makes it harder. Well, I think it makes it harder to prioritize. Um, so anyway, probably uh, probably not helpful. <laughs> Very big picture, and that's always good when we're having these kinds of conversations. Before we go to Julie, I just want to give Emma and Jack a heads up that you'll be next after Julie. So assemble your thoughts, and Julie, you're up. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. I'm not sure if I like being at the end or the beginning better, but because uh, <laughs> um, now I have thoughts on what several people have said. So um, I'm going to dovetail on a few things. And one is Helen's comment about um, you know, the renewable energy sources and climate change mitigation technologies are very materials intensive compared to uh, conventional fossil fuel based energy systems. And they are materials intensive in materials that are often out, not the focus of your scope. So structural materials, you know, inorganic materials, not your chemi chemical formulations, but ceramics, metals, semiconductors, you know, silicon, um, cadmium telluride, photovoltaics, perovskites, um, batteries. They're different categories of materials than a lot of what you've been looking at so far. And so kind of getting yourself prepared for that landscape, I think is important, which brings it back to a comment that Molly made on getting, you know, how do we deal with going beyond an individual substance into formulations, but also into alloys, mixtures, compound ceramic systems that have multiple elements in them. Um, do you really target to take lead out of perovskite or do you just say no perovskite, right? I mean, that, that's a different question than taking you know, a plasticizer out of a bottle. So it's a, it, dealing with mixtures is something that I know the community has talked about and we've talked about before, but I think it's a, an area that needs to be addressed as these technologies are moving forward. Um, and there's maybe some opportunity from the informatics side and predictive side of things to try to understand those more complex material systems in a way that it goes beyond just the individual substances. So I echo the earlier comments that having more people that can do informatics and AI and think really leapfrog thinking ahead in terms of how to deal with these more complex material systems that might be coming down the road or are coming down the road. Um, I also wanted to echo, I think it was Tim who commented on a tool 
you know, a really quick, easy tool for a consumer to do a comparison. And then on uh, Art's comment of how do industry engineers design their plant and choose their materials. So, you know, can we combine that in some way where there's a tool for the engineer to use early in the design process? Um, and of course, there's just looking at the chemicals list, right? So your comments that for cooktops and food packaging is amazing, right? It says that a list is a powerful tool potentially, right? So you guys could be out of business at some point if everybody just stops using the chemicals on the list, which is a good thing, but then it begs the question of, did you? Re is that everything, right? And are they really looking at the more complex product design, or are we really just taking out chemicals? So there's there's the the good, you know, like in the recycling world, we design product you know, processes for recycling goods, but what if that feedstock suddenly you know just stops coming because people finally design a better way to make the product that you don't get the waste in the first place, right? So if you've got a chemicals list that people stop using where does your program go and how do you, is, is that the goal? Is that an end game to just say, we now have this list. Can we get people to no longer put them in products? Are we successful? Is that good? Or where do we go beyond that, that bigger um, scope? I, I don't think that that's, it might be one metric of success, but I don't, you know, I, the world is complicated, right? And there's more, um, products out there and chemicals. Um, so those are some of the, the things I wanted to say. The other is, um, as I mentioned this morning, education, trying to figure out how to get this, not just to educate the consumer, educate the design engineer who's helping design the plant and the new manufacturing, but how do we actually get it into curriculum? And I know that's not your job, but how, you know, you, as you, work with other stakeholders is how are, what are the strategies to take this wonderful knowledge of your staff and translate that into academic resources so that you'll, you know, there, we can broaden the world, the number of our um, alternatives analysis people who can work in different organizations, kind of like LCA has taken off in some communities how do we do that on it for AA? Um, and you have the best team who's been trained in it. So finding a way to translate that would be, uh, I think, very powerful. I'll stop it. Thank you, Julie. Your comments remind me why it's so important for us to have participants from academia because of the ability to think really big picture. I, I, I think they're not the only ones in this meeting, particularly Helen and Art have made some really big picture comments, but I, it's just, it's nice to have that mix because you're thinking way ahead and that's important to challenge the program to do. So um, Emma and Jack are left and going in reverse order. I think Emma, are you ready? Do you have anything to say? Yes, I do, thank you. Um, uh, I think there are a few themes here that are, are are coming out. And so a couple of them had come into my head too when I was preparing responses. So I'm just going to amplify um, those uh, really uh, uh, both Art and Julie, maybe others touched on them. And Julie just spoke about education. Um, as I was looking across the questions, I thought, well, collaboration, education, et cetera, you are doing quite a lot of these things. You are putting yourself out there. You are making communication materials, um, you know, but yeah, you sh we should always be trying to be doing it more and better. So I do think that um, getting, getting information about your program into the curricular and education of young chemists and engineers, especially at the university level, is really important. Um, several organizations are putting a heavy focus on green and sustainable chemistry education and curricular, but this program is an example um, of, of what can be done and is an example of ways to do things, an example of the challenges that may arrive in a chemist or engineer's portfolio in their job when there needs to be um, a new chemistry or a new process. 
So the Safer Consumer Products Program may be spurring, and we're going to talk about that uh, later on in the agenda, I think, spurring the need for new chemistry and new processes. So we need to be educating the people that are going to be doing this. And uh, younger people may tend to be unbounded and more innovative. So I think opportunities for you to highlight, for people to have guest lectures, to people, for people to have some curricular information they can draw upon, um, possibly from your website, is valuable. And then the, the other theme is artificial intelligence. Of course, that's a big buzz um, at the moment. Uh, and I would encourage... Um, thinking about and potentially collaborating with other organizations on how artificial intelligence might help you, especially um, in being more efficient. You are building the program and have more people, but of course there's more work than you'll ever have people for. So what are the tasks that may be um, computing and machine learning could do for you or help you do faster? And then also, if you have the time, <laughs> um, how might artificial intelligence actually use the information that your program is putting out there? And is it in the right format for it to be used well? I think that is something that we all need to think about. And I'll, I'll just stop there and pass on to Jack. Thanks, Emma. Did you have any reactions to Tim's remarks about um, the cumulative and pesticides? Of course, of course. Uh, I, I, I was knowing I was going to be at the end of the row here. I, I, I was thinking about pesticides and I have, I have two, two ways I was starting to think about that. Um, one was, you know, as mentioned, what does your regulatory framework and uh, legal aspects allow you to do? Um, and secondly, pesticides is a big area of chemistry. There are multiple groups and uses of pesticides. And so maybe there's opportunity to, to think about where, where the framing is for that in terms of the program. And it would probably be valuable to have more discussion to dig into that and pick it apart. And um, cumulative impacts, of course, is a big, big priority. In the environmental health space, we're working on that at, at EPA, um, and I, 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 it's a it's a new frame of thinking and a new frame of applying policy um, that that we all need to do, and it really uh, I think is just building upon ideas. It's building upon ideas from um, from the past about um, mixed exposures, uh, but now it's maybe being framed in a way that it can be, um, addressed. So I, I'm giving vague comments because I don't have a specific answer for, for this today, but I'll think on that some more. Thank you. Thanks, Emma. I totally understood. I just was looking for reactions and I really appreciate your comments. Uh, Jack, are you there? You have, you have thoughts for the, to share on these uh, topics? Uh, I am here. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Um, obviously, going last, um, my comments, generally comments from Art, Mike, Helen, I agree with um, in general, so I won't spend too much time. I may give you some different words for some of the things they're saying. Uh, first of all, when it comes to new types of uh, methodologies to assess safety and impacts, uh, the personal care industry pretty much globally now, certainly in US and Europe, are not allowed to do animal testing. They have to use non-animal safety assessments, which involves computational toxicology, and obviously that leads into AI. So I think um, the staff at, uh, in California has to be able to understand that and how safety assessments are now being done for any new chemical, which enters into some very significant categories. Um, on the environmental justice, I know Helen mentioned it, but you know we've talked about the impact of certain chemicals and products in certain communities, but impact of climate change in my book is probably as great as or maybe even more 
in some of those communities. So that's an area where, uh, and I agree with Helen, that we probably should begin looking or at least trying to understand some of those things. Um, I also want to make sure that uh, I'm reflecting one of the comments. Uh, just because a chemical is hazard, the regulation requires it to be in a product. And just because you do something with a chemical in a product doesn't mean you're getting rid of that chemical. I think consumers and others have to realize that you're not in the process of eliminating the chemical from all uses. You're eliminating it from a certain use or a certain product. Um, and that gets me into one of my last comments, which I really haven't heard much. And that is the success of the entire program is gonna depend on what happens after the regulatory responses are issued. Uh, do we have the data to show that we're actually improving things? Um, and that won't come until there's a regulatory response uh, in, in part. Uh, some of the early ones say are very positive in that, You're getting rid of toluene, for example. But is it going to lead to some improvements in human health, especially in some of those EJ communities? And I think uh, DTSC needs to focus on making sure it has a way of measuring those, uh, the success it, it has as we go forward. It's too early to tell now, but once you get through the entire program, which includes regulatory response, then we'll be able to actually begin putting on paper what the benefits to society are. And if it turns out the benefits are pretty weak, then I think we've got to go back and readdress the program and make it stronger somehow. Um, but it's also important from an education point of view to say, okay, just because we got minimized or replaced chemical A in a product, that doesn't mean that chemical is going to disappear. It's, it's actually still there because that's not the regulation. The regulation is a product chemical combination that we have to worry about. So I just think moving forward, we have to make sure that consumers, stakeholders know exactly what the regulation entails, but also what it doesn't entail and go from there. Uh, Okay, now you're going to ask the question about Tim and, and pesticides. Um, I agree with Emma that pesticides is a huge category, um, going from some cleaning products all the way to things you put in farm agriculture. So I think maybe on some, in some sense, there are products that consumers use every day that could conceivably be part of this. Um, but I, I think it's so big, it's going to be really tough to, to take a, to grasp the whole issue quickly. But there may be some small wins that we can get by taking parts of it and going with that. Sounds like that's, uh, are you complete, Jack? I'm done. Okay, thank you very much uh, for those comments. And before I'm going to, so just a couple of things, heads up, I want to delay a couple more minutes on this because I think it's a really productive discussion. Um, I want to say a couple words. I'm going to offer the folks who are at the beginning the opportunity to say a few words, and then I'll check in with staff to see if there's anything more you want clarified before we move on to the next topic. So um, I'll try to keep my personal intervention brief. I'll start with Tim's um, remarks. I do think that cumulative is an important issue and uh, particularly a couple of folks mentioned the issue, issue of mixtures and that when a product is reformulated or redesigned um, as part of an, uh, as a, a substitution, it's the whole product that I, I think you're trying to assess. And I think it's important that the state be really clear that it, it's usually not just a drop in substitute, you're really changing the whole product and that whole thing is on the table exactly how to get there is not clear to me. I think that's a, a challenge for the next decade. It's not the next year. Um, on pesticides, I, I have a little different view, um, but also somewhat the same view, which is that um, I, I, Department of Pesticide Regulation has some really broad authorities. They aren't doing alternatives assessment upon registration. They're getting in place some stronger systems to prevent registration of problematic pesticides. Where they're really falling down is the stuff that's already registered. And they're um, developing the Sustainable Pest Management Initiative. 
they're really stuck on the urban side. I, I feel like in agriculture, it's a whole separate special thing where you have to look at crop and location and water. And there's a lot of special things around those that would be very hard for DPR to drop into and some of the AA frameworks we use to fit into. Whereas on the urban side, there's so much similarity. And in fact, one of the biggest problems is that people don't know they're using a pesticide. They don't know it's a product. It's just the thing. They don't know it's a pesticide product and falls in this other framework. DPR can't even figure out who to engage with in terms of urban pesticides. They're having trouble. I mean, they're really trying, but it, there's just not a, a standing com community that says, hi, we're the AJ people who are concerned about pesticides for urban areas. They're all organized around ag. And so I'm just seeing this gap over there that's being robustly addressed here and wondering if there's some opportunity for partnership in the agencies around the area of current use urban products. So just kind of tossing that out there for a little thought. And I just keep seeing the synergism between the two programs in that particular area. Um, and expertise. Um, other kind of general things, I've already mentioned scientist salaries, so I won't ber berate that, but I think that is one of the most critical aspects to address for the future of the program. Another small one to address is the state travel approvals. Um, I'm not seeing the state scientists at the national conferences because of that out-of-state travel problem. And I really want to emphasize that it's absolutely critical um, for the program to be a leader, to just be successful, for scientists to learn, um, and for those relationships to develop with other sci scientists so that the state's work can be leveraged, so you can get free work basically from elsewhere, is to have folks at conferences, both nationally and even internationally. And uh, again, that's another one where I think uh, the management there needs to be a management solution. I don't know how that happens and if I or other committee members can help. I think I'm not the only one, but it's, I've been really disappointed at how few um, scientists uh, from this program and from the Kelly P agencies are appearing at key national pro conferences. Um, on the Green Ribbon Science Panel, uh, I actually do not agree with um, Mike, in regard to having chemical manufacturers on the panel for the very reasons that Helen mentioned, that the change point is, is, is at, at a higher place in the um, product manufacturer chain than the chemical manufacturer because they man manufacture this chemical. So I, I think that keeping the industry representatives at the level of people who buy the chemicals is a much more important thing for the committee. Uh, it would be great to have expertise in worker safety, exposure science, LCAs, supply chain management is another one that's come in a lot as important issues. Um, and then finally, a couple of big points. Uh, one is that right now there's no available um, ecotox chemicals authoritative list. So this has always been something we've talked about this forever. Where's the list of chemicals that are, are causing ecotoxicity? Uh, this is something that needs to get developed. And it is probably something that gets developed by an agency or with funding from an agency, or you know, it's gotta be some, something that an agency accepts or approves before it can go on your list. So I, I wanna throw that out as still a really big need nationally, internationally. It, it actually would really change the conversation to be able to create definitions and lists that would be accepted around um, chemicals that cause harm to the environment and not just to people. Um, and the other one is the, um, the idea of surveillance or monitoring. Uh, early this morning, uh, the staff mentioned the brake pad report, which highlighted the need for a monitoring program. We've been talking about that in various ways throughout the day. They, although we have the capacity now with the new program to be able to buy and test some products for enforcement, that's not the same as a long-term environmental monitoring program or human health monitoring program or product testing program. And the staff have told me direct, right outright, our biggest problem with proceeding with some of the chemicals that we want to address that are present in the environment or in people is the lack of data on their presence in products. And that's not gonna get fixed overnight. The data call-in authority will certainly help. Uh, so that's a biggie. 
and probably equally or more importantly is having statewide monitoring programs that are well-funded enough. So at least we have biomonitoring California, but it doesn't have the funding it needs. We do not have statewide monitoring programs in place um, for the kinds of pollutants that we're interested in here um, in the water field at all. So there's a tiny little stream pollution trends, pro trends program. I think they get $150,000 a year. So they just aren't gonna be able to do everything that we want and it's only sediments. Um, so if we wanna understand the impacts and benefits of this program, and if we wanna know what chemicals are out there um, and to use in the prioritization system, uh, there really needs to be programs that are there. The state's working on developing a microplastic monitoring program. It's not clear who's gonna implement it. You know, Nobody seems to own it. So it, this is, it's, a, it's a fundamental public policy problem for Cal EPA that it hasn't figured out how to do these things. So that's a challenge for the decade ahead. Um, so with that, I saw Anne wanted to remark, um, I don't know if any of the others early in the chain want to remark, I know Molly does. So um, do you still want to say something? Okay, you want to? When I look at my list, I think I have some disconnected stories, so I will try to connect them. Uh, on the cumulative impacts, um, I'm not sure that I have anything to add, except I don't quite know how we're going to do that in a regulatory structure, but it's definitely something we need to address. Um, on, on, that leads me to an idea about the, the full formulation piece and what this program has been able to do with, with collaborators. So that discussion about uh, nail products uh, and your story about the, the gentleman who drank his nail polish uh, product, uh, what, it has shifted the conversation because we have now been able to have at the Greener Solutions Program and the Berkeley Center for Green Chemistry, a discussion about how you change the full formulation from a couple of different ways with a major player in that sector. So just showing what the, the indirect impacts and direct impacts of your program are um, around the cumulative impacts piece. Um, I wanted to respond to something Jack said about we should be looking that climate change is a bigger impact for environmental justice communities. I would say these are not disconnected. The work that we do on chemicals and the work that we do on climate impacts, the same, in, uh, same communities are impacted and it's by the same industry, the petrochemical manufacturing. So let's just be clear that these are not disconnected issues and, this, and the same communities are impacted by both. Um, and then to pesticides, I, I was cheering along <laughs> saying yes, but I don't really know how we do it. Um, I absolutely agree that pesticides need to be addressed. And I would point out something that we've been seeing in the agrochemical world, which is the combination of pesticides and fertilizers and uh, microplastics intentionally added for, for distribution. So that's, that's a potential in, in road to the work that you're already doing. Thank you. Um, so Suzanne, then Molly. Yeah. Just to briefly comment on some of the things that Tim had mentioned that I didn't get a chance to give feedback on. In terms of regulating pesticides, um, that's near and dear to my heart. I started my research as a PhD student looking at pyrethroid pesticide impacts in the San Francisco Bay Delta and quickly realized that while there was a plethora of data on what was being used in agricultural uh, agriculture, there was very little available in in terms of what was being used in urban areas, which in many ways is just as much of an impact um, in terms of how much is being used. It's not regulated. People don't know that it's in the products that they're using. So I think it would be incredibly important to team up with the Department of Pesticide Regulation where possible to try to fill in some of the gaps that still exist in terms of addressing those challenges. Um, and then in terms of uh, cumulative impacts, that's really the directions we should be going in. I agree with some of um, what others have said in terms of how does that fit into our current regulatory framework, it really doesn't. We need a new regulatory framework if we're going to effectively address, um, address chemicals in a cumulative manner. Um, but that being said, it all goes in alignment with what's happening, mostly um, coming out of Europe with discussion of thinking about planetary boundaries and thinking about pollution as well as climate change impacts as, you know, one, but they're all, they're all going to the same place. They're all having cumulative impacts. And I think the question with cumulative impacts is figuring out how do we group things or do we just consider everything as being, as being additive um, 
as they as scientists are doing with these planetary boundary um, assessments. Um, so those are my thoughts on on both of those points. Thank you, Susie and Molly. Um, so one when, when is a comment because I forgot to um, add it, but I want to put it up for the record. One is uh, just around um, Cal Safer. And, you know, I so appreciated reading the 10 year in review because in my head, it was kind of a black box around a lot of what has happened with some of the responses to the priority products, like what happened? <laughs> and um, don't really know how to search, you know, Cal Safer to tell me that story. So one is, there's two suggestions around that one is other types of cross, you know, portals that can be developed that cross reference to the primary pages of those product priority product um, pages to emphasize what's happened around those, but also maybe around your education and outreach. Give me a webinar about how I can really dig into that portal and learn and compile and aggregate and see the stories that be, are being told, um, you know, as a result of, uh, of these actions. My, my next thing is just a question. And when Jack said, and, and Emma as well, pesticides are complicated. There's so many different product types, sectors, how would we carve this out? There are two things that came to mind. One, I'm thinking home and garden pesticides, just because I've done a lot of work on cancer and pesticides and we see clear signals with childhood cancers and, home, and the use of home and garden pesticides for one. But then cleaning products. And I was like, okay, team, what about, your, your quaternary ammonium compounds. These are pesticides, are they not? I mean, disinfectants are classified as pesticides. So I'm just wondering how the program in this moment is navigating that question, because it might inform us going forward about how this can take, we can take on this role. We can, I think, and maybe Andre is the best person to answer that question, but we're very aware of that. And that's part of what we've been doing, looking at quacks in terms of one, what are they? which is not, you know, it's a broad class of chemicals. And two, where would they fall regulatorily? Uh, because I would just make a general comment is that uh, why I really appreciate the discussion on pesticides. You know, we're a body that has certain authorities and responsibilities, and we don't, as Tim pointed out, have the authority to deal with pesticides right now. But to that note, that tees Andre up to talk a little bit about quacks and that space. So uh, that's exactly right. So we're focused on, you know, it's a, a we've kind of identified a, a large number of members of the of the class. And our definition of consumer products that we're working on under in the statute does exclude pesticides, but it doesn't necessarily exclude the chemical. It depends on how the chemical is being used. So we're focusing on use of quaternary ammonium compounds that aren't FIFR regulated. Um, so a lot of the like in say personal care products, it kind of depends on how uh, they're used and what sort of claims are made for their function in the product. So we are sort of navigating, trying to thread the needle and focus on things that are within our purview that are within the definition of a consumer product, not excluded under the statute. So we still think there's some territory there, yeah. yeah. So thanks for clarifying. Um, I'm going to move quickly to Elaine and then Tim will get the last word in this section. And while they're going, oh, do you want to? Yeah, Emma Scott. Oh, I'm so sorry, Emma. Can we let Emma go? Because it's harder. Yeah. There. Oh, do I get to jump in? Go ahead. In? You're muted. I'm muted. You can't hear me? We, we can hear you now. Excellent. Uh, thank you. I, I just want to come back to cumulative impacts and actually using that part of my brain since I've been involved in that part of um, some work there. And I wanted to offer a couple of thoughts um, on how to participate in, in the matter of cumulative impacts, which would be, I think, uh, through cumulative impacts assessment. There's mm, there's an, a number of um, steps that are really raising up as the ones you would um, utilize if you're stepping into um, a, a, a place-based type of cumulative impacts assessment. 
We have convening, scoping, assessing, implementing and monitoring. And I think this a program like this would be one of many participants at the table um, that listens during convening and scoping on a communities, um, a community's exposures to chemical and non-chemical stressors. Um, a program like this could also participate in how in um, providing information to the um, assessment of data. And a program like this could also be um, uh, part of the solutions or part of the options that a community might put into a community action plan for change. So what you hear from cumulative impacts assessment would then uh, inform what you might choose for a chemical product combination or how you might choose to um, interpret the alternatives analysis and what your regulatory response might be. So I just, while it was fresh, I wanted to share that and would be happy to follow up. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emma. Sorry, Elaine, you're up and then Tim. No, actually, that, I mean, that was helpful because um, I'm not sure everybody at the at the table is using cumulative impacts the same way. And so uh, em, Emma's points were really helpful. It's not the same thing as mixtures. It is place, it, so cumulative impacts can mean anything to, you know, but many people now in the environmental health space are using it as this place-based kind of a, a analysis. And um, so there's, you know, so there's that, there's dealing with mixtures, there's co-exposures, there's non-chemical stressors. There's a whole bunch of different things that may or may not be wrapped up in that. But, um, um, and, I, and I will just, say, I, I, all my comments are my own and do not represent <laughs> my agency, um, but the agency did put out a cumulative impacts report or something Emma might be able to better tell me and um, just uh, know it uh, had mixed, mixed uh, response and, and, you know, reviews. Thank you, Tim, you get the last word. Hey, thanks. Um, I wanted to, um, I, I see a link between this cumulative impacts issue and the question of like the whole product issue. I think you might have, I think all great comments. So I forget who said what wonderful thing, but um, so like on the cumulative impacts, I love what um, Emma said. I think that's right. Like I was just trying to imagine off of what you said, like where could it come in in the process? And one would be kind of in the prioritization Thing where you're thinking about burdened communities, right? Um, so you give like a little um, uh, more attention to things that are affecting them, which is the way I think about cumulative impacts as opposed to cumulative risk assessment or cumulative risk. But then you'd also think cumulative risk could come in in a couple of different ways. So for example, it's funny, um, like when I think about how dangerous a chemical is, I think it, it integral to that is like the effect it would have on its own plus any other additive or synergistic effect it could have when it's used in combination with something else. It's not as if the cumulative risk associated with a mixture is something completely different than how dangerous a chemical is. You know what I mean? So like, so for example, when your priorities, you're thinking about alternatives and you're going to compare the product, uh, the chemical product that's under review to the alternatives, I don't see how you do that without asking the question of how much harm does the product exposure to the, to the chemical itself from the product plus the cumulative risks of the mixture? Like those are the same thing, right? I mean, they both have to do with how hurt you're gonna be because that particular chemical is in the product. So it seems to me there is no need for additional authority under the statute or anything for that because the statute's already asking you to compare the risks or the harms associated with a chemical in the uh, chemical product combination and the alternative. And that harm has to be both the individual risk plus the additive effect that thing has because of other stuff. And at least that's the way I think about it. So I see 
cumulative risk being important for doing any kind of comparison between, you know, an incumbent and potential alternatives. The other thing that would be kind of interesting would be, um, I think you could under the way the statutes are written right now and the regs are written right now, you could, could you not, um, you have a product chemical combination, right? That gets identified. But like Mike asked the question about, well, how do you hit, deal with tires with the six PPD and then the tires with the zinc? Isn't that one thing? And I could imagine you could have, had you thought about doing it, said our product chemical combination is tires with zinc and six PPD, right? So one could look at a product and say, there's three chemicals in here we're worried about individually and in combination, boom, now we're gonna deal with the product combination Right, so that links together these two concepts in one. My point is just, there's, I think there's lots of important and creative ways that you could integrate cumulative risk and slash cumulative impacts at multiple points in the program. And it's a matter of kind of like figuring out how to do that. Last point, which is folks have been doing cumulative risk assessment for decades. I started in the Superfund program back in the nineties and we were, the, the risk assessors were doing cumulative risk assessment for cleanup options. Across. There are established uh, methods, additive, component-based methods, those sorts of things, very simple to very sophisticated. So I don't think it's a question of, oh, do we have to develop new technologies or to, new methods for risk assessment? It's more a question of how do we adopt existing methods in a legally defensible, practical, and whatever the third thing, painful. meaningful. I thought you said painful, <laughs> meaningful. <laughs> it's painful too if you're doing it right, yeah. But anyway, what I'm trying to say is it wouldn't be reinventing the wheel, it'd be more about adapting what's already being used in other areas in a, in a, uh, a thoughtful way in multiple places within this program. All right, so I saw some uh, flags go up around the multiple chemicals in a product, and I suggest we tackle that in the um, work plan discussion coming up next. So I want to know from Andre and Tigleth if you want to give your presentation now, or should we take a break and then let you give your presentation after the break and take the item right after that? A short one or? We're, we're definitely going to take a break. It's just whether we take it now or after your presentation. So break. Yeah. Break. Okay. So, all right. 345, 340, 345. So 10 minute break. Okay. So we're going to go ahead and start off. Um, thank you. We're going to be talking about topic two, uh, Tigla Mordoth Khan. How do you pronounce that? Is that correct? <laughs> Wonderful, thank you. Are you gonna uh, come up to the podium or are you just gonna present from there? It's, it's up to you. Okay. So we're moving on to the presentation on the product, priority product work plan. Uh, we'll follow with clarifying questions and then move into a discussion on the work plan. And although we don't have it in front of us, we've got a preview in our packets. And I think we're gonna learn some fun things from Tiglath and Andre's presentation. Thank you. So thank you for the introduction. Um, this presentation, its purpose is to provide you with an overview of the product categories we are proposing to add out to our 2024-2026 um, prior product work plan. Uh, this is going to be followed by a presentation by Andre on the requirements that are specified in Senate Bill 502. So before I um, present our proposed uh, product categories, I first would like to quickly remind you what the purpose of the work plan is. The work plan is intended to be a policy document which guides our product um, evaluation work. The document identifies product categories and policy priorities that we may evaluate during each three-year period and provides a general explanation of our decision to include those product categories. During each three-year period, we only evaluate the product categories described in the work plan, unless we get a petition to add the product chemical combination to our pro um, priority products list or compelled by statute or executive order. 
Our hope is that the work plan provides general information to stakeholders about the specific work they plan to do over the next three years. So the work plan is not intended to ident identify any new products, it does not lay out a comprehensive schedule for evaluating products, and it does not create any new legal obligations for stakeholders. The selection of product categories to include in the work plan is complex. We, there's no formula for choosing product categories. So much of the, of the decision-making process is left to our discretion, which we try to exercise in a transparent and responsible way. When choosing product categories to include in the work plan, we consider a lot of information, and this includes internal recommendations from our own staff, along with stakeholder engagement, which includes all of you on the Green Ribbon Science Panel, and discussions that we have with our partners and other state agencies and boards, divisions, and offices within our department. Additionally, as you will see, uh, there's also some continuity from previous, work, from, from previous work plans. As the work we begin in a previous work plan is carried over into the subsequent work plan because of the time involved and the limitations of our resources. In each work plan, we identify a set of policy priorities we give extra consideration to as we evaluate product categories. For the 2024 to 2026 prior to product work plan, we are proposing to carry over the following policy priorities from the 2021 to 2023 edition with minimal changes. So th these are the potential for adverse impacts on the health of children and workers. The potential for the product to release candidate chemicals to indoor air and dust. The extent to which certain candidate chemicals in certain products may adversely and disproportionately impact the vulnerable communities. The potential for consumer products to release microplastics. And the extent to which listing a product as a priority product would leverage the work uh, of Cal EPA and other state agencies. For the 2024 to 2026 priority product work plan, we are proposing to include an environmental justice initiative section to highlight the environmental inequities faced by vulnerable communities who are disproportionately impacted by harmful chemicals in consumer products. Because of these environmental inequities, there is a need to uplift the concerns of these communities that are seeking environmental justice. In this section, we propose how to highlight how we seek to engage and collaborate with these groups as we further our work. As a reminder, listed here are the product categories from the 2021 to 2023 priority product work plan. For the 2024 to 2026 priority product work plan, we are proposing a new strategy for including product categories in the work plan by having two different sections. One which we are proposing to title product categories currently under evaluation and one titled product categories intended for evaluation. Categories in the currently under evaluation section are those which we are currently evaluating and categories in the intended for evaluation section are those which we intend on performing preliminary screening research in the next three years. Another purpose for this latter section is for stakeholder transparency and discussion. It is important to note that a proposal for including product categories in the second section does not imply that exposures to chemicals in these product categories do not have the potential to cause harm or less harm than the ones in the product categories currently under evaluation section. 
It is possible that during the 2024 to 2026 cycle, product categories which are in the intended for evaluation section of the work plan lead to proposed priority products based on the availability of new information and resources. In the product categories under evaluation section, we plan on carrying over the following product categories listed here from the 2021-2023 priority product work plan with minimal changes. We also propose to add two new categories to the section. These are paints and products that contain or generate microplastics. We propose to define paints as liquid, paste, or powder products applied to surfaces for decoration or protection that adhere to the underlying material forming a solid film. The rationale for including paints is that there is widespread market use of these products and that there may be potential for exposure, exposure to the kind of chemicals that they contain. The reason for including the products that contain or generate microplastics category is based on our recent effort to add microplastics to our candidate chemicals list. Products in the products that contain or generate microplastics category may release microplastics during their life cycles. We are also proposing to add seven categories in the product categories intended for evaluation section of the work plan. The first category is food contact articles, which was formerly the food packaging category. In the 2024-2026 priority product work plan, we are proposing to expand the food packaging category to include all products that are intended to be used with food or that come into contact with food during processing, packaging, preparation, cooking, serving, and transportation. Examples of the, some of the products in this category are shown here on the slide. The rationale for the expansion in scope is due to stakeholder comments we have received on our work related to food packaging, and also because of documented studies showing leaching of candidate chemicals into food. The next proposed category is the motor vehicle parts, accessories, maintenance, and repair materials. This was formerly the motor vehicle tires category. In the 2024 to 2026 priority product work plan, we are proposing to expand the motor vehicle tires category to include any component of or for a motor vehicle, in addition to its interior accessories and repair materials. The reason for the, this expansion in scope is that motor vehicles are complex products containing different chemicals, which have the potential to cause or contribute to harm to humans and the environment. Disposable face coverings is a new proposed category, which is intended for evaluation. This category includes products designed for single use to protect the wearer or others by limiting the spread of pathogens and or protecting the wearer from particulate matter. The rationale for proposing this new category is due to increased mask wearing during the COVID-19 pandemic. There is therefore the potential for exposure to candidate chemicals that are contained in these products. Electronics is another new proposed product category for inclusion in the intended for evaluation section. Products in this category include computer and peripheral equipment, communications equipment, audio and video equipment, and semiconductors. The external components of these products contain many chemicals, which may come into contact with users or may be released into the indoor air environment. There's also the potential for occupational and environmental exposures from semiconductor manufacturing. Yeah. 
products used or produced by metal plating and finishing facilities is another proposed category intended for evaluation. This product category includes manufacturing techniques, which are used to apply an exterior coating to metal to improve an object's surface properties. These manufacturing techniques use chemicals, which may adversely impact workers in surrounding communities, particularly tribal communities, as metal plating facilities are located near to federally recognized tribes. Pet care products is another new proposed product category intended for evaluation. This category includes products which are used to maintain the health and well being of household animals. The reason for proposing this new product category is that pet care products contain many chemicals which may adversely impact household animals as well as their owners. Sporting and athletic equipment is the final new proposed product, product category intended for evaluation. This category includes products which are used by athletes, recreational indoor users, and wildlife sports people. The rationale for proposing this new product category is that these products contain many chemicals which can expose people dermally as products in this category come into direct contact with skin. And so this concludes my portion of the presentation. I will now hand it over to Andre, who will present the requirements specified in Senate Bill 502. Thank you, Tigla. Nicely done. Thank you. Uh, and I just want to add my thanks uh, to Glath for doing a nice job. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about Senate Bill 502. Carl mentioned it this morning uh, in his remarks, and it is relevant to our work plan. So I wanted to just sort of give you an overview of the three kind of main elements of that law and how it affects or doesn't affect our work plan. So um, Senate Bill 502 was signed into law last year by Governor Newsom. Um, and it has three main elements. The, the first is th that it gives us the authority to skip the alternatives analysis step and go straight from priority product to a regulatory response. Secondly, um, it gives us some additional authority to request information from manufacturers. And then uh, thirdly, it adds some requirements for things to include in the priority product work plan. So that's kind of why we kind of tried to shoehorn it into this portion of the presentation. So uh, I'm just gonna go through very briefly each of these three elements and uh, that, that's kind of the extent of what I'm planning to talk about right now. I think I might've jumped a slide here. Yeah. All right, so uh, you know the first element is the direct path from priority product to regulatory response. Uh, and this um, portion of the law allows us to rely on uh, uh, publicly available information that meets our regulatory criteria for reliable information and proceed directly to regulatory response. Um, so it refers to studies or and evaluation or evaluation. Sorry. So we kind of had initially, I initially had read this to mean maybe an existing alternatives assessment, which could be the type of information we relied on, but it doesn't necessarily have to be an alternatives assessment. It could be some other published information um, that we have determined, you know, supports us making this, um, this jump. Um, we'd still need to adopt regulations to add the product chemical combination to our priority products list. And the law stipulates certain things that we need to do in that process, including having a couple of public comment periods. First, when we're proposing to um, rely on some existing study or other information to go to regulatory response. Um, and then again, uh, when we make a final determination that we're intending to do that. So um, we, we need to make sure that the, uh, whatever we we need to determine that whatever, um, product we're intending to put through this sort of bypass process meets the criteria in our uh, regulations under the um, sort of applicability for regulatory response. Um, we can also supplement uh, any missing information with additional information. And it, I 
can't remember if I mentioned this, we can do public notice kind of concurrently with the priority product uh, public notice. So we might, uh, we might do it that way. Um, and I, we're gonna be exploring ways of potentially using this authority during the 2024 to 2026 work plan uh, cycle. And um, so there'll be as with all of our work and as Carl kind of talked about this morning, a lot of um, sort of iteration and public engagement, but it could significantly you know, shorten the time between identifying priority product and getting to some regulatory response. Sorry about that. Um, we can pull that string if people wanna talk a little bit about that. Um, so secondly, um, as you're aware, we had authority to request information from manufacturers through a regulatory um, process that we put in our framework regulations. And under this process, um, we can um, ask for specific information, provide a time frame for responding. Um, we um, then um, would evaluate whether or not the people whom we asked for the information, of whom we asked for the information, responded or not. And then we have something called the response status list, which says, uh, you know, this person provided the information, didn't provide it, or didn't have it. So the really only consequences for, for not providing information to in response to one of our requests under this regulatory process is being put on that list. Um, this um, new authority uh, provides for civil or administrative penalties of up to $50,000 per day per violation. It has some res default response time of 30 days, which seems really short based on our experience, uh, which we can extend. Uh, and we can go upstream if the manufacturer from whom we've re requested the information doesn't have it. So um, we've got some experience under our belt using the regulatory process. Um, we released the report on our findings or, or of our information calling for ingredients in nail products earlier this year and workshop that. And it was a significant amount of work. Um, some of that work is, you know, you know, may not need to be repeated, which was sort of setting up a new module in our Cal Safer system for people to submit the information. Um, so we have a lot of details to work out on how this um, information request process um, uh, might, might go, but uh, we do intend to explore using it uh, going forward in the new work plan cycle. And then finally, uh, the additional information element um, of, the, um, of Senate Bill 502. And this requires us to provide some, it's pretty prescriptive um, and says that we're supposed to require information on, uh, sorry, I'm on the wrong page here, uh, on chemicals of concern in each product category in the work plan that we uh, need, will need and uh, how we plan to obtain that information. We're also supposed to sort of call out specific chemicals in each product category and provide timelines for priority product listing, alternatives analysis, and finalizing regulatory response for at least product five product categories. So um, we have included some of this information in the draft work plan. Unfortunately, it's not, it's still a draft. It's not approved for release, but we had hoped that you would have it in your hands. Um, um, and um, in some cases we haven't spelled it out because as you know, from talking with us over the years, we don't often know at the beginning of evaluating a product category, necessarily all the specific chemicals that we're going to need more information on. Uh, that kind of comes through our iterative process that starts with our screening and scoping research, public engagement, and then focusing in on more specific chemicals or subcategories of products. So really our main solution for providing that information um, and following kind of the spirit of, of the requirements is our using our our public uh, timeline, a safer consumer products timeline. Because as you know, um, we've broken out some fairly granular detail on activities and deliverables for each of our products and product categories that we're evaluating, even at fairly early stages of our work. And um, really the advantage of it is that rather than providing sort of a, um, a schedule at the beginning of the three year per period, we curate it and update it quarterly. So we're getting 12 updates instead of one. So um, that's that's a big advantage. Um, and uh, I think it has more detail than the statute requires as well. And it allows people to filter and sift through the information to find chemicals, products, product categories that they're interested in. So um, those are, that's just the nutshell of uh, 
Senate Bill 502. Just wanted to um, talk a little bit about it since it is the first time that these new requirements have been in effect, uh, that, or the first work plan since these, these uh, new requirements were put into effect. So I think that's what I have for you. Thank you very much. And again, thanks to Tiglath for uh, doing a great job. Well, thank you both, Andre and Tiglath. Our workflow here is to um, have informational clarifying questions. Um, and then we have a series of questions from the staff. I, we have until five o'clock for this discussion. So um, I am thinking of breaking them into categories so everybody doesn't have to go around the room on each, each one. We can go more popcorn style. Uh, and was thinking because the information that Andre just presented is a little more technical that maybe we handle uh, the questions from the staff um, nine through through 12 on the implementation of the new bill first after the clarifying questions and then come back around and talk about uh, the product category kind of questions, uh, the new um, section product categories intended for evaluation as a second set of questions and um, finish up with EJ questions and any other comments because I'm suspecting there may be some more general comments that folks have. So, um, so with that, we're at informational and clarifying questions. And I saw Helen and I'm betting that Tim has a question too in regard to the um, path over to um, regulatory response that's shortcut. Is that right? That is correct. Okay, it's you yours, my mind. <laughs> so the, the, the clarifying question that I have is um, on um, acceptable sources of the um, other uh, of assessments not done by the responsible by a particular responsible entity. Um, does that does five hundred two give you the authority to do your own AA to your own standard and then take regulatory action straight off of that? I think as Andre, and he probably knows more about it than I do, is that it, it gives us broad authority in, in um, um, both in terms of what we might consider is adequate to move forward and if there is additional work that needs to be done, that we can do that. And, and I think that's important because um, I don't see us fundamentally straying away from our, our overarching framework. Um, and there are a lot of, there's a lot of good work that gets done that does a lot of what we do, but there might be a gap. Um, or, uh, and I think the other thing that I would say is, again, we haven't done this yet. And I don't see us doing, just leaping right away and making decisions. This will be a communicative deliberative process as well, so that we, we will be seeking input you know, um, when we have questions. So, um, but yeah, it is, it, 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 I think it's safe to say it gives us an opportunity when others do good work that we don't have to redo or, you know, spend a lot of time if we, if that work uh, points us in the direction and gives us adequate information to, to move forward under our framework. Andre, I don't know if you want to add any. You're right. I, I, that I, Carl's right on. And the, um, the, the SB 502 references um, our definition of reliable information. So that could be um, peer reviewed um, literature. It could be something published in a report by the National Academies. It could be something adopted by another uh, regulatory authority uh, in, in state, federal, or international, or local. It could be um, at some, uh, some study that was prepared and submitted to one of those authorities uh, or um, uh, I think that's the main elements of it. So um, I don't really see us starting from scratch and doing an alternatives analysis uh, of our own would likely be um, supplementing information if we found information lacking, because it does say we have to meet the criteria in article six of our uh, framework regulation. So I think that's how it would probably play out. And I didn't mention, but we're gonna be, um, I, I see that uh, our attorney Lynn Goldman is here working on uh, regulations to kind of figure out how to connect the dots between priority product listing and direct to regulatory response. And before Lynn Goldman speaks, I just want to introduce Lynn to the panel. She's the attorney behind this program, and she's just done a whole lot of very quiet, very excellent work. So 
I just wanted to point out that it's actually not tied to an AA. So the 502 authority is really just that we need reliable information that would justify a decision to bypass AA. So we could, you know, if there's reports out there, studies that say, here's, you know, this product that is contaminated routinely by this chemical, but we know it's not necessary in that product, we could go straight to a response that says, you don't need this chemical in this product. Like that has been established by reliable information. So it, it doesn't necessarily focus on the AA so much as the information that would justify a decision to go straight to a reg response. I guess the... Does it, so it does, the source of that information could be internally or external. So it doesn't require it to come from an external reliable source. It could actually also be Theoretically, it could come from anywhere. Is that well? Because, just like, yeah, the definition of reliable information, um, you know, includes, you know, could include a report that we generated. It also, the statute says that we could supplement. So, if we found a report that didn't quite get there, then we can like publish our own white paper. Great. Yeah. And before you leave, uh, there's a question from Tim Malloy that might be something Lynn would want to weigh in on. Sorry. So could it also be like if you found a report or a study or something that said there are no alternatives, you could then go straight to the, the green innovation funding and require R&D? Yeah, I mean, I think that's an interesting question as to would that be a decision we would want to make, right? Do we think that it would be worth bypassing AA or bypassing the opportunity. So that was even something we've been discussing and how we write these implementing regs is, do we even, do we have kind of an off ramp to the straight to reg response where if someone's gonna volunteer to do the AA, which as you guys have said, we want people to do AAs. Like, would we let them then take that off ramp if they're willing to do the work and improve, you know, one way or another? We like AAs. We would. We we wouldn't. This wouldn't be for everything. This would be for some things. Yeah. I I don't want to break the order, but I know that Molly has been raising this this issue too. So, can you want to follow up? Yeah, it's it's a clarifying question. And um, just you know, Helen's comments about um, you know the priority product. Um, being, you know, being within that responsible entities business model. So to me, this allows us to really address this, right? So I guess the question is, to what extent does, uh, you know, if there's, if there's reports, literature studies out there that says uh, X alternatives are viable for replacement of X in such product, right? And demonstrates that viability. It, in general, right? Not for this business person, not for this model, not for this model, but for the product itself. Is that enough or do you have to somehow still consider, you know, the multitude of business models manufacturing this priority product? So um, I think that's twofold question. One is a legal one. And I think we have broad authority. Uh, the other one is a strategic, and practical and policy question. And I think it's, I hate to give you, it depends as an answer. You but, sound like a lawyer. <laughs> yeah, well, I have good training. Um, but I'll just use, uh, in, tomorrow we're gonna hear about our proposed regulatory responses in the spray foam industry, right? And um, we anticipate, I, that we may get comments from stakeholders saying, well, you should just ban SPF because there's an alternative and maybe cellulose or fiberglass. Um, in our experience, and specifically in that space, it's not a that simple. And, and so, um, and like many products, uh, spray foam is used for a multitude of uses. And that may be that for some uses, there is a viable alternative, but certainly not for others. So I think it's going to be um, in... Gosh, I don't want to use the word context after what happened. Anyway, it's a contextual question. Uh, sorry. Uh, um, it, it matters about uh, the specifics. And I think it's fair to say that we've been very deliberate about making those kind of calls. And particularly, we haven't, since we haven't done regulatory response yet, this is a really critical time for us. Um, so we're going to be seeking input 
um, obviously, as we go through this first regulatory response process for SPF systems. Um, but yeah, I think it opens up a lot of, of opportunities and it asks some real good questions. Um, and um, our hope is that it will be a situation where we can take good work and do good work further on it. Um, but we'll have to see. I know that's not a very fulfilling answer in some sense, but. No, but it. it's um, informative and compelling. And the youth scenario, as you mentioned, I think it's a really important consideration. So, yeah. Yeah, it is. And as we know that, I mean, this is one of the challenges we have. And, and you see this in the work plan, which are these huge, broad categories. And this, and we get this question, I think, even came up, how do you decide how to narrow that down? And one of the things I think we've learned is it takes a lot of work and, and dialogue and understanding uh, not just what the chemical hazard trait is, but how these products are manufactured, what their function is, are there alternatives, what are the exposure pathways in the context of cumulative um, impacts and the value proposition, right? So we don't, well, we, even though we're gonna be double the size that we were, we're not gonna have time or an interest to waste our time, right? Um, so, we, re we really want to be in a space that's meaningful and impactful and makes sense. So we, we have kind Trust of wandered us. into discussion a little bit on this item. So I just wanted to see if any of the other folks who wanted to speak were on this particular topic. Okay, and so I want to thank Lynn and her team for their wonderful work and support of the program and for answering these questions. Um, and then I, the list I have is, um, Elaine, Suzanne, Mike, and Tim again. And we're still at informational and clarifying questions. Yeah, thank you. This is an ambitious um, work plan. So I am curious if, oh my gosh. Yes, okay. <laughs> You're a DJ, get real close. I'm afraid of things real close. Okay, close to my face. Um, I. I have, uh, I would, I'm wondering if you could just say a few more words about products used or produced by metal plating and finishing facilities. Since that's so, it's the first time I've seen like a process based thing. And then I'm just curious about the consumer product connection. Well, uh, so I can talk, to, uh, speak to that question. Um, so Carl presented a slide this morning showing some work uh, done by a couple of our, uh, of our interns, uh, one of whom is now one of, uh, an environmental scientist with our program. Um, and that work was focused on looking at where metal finishing facilities are located in California and sort of overlaying maps of um, environmental justice communities and also um, tribal lands. And we found out that um, there, there are disproportionate um, exposures for those people living in those areas. And it was a little bit of a unclear how to make the link between those facilities and our framework, which is consumer products. And consumer products, keep in mind, is defined broadly. It doesn't just focus on things used by people in their households and sort of it also includes things that might be used in other settings, commercial or industrial settings too. So uh, this is kind of, um, a, we, we, we talked about this as sort of how is it that we could potentially look at these products or these facilities under our framework. And, and one way was to go one step upstream and look at the types of products used at these facilities um, to do whatever it is they're doing, whether it be, um, you know, uh, um, chrome plating or some other type of galvanizing, whatever it might be. So those companies are also, purchasing products, they may be mixtures or chemical products and using them to do whatever it is they do. So that is why it's worded in the way, the way it is as um, um, to try to capture both products used by the people at those facilities to make those products or potentially impacts from, for example, maybe zinc guardrails. We heard a lot that, uh, during our conversations around our zinc and tires petition that we granted that in fact, we should be focusing on galvanized metal uh, because it was potentially, uh, you know, a significant source of zinc um, to um, the surface waters. So I see Carl. So has I just one more. Let me just add a little to it, just to give you a little more perspective. 
Um, the department for many years has been engaged in all kinds of efforts that revolve around the impacts of metal finishers. Um, and Kelly and I worked for years um, in pollution prevention, trying to um, encourage movement from chrome six to trivalent chrome with some success in some regards, but uh, that that work still continues. And our colleagues at the Air Board, for example, are looking at PFAS, are the products that are used in plating bass that contain PFAS. And so this is sort of in a roundabout way back to this cumulative exposure or impact issues that we're trying to look at. Are there other things that are more broadly that our department and our community, more importantly, our communities are, are impacted by where there's a nexus with products. And so it is, it, it, it takes, it's going to take some pulling of the string to see what specific products might be engaged, but um, we do think there's potential there. Yeah. So I guess my I guess my follow on question is just an understanding of um, so, so if there's if there's issues around what's um, how the the um, information requests and whether things have to be uh, listed as a product or you also have policy priorities so then you have like under your policy priority you have microplastics really and then in a, as a product category, you have things that generate microplastics. So is there a reason something would be a policy priority versus a uh, product category? It's focused, uh, the way it's worded is that we can request information on chemicals, product use, sales, and it can cover any ca category or subcategory that's been in the current or any prior work plan. It doesn't have to be necessarily a product that we've already sort of, in fact, we probably wouldn't do it if we'd already, you know, com collected enough information to to regulate a, a product chemical combination, it would probably be during that kind of screening, scoping, prioritizing phase that we would likely use it. But, but it couldn't necessarily be a policy priority in the work. I think plan. well, the policy priorities dictate everything we do in our work plan. I cycle. mean, just to be, and I'm gonna make sure I'm clear is that the, the policy priorities are. Uh, our attempt to give a window into people asking question, how are you going to sort this category, right? And what are the things, because there are all kinds of potential uh, endpoints of concern, et cetera. And so this helps guide us in, in, as Andre and his team sort and sift and collect information, what lens can we look through uh, that says something might rise uh, higher in, in that category? Um, so, and, and I would like to stress that those are just highlight. We have extremely broad authority in the regulations uh, and discretion to approach from from any of those uh, any of those um, concerns. So, um, yeah. I said dictate, but it's not really. Uh, it, we can it it, it is informs. It, it's not that's the wrong verb. I mean, we can choose anything from within the product category, but the what we're actually calling them policies and considerations. I think what we'll call them in the in the work plan when it comes out. Um, but they are sort of signal what our thinking is, what, what sorts of things we're especially interested in. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I've got um, Suzanne, Mike, and Tim. We're still in informational or clarifying questions. Um, my clarifying question relates to um, the microplastics and products that release microplastics, because what I'm noticing is that the majority of the other priority product categories also include products that release microplastics. And within that framework, and maybe it's explained in more detail in the draft report, which um, no worries, we haven't seen yet, um, but how is that considered? Are they potentially considered under multiple priority product categories or are the soluble chemicals being thought of separately from the micro and nanoplastics potentially shedding or being intentionally added to these products. I'm thinking about paints, masks, you know, all, all electronics, all of these, all of these different categories. Uh, thank you for your question. I think it's a both and. I mean, the categ categorizing these things in, in microplastics is a great example. How do you categorize those things? There's each, as you point out, um, there are multiple within those categories, things that might be in both categories. So again, we're bucketing uh, and it's, there's a lot of spillover. So um, uh, I, I think our hope 
is that as we engage with and get feedback on the, the draft is that people will tell us then you should focus more specifically or here's where there's a real problem and microplastics is another great example where would we start <laughs> um and and go from there so it, it's really a both and okay which just we can discuss later but i was curious of how that affects the regulatory approach but yeah oh well i don't think inherently it affects the regulatory part it, it just affects our ability our processing of where we get to before we propose a, a specific priority product thanks mike it's your turn hopefully just a quick clarifying question on this with the product categories intended for evaluation does this become an all-inclusive list and you are limited to the product categories you say you intend to evaluate over the product plan or does it leave it open to if something else comes up that you find of interest that you could also evaluate other ones are you just saying these are what we think we might evaluate over the period or does this become a limiter of this is what we will evaluate and for the next time we'll come up with new ones intended for evaluation uh, as tiglet pointed out at his uh, presentation the Framework says that our work plan identifies the products that we will evaluate for potential does to identify priority products during the three year period. So um, I think uh, in the draft, we're, we're hoping to have some language around, you know, these are things that we that are on our radar. So generally speaking, yes, we're kind of constrained, uh, we're limited to evaluating things within the categories defined in the work plan, except if we are um, we receive a petition from somebody and, and grant it, or we're compelled to do it by the legislature or executive order. Um, so generally speaking, we're going to be focused only on products that fall within some of these categories, which some of them obviously overlap each other. Some of them are quite broad, but um, we wouldn't be pulling something out of left field and, and regulating it unless it was one of those other scenarios like a petition. The, when the regulations were written, there was a request to be able to see forward as to what would happen and put some boundaries on it. So the work plan fulfills that and the outlet are the other mechanisms, the legislature and executive order and petition process. So if something comes up, so for example, if tires had not already been in the work plan, then the, one of those other mechanisms could have been used to cause the department to have the ability to go outside its, outside its work plan. So um, Tim and then Helen, and I'm hoping we're getting close to the end of informational and clarifying questions. Thanks. Um, this is kind of one question with like two little subparts. So the first is, um, are, can, can you talk a little bit about things that you considered as product categories, but you just are not in the list of ones that you think are going to come out? Really, um, most of the things we considered are in here. So that was the, some of them were further along, you know, closer to ready to work on, or maybe have started thinking about already. Um, so that's kind of why we have so many more categories in this work plan than we've had in prior work plans. And previously we've had maybe five, six, seven max, maybe um, versus 13 this time around. So uh, some of these categories actually uh, were proposed by staff and didn't make it into the previous work plan. So um, I can't think of any, I don't know, Tig, I don't, I think we pretty much got everything we were thinking of this time, so. Thank you. All right, Helen. Um, I wanted to go back to the motor vehicle one, just to again clarify. Um, so is this basically taking in the scope of pretty much anything in a vehicle, including like in an EV, the EV battery? Because I know lead acid was kind of taken out, like what's in and what's out in that um, definition? I'm not sure if batteries are included, um, but it's... Um, it, it's it's limit it's the scope is um sorry let's try and see um but it, it's related to vehicle parts motor vehicle parts i don't know if batteries are in in, in scope um let me jump in here okay so um you know we're, we're beasts of definitions and 
and lines drawing. Um, and I think that's the kind of feedback we're looking for in the draft work plan. Um, but I will say this, from my perspective, um, yeah, I think we, we intend to have a very broad category here. Um, you know, it doesn't take long to look in this building and see the multitude of people working on issues related to the automobile directly and indirectly. And I spent a good chunk of my career on that outside of this program. So uh, at a very bucket category, it makes a lot of sense. Of course, we would love to hear and I, about specifics. I think your point earlier about carbon and the trade-offs is a really good point. And so that's the kind of input we're thinking that would suggest that we should include um, electric vehicles and batteries. But again, that's, it's complicated. Right, and whether or not some of those things uh, fit in our framework best is another question. Lead acid batteries that you mentioned, um, we were asked, and this is relevant to the scope of this because it did come up and we were asked by, both by the governor, by Governor Brown and by the legislature to look at that. Um, we have not released our final report on that, uh, but uh, I can tell you that the, uh, uh, I anticipate that we will hopefully get that out before I leave, but um, it's uh, it, our, our assessment of lead acid batteries, notwithstanding the significant impact of lead acid batteries writ large on California, is that in the context that we were looking at, it didn't make sense to do it at this time, primarily because there's hundreds of millions of dollars of R&D being spent on not just uh, alternatives to lead acid batteries, but um, uh, but different types of lead acid batteries. And so we've learned a lot in the years and we have staff that spent a significant amount of time and effort researching that. And it was, it was um, I think worthwhile, but yeah, to answer your question, it, I think it's gonna be broad, at least in the draft. All right, so let's move on to discussion. And I had suggested that we start since we're still kind of, we, we've spent a bunch of time talking around uh, the new authorities. Uh, the staff had some questions for us that are summarized up there around the data Collins. And I wanna add to this group, um, there's a question from them around existing alternatives assessment or other publicly available information, the SCP. Um, would want to know about to support by, bypassing AAs and proceeding directly to regulatory response. So basically, if you know of something in that area, I think they were asking us for that. Uh, so do folks have comments on the data, Colin? Like, so basically, are there product categories, data types? You know, what, what is it you, you think might be good, either starting points or important environmentally? in this area and any knowledge of existing AAs that would be helpful? Art, you're up. Um, so not so much AAs because those are very time consuming and expensive to generate, but uh, would the program benefit, benefit from having um, information, not on AAs, but on comparative chemical hazard assessments? Well, I'll start, but the short answer would be yes, we'd certainly benefit from that. And the, the question is perhaps what would we do with it? Um, I, I think that um, yeah, uh, yeah, I think again, we, we, we are, we're always um, challenged to get good information um, and good uh, analysis and put it in the context of our decision-making framework. So if we have that kind of information that helps us move forward and we can use it through this authority to accelerate the process or focus, that's a good thing. Yeah, I know, you know, for uh, um, um, many industries, uh, uh, as part of their material selection process, they in fact do do comparative chemical hazard assessments. So I think that might be a valuable uh, resource uh, to tap into. And, and just to clarify for me, are, I mean, I'm not sure, are you talking about for a specific product or are you talking about doing green screens or think, you know, are you talking? 
Yeah, I'm talking about actually on a formulation level, you okay. know, in terms of uh, doing comparative chemical hazard assessments, all of the ingredients, but not just the individual ingredients, but at the formulation level, uh -huh. which is what the electronics industry has done when it comes to cleaning agents. But it's not a comprehensive AA, as you know, uh, uh, as uh, in the uh, program's uh, AA guide. So but, it but potentially it could be, it would certainly sound like it would be very informative on a multitude of factors, maybe not all of them, but it certainly, yeah, that, that would be helpful. Uh, I think we could use this authority for comparative chemical hazard assessment data. The, it kind of calls out information on, ingre uh, on ingredient chemical identity, concentration, functional use, uh, if information, if existing information, if any related to use by children, pregnant women, or other sensitive population, data on state product sales or national product sales in the absence of state data, but it says not limited to. So I, I would kind of, I would ask Lynn, but I would read it kind of broadly. All right, so I've got Suzanne, Anne, and Elaine. Or, or Elaine, you put yours down. Okay, Suzanne and Anne. Okay, okay. We're at answering these questions. There are um, numbers six and seven in the background document. And so we're starting at the end because we had such a detailed presentation from Andre and a bunch of discussion around some of these items. I thought we'd start at the end and then go back to the beginning. The other, yeah. The product categories. I was holding off on that because I thought this might be a narrower discussion and the product category one, I'm kind of guessing there'll be lots to say. Sure. Okay, so Suzanne and Anne. This should hopefully be a short comment on um, number six, um, but I was wondering, given the focus on products that release microplastics for the coming um, work plan, would it make sense to include textiles as a subcategory here and to conduct an informational call-in with representatives from the textiles industry um, and this would be both traditional and sustainable textile manufacturers to start thinking about alternatives assessments. I know that's a big thing to, big bite to chew off, but yeah, just big concern and um, is one of the major contaminants um, we're finding in waterways. Thank you. Just as a follow on to that, yes, absolutely. And there's quite a bit of work going on in the textile sector already. So I think this, that would be really interesting information to get, um, which was not what I was gonna talk about. Um, so Art's comment about uh, chemical hazard assessments has me thinking, I don't know, you've probably answered my question. This is not limited to, so you may be able to ask for this, but we've been having conversations recently about how do we go to a sector and or specific formulation and ask, a sector, what chemicals are in use and what percentage of those are uncharacterized for hazard. And so, so we could get both the hazard information for those that have been characterized, it's like a hazard banding kind of equivalent, and also ask what percentage, what's already out there, what do you use, and then what percentage do you have hazard information for? Or, or yeah, or that I think so. I think there's some existing authority in the health and safety code as well that applies to most of the board's departments in Cali PA that allows us to request that type of information. Yeah, and I can't remember which law that was. We do have that in complement. I think the answer is yes. <laughs> One of the challenges I think is who do you ask um, right. and how do you ensure that the information you're getting is good. And, because and the answer to that is it depends. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, I, your point's a good one. Yeah, so strategically, Depending on the sector, you could have leading companies you could talk well, to a trade association. I mean, in textiles is a great example. We, in our first work plan, we had textiles writ large. Uh, we had a lot of engagement, a lot of good. Um, we found at that time it was challenging primarily because uh, a lot of the issues we had were with overseas manufacturing and we're at a different place than we are right now, but. Yeah, you're, and you're once you have that information to Helen's point earlier, earlier, it gets to the tier two, tier three right. folks that are hungry and have the innovative right. solution. Yes, certainly. So I'm gonna to go to Molly in a minute, but I did wanna intervene with my own comment in support of something that Suzanne said around chemicals in microplastic forming products, um, because the six PPD entire story, I think really illuminates the ability of microplastics to distribute in new ways chemicals into the ecosystem and into humans as well. Uh, so that, uh, that microplastics, the 
hazard and environmental harm associated with them is very likely a combination of the particle and the chemicals that they carry. So for a long time, people were focused on chemicals that might attach to them after they were released to the environment. And now we have such an understanding of them, the chemicals that are in plastics and how many of them are associated with at least environmental and often human health hazards. That that's really, I, I think something that is particularly of interest. Uh, the textile category I realized could be very difficult. So that the one that I, I has, strikes me as really important is uh, paints so that you've already got that on your list. There's a lot of ingredients in paint. I wouldn't try to pick everything. I'd pick one. Yeah, I'm really interested in PFAS and paints. Um, it, there's a couple other chemicals and paints that show up all the time in water, but I think they're both, um, I don't think your authority will let you get to them. And those are diuron and carbendism. They're both regulated as pesticides. Their point of application is into the paint formulation, but the paint that's being sold does not label or show that it has those. And there's millions of pounds of those being used. And uh, both of them are at concentrations that are pretty interesting environmentally. Uh, they're also, I mean, carbonism is basically a way to find an urban area <laughs> in the water. You can, you can find it everywhere. Uh, so just kind of pointing out paints and paints are another, uh, a recent paper came out and suggested that paints might be one of the biggest sources of microplastics and one of that we've been missing a lot in the measurement methods that we're using. So on to Molly. Um, so wanting to respond to question number seven about um, the availability of other types of alternatives assessments and public information that might be able to support the program. Um, I'm stating the obvious here, but just to state it, you know, we have uh, the MOU with Washington and um, the, the Department of Ecology is doing quite a bit of work on alternatives assessments for its safer products for Washington, as well as some of its other regulatory programs. Those are completed assessments, looking at both safer and, um, and uh, feasible and available. So um, going beyond a bit more what, what um, Art's saying in terms of, yes, we have quite a bit of robust information on, on chemical hazard uh, assessments, but um, Washington does go further to address the feasibility and availability question for a number of overlapping product chemistry combinations, right? So um, another key source, obviously stating, stating the obvious again here, but are the restriction proposals in the EU. So I, I say this just because, of, yes, there are the, alter, the, the analysis of alternatives. Those are conducted by industry to defend the use of their existing chemistries in a product. They're not that helpful. But in the restriction proposals, the member state authorities are required to do their own mini assessment of alternatives. Um, but looking very deeply at the hazard question, um, but also scoping and doing a landscaping on this question of feasibility and availability of available alternatives. So those absolutely can, can be mined for many of these product combinations as well. And just to say that I think the work that's coming out of academic programs, I mean, leveraging the greener solutions work, right? I mean, that's just, it, they have to get it published, Dan. So make sure they publish the work, some of them are, um, so that they can be used by programs such as this. All right, so I, I think we're getting close to wrapping up on this discussion of the six and seven questions about data Collins and regulatory response. I did wanna see if Emma or Jack had anything they wanna say on this topic, and then we'll move back up to the first set of questions on this topic around uh, the product chemical combinations in the work plan, which I think there's gonna be lots of ideas. Uh, this All is right. Jack, this, this is Jack. One quick question, when they ask for information to be called in, is that can that information be considered company confidential? I think any information submitted is um, there is sort of general protection for confidential business information. I think yes, we wouldn't. Um, so it would if we called it in, that wouldn't give people a pass on submitting the information, but it would right. protect it from disclosure. I'm, I'm looking back at my attorney, but in general, um, they would have to submit the information to us. They would have to assert. That it, that it was protected under the trade secret laws. Um, and then we would go from there. So, yeah. So, okay. So, um, I think we're wrapping up.
this area and if um, somebody could put questions one, two, and three. Yeah, there we go. And Molly, your flag's still up. I'm assuming that doesn't mean you want to talk right now. Okay. Thank you. So now, now we're going back to the beginning and Julie's getting herself in first. <laughs> yeah, but um, I was hoping to tackle um, questions one, two, and three together. So this is suggestions for adding, removing, or modifying any product categories, recognizing we've heard only general descriptions thereof, um, and clarity and improvement of definitions and rationales. Again, we've only heard pretty descript general descriptions of those. Um, and then are there any specific products that you think we should prioritize or the state should be prioritizing in its evaluation? So this is wide open and Julie, you can go first. <laughs> um, thank you, uh, Kelly, for letting me jump on. Um, and thank you all for the work in preparing this product, uh, priority product work plan. It's very ambitious, which shows the new energy and the growth. So I'm happy to see that. Um, I'm actually gonna start with question four, even though you told me not to, uh, I'm not good at following rules. And that is that I do think that these categories, um, although quite broad, are a good place to be at. And I don't think that it sends a confusing message, but um, that, that's just a brief comment on that question. Um, I do have some specific questions and thoughts on some of the categories. The first one is the, the food contact uh, articles. Um, you roughly define what you mean by contact. Or, and this, the language also in the, I was glancing at the AB 1200 on the surface. Um, and I guess I, I'd suggest that you think hard about what you mean by that in terms of um, whether you are indeed going to limit the scope to only the contact surfaces of food packaging because um, materials change with time. So if this is cooking materials or something that's going in and out of hot temperatures, cold temperatures, the surface could change over time. And so I'm not sure how you would define the surface versus the bulk of the material and how you define what comes in contact. So if, I mean, I know part of this is targeted at Teflon and PFAS, but if you go beyond that to other types of substances, aluminum, alloys, what's going to be in contact with the food, I think you're going to have a little bit of a problem in defining that because that could change with time as the alloy is exposed to temperature, your composition on the surface may change, it could oxidize, it could react with food products. And so I'm not, anyway, if you've given that some thought, or if you want to just uh, speak I think the question is interesting because it, it suggests we may need to look at it to be clear. We had in mind things like food, you know, food processing equipment. So we weren't intending to limit um, the category, but to actually kind of expand it to include yeah. things that weren't just for packaging like prepared food. So I guess um, we do want to think about what it is we want to capture. I think that's a good point. Well, and especially with that expansion, I think if you're looking at food processing, again, you're going to have different different types of foods, different types of chemicals might react with the, that surface material. And so how you define a, a, a contact surface versus the bulk is something that might need to be taken into, into account a little bit and a, a time component, right? As made, they might be one problem, but five years down the road, you might have different um, materials in essentially in these all these uh, products. Um, the second one, can, you've hit on many materials that are closer to me, so I'm going to take a few minutes, um, is the metal plating and finishing facilities. And um, you have uh, galvanizing, anodizing, thermal spraying, and electroplating. And I'm going to put a bold suggestion out there, and that is to add additive manufacturing of metals because metal additive is indeed a way of modifying the surface uh, of a product or changing the finish. It's also a way of making a 3D bulk, but we also use it as an alternative to other coating techniques. So you might, you know, 
cold spray. We also do you know, cold spray. So, but additive, whether you want to jump on that beast or not, I don't know, but this is a place where it could land because it is it, additive does give you different surface finish and it is used also for repair. So it also could land in your motor vehicles where you can essentially weld or repair things through additive techniques uh, of today. Um, the third one is, unless there were any questions or comments on them, no, okay. Um, I, I just will comment that, uh, just a general comment, all of these things you're talking about, there's going to be questions because this <laughs> everyone's listening, okay. um, and and um, we're going to exercise our 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 latitude to contact you independently Absolutely. afterwards. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Absolutely, because we we will be curious about getting more information to learn. Thank Absolutely, you. happy to to be a resource for that is electronics, and there's other people in the room I'm sure who can speak to electronics. Um, but I was curious about the constraint or the definition of the external components of the many electronic products um, contain candidate chemicals, which come in direct contact with users. Um, so again, this idea of external or surface versus something inside and whether you really want to make that distinction or not, um, whether that helps, it seems to me it puts a barrier that you might not want, but it maybe it does refine the scope to something more manageable um, based on the exposure routes. But then you throw in the semiconductors, <laughs> which are not external. Um, so it, it contradicts your, your basis for identifying this category. So I was curious about the semiconductors, but then you have the, the st statement at the end that semiconductor manufacturing may be a source of occupational and environmental exposure. So I was a little confused about why calling out the semiconductors um, specifically is in here. And if you're going to look at manufacturing and occupational exposure, it certainly goes beyond just the semiconductor is the whole process of making electronics. Um, uh, I have one other note, where did it go? Give me a sec. And it came up a little bit earlier on the motor vehicles. What do you consider to be accessories and materials? To me, that's the whole shebang so I, i'm comfortable with that if you're comfortable with that but i think again it's a little bit of language because to say and materials what do you you know when, when you're abbreviating it's when you get into the shorter descriptions that you get yourself in a little bit of trouble as to what you really mean the longer descriptions are a little bit better um so, and glad to see some of these structural materials in there. You're going to have to tackle metals um, in some of these categories. Thank you, Julie. Um, going forward, we should include number four in this. I was looking at a facilitator agenda that had broken out more questions, and it makes sense to just do that one here. Um, does anybody else want to go? I, I could say a few things right now, but I suspect others want, would like to weigh in. So um, Elaine and then Mike. So um, very ambitious and, and a lot of really um, compelling areas that you're looking at. So I, I was kind of looking at um, just, uh, just for clarity and sort of rigor, which I don't know that you need that, but um, it, it kind of might help with communication and then just sort of setting up your work. But the, I think your policy priorities are excellent um, and then really can inform how you scope the, um, the other areas. So, you know, for me, microplastics and metal plating, it seems a little redundant to have like a um, potential for products to release microplastics as a priority, policy priority, and then also to have it as a category. And especially, I think it was Suzanne pointed out that those microplastics will run through several of your 
categories. And um, you do have um, a priority where you have um, extent to which uh, chemicals and products may adversely affect a community, um, including those near manufacturing. So that kind of gets at your metals. And then you have multiple categories with um, particular products that would show up there. So for instance, um, you could call out plating products as subcategories under your uh, focuses of automotive products and building materials without having, you know, just, I feel like maybe that would help you um, organize it. Um, you have paint as a, uh, called out separately. And I, I know you, you know, you talk about why, but it still could just be for clarity, a subcategory of priority focus in building products. And then you could add a focus on, um, well, the building products with, uh, um, metal, uh, plated components, but also potentially there is a good place to add a focus on building products for climate adaptation. Um, just so you can kind of cover some of the um, things that might be seen in the consumer realm sooner rather than later already uh, showing up. Um, I'm sort of wondering about face masks as a separate category. Could it fall under, again, a specific focus? I know you're, you know, you've got at least one hygiene product you're focused on, but is it, could it fall under the hygiene products and then, um, it, I mean, it's not necessary, but it just jumps out as so specific. Um, and then I would add justification there, especially in California, not just COVID, um, but uh, wildfires. Um, and then um, to me, one that really does seem missing, you mentioned textiles, but um, clothing. So clothing and textiles, but clothing, and especially with microplastics, but then sort of, um, to me, calling out, sports equipment is I, I to me the one that's bigger and more um compelling is to kind of frame it as clothing and potentially clothing and textiles with sort of a focus on high performance and sporting gear as a subcategory and that's where you know again microplastics but then a lot of other um interesting kinds of um, materials and, and um, chemicals might show up. Um, and then you ask about um, EJ and how to, you know, you, so you have it in um, your priorities, but also kind of calling that out and as um, worker and community exposure during manufacture use or disposal. And so your building materials, that one's, that one's certainly there. Um, the clothing, if you put clothing in, that one is clearly would be an EJ one and then uh, EJ with e-waste and recycling and things um, and then the metal plating. So that's just kind of one way that um, I would look at it. So before going to Mike and Molly, I just want to clarify, Julie, are you, is that a follow-up or you just hadn't put your, is it quicker? It, should I, I, I was going to try to do a full round. Okay, but if it's really quick, I want to let you to clarify before we move on, but we've forgotten what you said. Um, my question is whether, because so many of these focus on dermal exposure, I'm wondering if it's within the purview um, to think about end of life uh, considerations, because a lot of these, if you, you know, that, that gets more to the bulk material, rather than just the surface. So on the sporting goods equipment is also, you're, you mentioned a lot about that it's being handled by users. So I see that as a justification, but I worry that you're constraining yourself to um, just the dermal exposure and finding solutions to the dermal, which is gonna lead to more coatings and more paint and more you know, surface um, solutions instead of trying to fix the bulk design problem. Anyway, so if that's in your purview, I would consider that. So Andre, then Mike and Molly. Super quick, uh, there'll be longer justifications. This is unfortunately because we, we haven't gotten an approved work plan. So the, when we do get approval to release it, we will expand on some of the stuff that's summarized here. So.
Um, just want to add a quick point to Julie's comment. So when it comes to end of life, I think that's a really uh, important um, exposure scenario for electronics. When you, you know, your question about ex external uh, parts to electronics versus uh, what's the in internal components. So during end of life, when they uh, do recycling of electronics, if it's not done properly, as you know, they put them into big shredders, then it in fact becomes more than thermal exposure, it includes inhalation. Thank you, Art. Thank you for being patient, Mike, and then Molly. So a couple a couple comments. Uh, yeah, I think it, it's a, a great list. I, I think you put a lot of thought into it. it it's, it's vast. It's kind of all-encompassing in a lot of areas. Um, some things that, that occurred to me in reading it earlier, um, face masks. Uh, like that you defined that, you know, this especially catches our attention due to COVID. People use them a lot more. Um, do I think you need to maybe bolster up the definition somewhat because face masks are a medical device, some of them. Um, so, so we're crossing to FDA, just like the food contact, food packaging. Uh, some face masks are OSHA related, the dust masks and everything. So I, I think you just want to clarify that so that if you're going to continue with the transparency, let people know what, what the world is you're potentially looking at. And if you're going to look at a medical device, realize it might take longer for someone to, to alter that going forward. There's no reason they can't alter it, but it might be a bigger time constraint. Um, pet products, uh, a, a nice dovetail there with, your, with, with including the thoughts on these in, increased greatly during COVID because pet products are a similar market. The, the number of them and usage has skyrocketed after COVID. Um, so I think you know that it's a great category to have. Um, make sure you define it as you know either here is a product that's a shampoo or a spray, or here's a pet bed, and we're going to start looking at the flame retardants again. Um, I, I think that's that that's key. And I really like that you brought into that pet products can have human health uh, effects. They can have pet health effects. Um, just be aware as you look at those and you want alternative ass assessments that those toxicological endpoints for pets or for children and people are very different. So I, I would suggest that if you're going to go for it, go for them at the same time. Don't let someone try and do an AA on you that makes it less toxic on a pet. Um, but suddenly it's you've got your children around because a lot of households have pets and children and, and it and I'm sure you, you would make you would catch that, but I think if you include that upfront, then you're not going to get someone doing the effort, and then you have to say no, that didn't include you know the other the other subset. Um, the other another quick comment I had is on the cat product categories that roll over. I think it would be helpful um, with transparency if you could give some rationale as to why they're rolling over. You know, most likely. Due to staffing, you didn't get around to do a full evaluation. Uh, don't leave don't leave people out there thinking, oh, they just don't like this category. They're they're just going to keep adding it over and over and over and again until they can find a reason to come after us. Because that's not the case. You're not persecuting any one category. It is here. It, it it's either we didn't have time to do it or we found new information, whatever. But give them a reason for the rollovers if you if you can legitimately do that. Um, and finally with the question four, um, and this is what I was asking before. I really like this. I like that you're being transparent on the product categories intended for evaluation. So it's not a product category that's added yet. Um, my, my concern why I asked the question before was if you're giving them transparently, here's what we're gonna look at to maybe have product categories in the future. Um, and then you added something else later cause you looked at it, but it wasn't here. So I, I like that you've got this listed it, it's, it's kind of a finite universe now. You could always go and do others if, if information comes in. Um, but I, I think this is a great one. I don't think it's confusing to anyone because you're saying you're going to, in, you're intending to evaluate. You're not saying you added it. So I think it, it's also a good warning to maybe get people to start to take some action early. So I, I think that's a very good thought. Thank you very much, Mike. Uh, Molly, then Suzanne. Um, yeah, yeah, in terms of, uh, number one, I, I guess I just applaud 
when I was looking at the, these list of, uh, of, um, of product categories to consider, I was, okay, Molly, out of the box that they haven't thought about. And I could not, I, I mean, you all, it's so comprehensive in terms of what could be, what's covered, what's the potential concern to all of us in terms of consumer product categories are very comprehensive um, and couldn't really applaud um, you know the, the list that keeps being monitored and archived by staff and ultimately coming up um, my my one you know real applaud is just this new product category around products that contain or generate money. and I'm just trying to think this through steps of what might be considered um, because I'm, I'm feeling like we might enter the domain of what was really narrowly defined in terms of this uh, work, you know, in this notion of a business model. That manufacture plastic cutting boards, are they really? Um, and when I think about the alternatives that can be considered among those products that are generating that microplastics, they're in the space of polymeric materials. That's what these folks do, manufacture polymeric material. Others that don't generate those. It's, it's a question that we just need to be really strategic about in terms of how we frame the opportunity for the other. And it, it's really about forcing manufacturers to think about non-polymeric options. Um, and how do we do that in a space, considering the question that Helen raised earlier about the business? Um, Suzanne already mentioned. Suzanne already mentioned this, but um, you know, I to me, there's just already so many synergies in the product categories that are, are have already be, been elevated. I don't know that you need to identify more. Um, tires, cosmetics, food contact articles, paints, these are all really significant contributors to microplastics that are um, impacting um, uh, humans. I mean, all sorts of studies done in terms of identifying these microplastics and sourcing them to certain things that were being used, um, as well as, uh, you know, impacts to aquatic species and others. They're all in there. Um, and so I'm it just, I'm just trying to figure out, do we need more or we can we leverage that which we've already identified as being, you know, categories of concern. Um, and one, it wasn't a question, but um, it, it's more, for me, it's a, it's a, it's a point around um, the policy priorities themselves. And the first one being that of um, contain, uh, uh, products that, can, that could adversely impact the health of children and workers. Um, in when I look at some of the product categories, they're very, they're very focused on children's products. And I just wanna make sure that that category or that policy priority elevates exposures that can be happening to pregnant women. Most of what I'm seeing in the, in the epidemiologic literature about harms to children, it's, it's, it's in large part happening because of exposures in utero. And so I just wanna make sure that that's explicit. Um, paints is a really good example. I, I follow a lot of the work on, on cancer in children and a lot of what we see in terms of childhood can cancers, we've seen from exposures to, you know, uh, workers who work with paints in their occupational setting, right? So it's more of those volatile compounds that are in paint products, um, exposed, uh, it, you know, either uh, even men prior to conception impacting um, uh, fetal development and later cancers later in life. So I just wanna make sure that that's captured. It's not just children's products, it's products that are impacting, um, you know, prior to conception and in utero that, are, that can impact children's lives later. Um, and I know, these, I know these policy priorities don't have broader definitions to them or explanations, but just making sure that the, that experience is captured. All right, deep breath. <laughs> All right, so um, I've got Suzanne and Helen and Julie, I'm gonna hold off until everybody else has had a chance.
to talk. So Suzanne, you're up. Um, and after Helen, I do want to make sure that Emma and Jack have an opportunity to weigh in on this. Thank you, Molly, for your comments. Um, I agree with all of that, but especially wanted to highlight in light of what I was going to comment on the importance of being able to consider non-polymeric materials as potential replace, replacements when alternatives assessments are being done. I'm just looking at this aluminum water bottle. We recycle 65% of our aluminum in the US, but only 5% of our plastics. So thinking about that end of life component as well. But what I was just going to briefly mention was if we're thinking about specific products for the microplastics category, I know I already mentioned textiles, but the other one that's become a concern are biodegradable and bio-based plastics. Um, they may be better, but they're not necessarily better. And I think they need to be assessed thoroughly before we decide to go with all, you know, PLA cups. Um, they still break down into microplastics and we still have a lot of the same chemicals being used um, in order to make these products additives, fillers, et cetera. So I'll put a plug for that in. There. Thank you very much, Suzanne. Uh, so we're at Helen and then uh, Emma and Jack, if you want to weigh in and I'll come back and catch the folks who haven't had an opportunity. I kind of want to come back to something that um, Mike said earlier today about um, uh, uh, co combining different substances of concern within a single product and just yet again say from industry, <laughs> it is so much better to touch it once get it right and be done. It is really terrible to have to do multiple iterations of remove this chemical, then go back and remove that chemical and then go back and remove that chemical. So just wanna you know, say, do it once, pull the Band-Aid off, get it fixed and, and don't keep going back to the well year after year. It's really hard to, um, yeah, it's just very, very hard. And you, I think you lose a lot of the sort of maybe initial support and momentum, you know, that you might have from some early adopters who want to do a thing, you know, if you are coming back year after year, um, you know, so just, just some feedback. Um, and thank you, Helen. I, I, as I pass this over, um, I do want to second that. Uh, that was something that the brake industry was very clear to us. Uh, Mike, so the, we always talk about brake pads. Here's another opportunity to do that. But uh, I, after being in asbestos, a, a common ingredient in brake pads, they reformulated to formulations that contain lead. And then auto manufacturers established lists uh, with ingredients that they did not want to see in um, new vehicle products and lead got on that list. And that caused uh, brake pad manufacturers to realize that lead wasn't a good alternative. And they reformulated again and wound up adding copper to address the squeal in the latest formulations. And then we show up asking them to take the copper out because it's bad for salmon. We being a folks, a coalition of folks involving local governments or water quality protection programs. So it, the, the, practically the first thing out of the box was, uh, when do we stop? <laughs> you know, how can we know what's safe? So I, I've heard that and I have complete understanding for why the department is coming back to manufacturers, uh, why the structuring is, is such. And some of that has actually been pushed back from the manufacturers. But just as a thought that, that maybe in the next cycle, I'm looking at piloting a multi-ingredient product chemical combination uh, would be something to try just to see how that works and see how the industry and, and the department can handle that or if they can handle that. Um, so Emma and Jack, I, I can't see you on the screen. Do either of you want to weigh in on number one through four questions? This is Emma. I've been eyeing number five a little bit and may have some comments there, but otherwise I don't have um, additional comments on one through four. <clears throat> this is Jack. I think the intended for evaluation section is a really good one. I agree with previous comments. Um, under things that products that contain or generate microplastics, bottom line is that includes textiles because they generate microplastics when they wear out, wear down, get laundered, get tumble dried. So I think you basically captured the entire uh, uh, universe of potential microplastics. It might be worth just defining it a bit better. Um, so I, I think you need to look at that definition and maybe fine tune it a bit before it goes public. 
Thank you, Jack. Uh, Tim, you haven't weighed in here. Do you have anything to say? Okay, and as everyone else, so do you want to weigh in? And then I can let Julie talk. I'll say a few words at the end. Thanks, I think I'm just saying plugs for uh, echoing and amplifying some of the other comments that have been here, been already made. Um, these are really comprehensive. Between <laughs> buildings and automobiles, you're, you're touching most of the global supply chains. So, you know, light lift uh, for you all. Um, and then I think just some clarification, and maybe Andre, you've already said this, that when we when we get the full work plan, we'll have a little more rationale. I, the um, pet care and sporting and athletic equipment, uh, those cover a lot of different kinds of products. It would be helpful to know more which ones you're targeting. Um, but anyway, you know I, that. I should say that the rationale for the some of the intended for evaluation categories is, are shorter. Um, so we can... Sort of, we can take a look at that, but um, yeah, definitely this, a lot of food for thought. Carl. Well, I was just going to make a, a, a couple of general comments. One, thank you for all your input. It's really helpful. Um, and we, uh, you're right. I mean, we're covering a lot of ground here. Um, but I think I want to remind folks that this uh, one, we're hoping to get more of these comments when we go out with the, the, the draft and, and we'll be getting comments on that and workshopping that. But also um, it is just the menu. And really some of these issues are really come down to when you're making the order, right? And so whether that's, um, we're gonna have um, multiple chemicals in, in a product that poses some really interesting things that we were gonna, we're gonna need support and input on. Um, and certainly some of these other issues about um, looking at um, the, the, the span of what, what, who's in control of what and what, what we're talking about and can you do a whole product versus that product and is that viable or not? And those are really important. Those will be factors for us ultimately when we decide which products we select. So um, it's really good to be at a place where we uh, on many others have I think the community practice has gotten much better. There's a lot more tools or better at them, but there's still some really big questions. Uh, so I don't wanna discount um, the need to have ongoing input uh, well beyond the work plan, which is just the menu. So thank you. So Julie, thanks for your patience. And then I'll say a few words and then we can move on to the EJ questions. Yeah, I actually just had a question and depending on the answer, maybe a suggestion. Um, and it's related to number four and Mike's comment about also broad is good, but will it scare people? Will they be worried that everything under the sun is now on your menu? And so my question was, you mentioned the lead acid battery report. Do you generate a report like that for all the categories that you sunset? so that you can at least speak to the fact that not everything moves forward? That's a really great question. And um, we did, we were doing that in several ways. One, no, we don't generally do an after uh, work plan report on the category, but we have been putting out information on specific research we've done specifically uh, in the personal care products and nail products, for example, we, um, uh, evaluated in the nails um, arena, some 32, I don't know, I'm like, we um, evaluated a lot of chemicals that were on the dialogue of concern that we sort of determined we aren't that concerned about right now. And we think it's important that we share that information because we do a lot of work that isn't about targeting and putting through the process, it's sorting and sifting. And so we wanna share that. I think we need to do a better job of that. Um, and, and figure out ways to how best to do that because we're also reluctant to in that space um, put out information that people misconstrue as saying oh it's safe right um, because it, we're looking at it in a very specific context so I, I you know we'd be interested in ways to improve that process but we do I think it's important that we share all the work we're doing because um, uh, it helps everyone so Andre, did you want to add on to that? I do. Uh, we do have a uh, page on our website where we are, we've started posting product chemical profiles and other similar documents uh, that summarize our evaluations and findings for products that we, for one reason or another, decide not to regulate. So currently we have 
food packaging with PFASs. We kind of aborted that project with the, um, the signing of, of AB 1200. And then phthalates and food packaging was one of the food packaging categories that we looked at. We have some other things that we intend to put on this list as well. So we are trying to at least close out and show our work for products that don't end up in a regulation. However, um, for the other things, maybe we could think about that. I mean, we do put the background documents on the post them on the website and they do stay there for broader categories that we that may not end, end up resulting in something that we regulate. So maybe we need to think about linking those to this things that we evaluated but didn't regulate page. <clears throat> and I, I wanna thank Julie for asking that question because I've had that question myself and I, I have dug through and found these little bits and traces there and think the staff does a lot of good work at, to so encouraging you to consider how you might be transparent, you know, what ways those, is, I, I understand papers and, you know, some things get to a written product and some things don't even get that far. So the more, the, the more you can share what you've learned, because there's often a lot of very thoughtful, good work on something that doesn't wind up being a priority product. Um, so before we move over to the EJ question, um, I do have a few comments of my own. Um, the first one about pet products, I was very glad to see that that one there. Uh, before the pandemic, I think half of California households had a pet of one type or another. It's a, it's a very high number. Um, I've been working on water pollution associated with uh, pet products, specifically uh, pet parasite products. And the literature there has shown me the incredible amount of exposures that not just water, but people have associated with those products. Uh, products applied externally to the pet that people think stay on the pet, they don't. A really disgusting set of studies with like UV, I was showing the stuff moving all over the house and all over everyone's hands. And there's a transfer, anything that's on the outside of the pet winds up in water and wastewater and could affect recycled water and the ability to afford to use, create new potable water supplies and which we're gonna have to have over the next coming decades. I, it's just amazing to me, the amount of exposure and babies, you know, people say, oh, children aren't exposed to this. And you know, we actually, I worked with a wastewater agency group and they had a baby sleeping next to a dog <laughs> just as, as part of their outreach pieces, just to show that the levels of exposure at all these different ways, even things intaken by um, an animal can be excreted. That's less, that's a pretty, I, I, I thought of that as a remote pathway, but somebody actually did some studies where they had dogs swimming and you could measure the chemicals in the oral um, medications uh, in the water after like a short swim of just a few minutes before the pet decided to get out of the pool. Uh, so I, this seems to me to be a really important category and also important uh, because the FDA does not do environmental analyses of any completeness at all when they're registering products. It's a really big oversight. There's some discussion of transfer of some products from EPA authority to FDA authority, and that would leave a complete regulatory gap around those products. So um, I, I think this is a, an area that should be scoped very broadly to allow the department to have a look at this and consider that uh, really surprising scope of exposures and pathways and products that are out there and lack of information thereof. Um, I'm also very supportive of the auto products category, and I would certainly encourage also scoping that very broadly, at least initially, you know, recognizing that you'll be using the lens of your priorities to pick which product products are out there. Uh, I'm encouraging this for a couple of reasons. One is the industry disruption that Helen mentioned uh, with the shift to EVs. There's a huge change in the industry. There's a lot of disruption happens. Disruption is, is an opportunity in addition to a big cost. So this is the opportunity to make safer cars and safer car products. I, there's going to be a whole new way of maintaining and doing all these other things with vehicles. So I, I see this as just a huge opportunity for the department to see, is there a place it could or should? To intervene in that change. Um, in addition to that, there's a lot of EJ issues. There's a lot of worker safety issues because of the small businesses. There's PFAS and CarWax. That's one of Kelly's favorite items. Um, and um, 
the aftermarket products don't have the same level of protection and oversight that you see with the original equipment products. So there can be some really different things. There's a lot of overseas supply chains, uh, which also create problems and make it more difficult. It, it just seems really important. Um, I'm super supportive of paints. I already mentioned my concerns about PFAS and microplastics. Um, for sporting equipment, I, a couple of exposures that I, I think about a lot with, with that, it really weird, or one is uh, when you go for a swim, you're intimately exposed and breathe the chemicals that are in the water. Some of those are pesticides and some of those are not. So there's a lot of exposure there. That's a really high exposure scenario for a person because you got it on your skin, you're breathing right at the surface of the water. Um, and I, I, I've got to say, I was just so grossed out when I discovered there was BPA in my gym attire. It's, I, I'm one of those people who does, um, so sporting bras and, and leggings and things like that. I, I do those spin classes. And I, when you're done with one of those, so for those who don't do this kind of thing, I hope I'm probably just a little vivid, but when you're done, you're completely soaked. I mean, I can wring out my gear. I am fully exposed to any chemicals in what I'm wearing at the time. And that's, and that's true that there's all these very special interactions with sporting gear. So I'm glad the department is thinking about that and we'll decide whether or not my particular exposures are a priority. But again, I encourage the, <laughs> the breath there. And, and finally on microplastics, again, I also think this is very broad, although tires and fibers um, and paint are probably the leading sources of microplastics in the environment. Uh, we do know that, and food containers degrading are important sources as well. Um, there's a lot of different ways they get there. So for example, uh, for fibers, the myth has been that most of those come from washers. Um, available data are starting to clarify that it's actually microplastics exhausted outdoors. Um, and one of the very important sources outdoors may very well be um, dryers. So our, our, our US level tumble, tumble dryers may be a big issue. So the other categories wouldn't catch the tumble dryer pathway. So uh, just advising breadth there. And thank you for listening to that long list of things. Uh, we should have 15 minutes now to tackle question five on EJ communities if folks still, or maybe everybody needs to go like this and stretch a little bit before we move on. Um, <laughs> yeah, so encourage that, okay. So, um, but I would like to hear folks input on um, the EJ community question. I think this is a really substantive question. And I'm wondering if somebody who isn't needing a stretch at this very second would like to start. Oh, so Molly's gonna ask a question and then Anne and, oh, and Helen. Okay. So it's, it's just a question. I mean, when you look at the policy priority language, um, absolutely screams environmental justice but it doesn't say environmental justice. So it talks about vulnerable population, vulnerable and dis, dis, uh, proportion, yeah, populations. Uh, and, then, and then our entire conversation focuses in on, on environmental justice, but I'm just wondering what was the rationale for not stating explicitly in the priority environmental justice? There is a rationale, I can't remember what it is, but it was done deliberately. <laughs> I'm sorry. I mean, it's more in, it's steps. more inclusive how it reads, right. but it I also it if it's meant to really focus in on environmental justice, I'm wondering why it doesn't say environmental justice. The one one thing that I'm aware of is that we did not want to necessarily conflate Native American communities and environmental justice communities. Um, that's one thing that I recall coming up. Um, uh, so I. I don't know if one of our staff who's present can speak to that, but there was some thought that went into it, but um, I, I think this is Molly, a good um, reminder of the importance of that we communicate in the, what we're talking about. And certainly I think it's safe to say that one of the things that the department at large, not just our program is learning is how to, how to talk about these issues in, with the right language, with the right intention, intentionality. And so I think it's a good point for us to go back and when the draft comes out to make sure that it's really clear what we're talking about, how comprehensive it is and how we're balancing those things out. The other, the other term that I, I feel is um, better aligns also with some of the more federal ish, uh, initiatives that are getting at this issue is being inclusive of also the term disadvantaged communities. Um, why, why, I don't know, but that's, what's, that's the language that's in the climate, in, um, the climate justice work. Um, but it might, it, it, to, 
to be all inclusive, it just might deserve looking back to see how of all these initiatives are being inclusive of the terms themselves, Maybe. because it is quite, yeah. Internally, we, we need to map out the Venn diagram of what those terms encompass and yeah. then make sure we're using terms that aren't inadvertently gonna be, um, you know. Non-inclusive of some population. Right, but also yep. we don't wanna be, uh, you know, inadvertently offend somebody by using, including people in categories. We want to be mindful of all those things. Is anyone with their um, card up looking to weigh in on this particular question? Yeah, just before. Okay. So I, I think I saw Ann, Tim, and Helen. Do you want to go first? Okay. Um, in terms of reaching out to impacted communities, um, I, I wanted to. <laughs> um, one thing that I, I would just think, you know, put out as an idea and, and encourage you to do is actually to engage with the local employers. So as someone who actually has roots in um, one of these types of communities, um, some of those employ some of those sources of exposure are coming from the major employers of the people in that community. And so my concern, and they had this with the platers and with all the other those type of uh, chemical intensive industries is that if you go in and say, okay, well, we're going to get rid of hexavalent chromium, which would be great. I support that. But they're like, you know, we can't make what we need to here. So we're going to shut this facility down. You have just really harmed that community. So I want to just make sure that, that as you're reaching out, you're not just talking to the community activists, that's important, but you actually also, I think, should be talking to the employers, the major industries directly to make sure they're part of the process and that they don't just immediately evacuate if there's any threat of regulation. And as, as we go over to Ann and Tim, Emma, I saw your hand, the electronics in the room just went out. So we're trying to reconnect and we definitely will hope we can hear you audio if not see you visibly okay okay so I, i'll let ann and tim go and then see if we can get actually see emma and if we can't we can at least hear emma very good so so these are questions that um as many of you know and many of you have worked on are are close to my heart and have been core to my career uh, in the environmental health and justice community. And in my current role is I serve as program officer for another foundation um, reaching 65 grantees across the US who work precisely on these. So as you approach communities, there's a lot of communities in, in California. Um, I would say particularly in the LA area, we're talking about small employers in Southeast LA, industries that we all know and love, uh, metal finishing, auto repair. Um, and now there's a huge just transition EJ effort around uh, plastics as well. It's like, how, how do we bring EJ voices to that discussion? So as, as you start to look at these different categories, I'm more than happy to serve as a resource to connect you to folks who are working with communities directly. Um, and what the first question was, uh, was another piece of that. How to prioritize. Prioritize, how to prioritize, thank you. Um, I think there's a combination of uh, the data mining that you have access to now is like overlapping uh, where are, for consumer products particularly, where are places, uh, stores located uh, close to EGI communities and what are they uh, what are they selling to those communities and you could do overlays with you know exposure mapping store locations um, uh, zip code exposure data demographic data um, and then also it's getting late in the day I know we're all I'm feeling us all <laughs> drain a little bit um, and I'll have other suggestions if you if you want to pursue that further but I think you've got lots of opportunities with your new data team to to work on that. Tim, you're up. Thanks. Um, so like when I saw this question, I thought to myself, well, prioritize imply certain things like you're comparing across these categories, right? These product, uh, potential product, chemical combinations, or when you're within a particular category which to me is like, okay, so that's sort of its own comparative assessment. So I got some trouble kind of giving good feedback here because I still don't really have a good sense of how um, you make the, ult the decision, right? So to, in order to like say, hey, how do you prioritize this factor? You really kind of need a good idea about how the decision's made so that a prioritization would impact your decision in what way, you know what I mean? So 
So I'm going to offer a suggestion, but it might be totally pointless because you might make decisions in ways that don't kind of fit with this. And also, you just won this lawsuit that kind of like gave you the thumbs up on the way you make these sorts of decisions. So maybe you don't want to mess with it, right? Because it's so I'm recognizing all that. My thought on this is um, I would try to come up with some type of process that kind of systematically thinks about environmental justice, uh, you know, disadvantaged communities, so on and so forth. So like, for example, you might think about, well, what are the different ways in which communities may be impacted? So I think about it in terms of like, okay, at the manufacturing stage, so like the stuff I think Anne and others have been talking about, all the data that's there about where things are made and where people are located and that sort of stuff. And then there's impacts at the use of stage or folks from these communities impacted, particularly because of the use, you know, certain types of products end up in their hands and uh, more privileged folks don't get by those products, right? So use and then end of life, right? So I think about it in each of those ways and try to capture kind of the, you know, the impact the relative impact across these different product categories, you know, at each of those stages to those communities so that you could, like, if you're thinking about, well, are we thinking about this product uh, chemical combination or that one or that one, which one should we focus on and prioritize? You'd be comparing apples to apples across them. So you'd get a relative sense of, you know, uh, what seems to be more of, of greater concern on your factor of environmental justice. So I'm thinking something like sort of either a qualitative or semi-quantitative sort of index that would give you a relative sense of what the environmental justice impacts of these materials are. And then you could look across, that's a way of prioritizing because you'd get a good sense of where most concern sits and then you would have to fit that into all the other factors you're thinking about. That's just how I think about it. If I can just say, there's a ton of, there's a ton of stuff on how to prioritize in this way um, that you may or may not be interested in, so. <laughs> Thank you, Tim. Always organized. And Emma, we've actually got you back on the screen after a bunch of tech delays. I'm very much looking forward to your thoughts. Thank you. Yeah, I um, uh, I was thinking again about the cumulative impacts topic that was raised earlier um, and how engaging communities will intersect with considering and addressing cumulative impacts. So I was I was thinking um, along three lines here. The, the first one is really how, how do you effectively prioritize? I think you need to go into some communities because you've got so many categories here that will, um, where there will be uh, uses and exposures in the same community and ask the communities what's important to them because that's empowering. Um, and that will start to have a dialogue of getting at what is the totality of exposures, which is some of the language we use when we define cumulative impacts, the totality of exposures they're dealing with. Um, now that's a lot of work. And so I was reflecting on uh, your work on nail products. And I think that you did some engagement there. And um, I'm assuming there's some, some lessons learned in that experience. Secondly, um, community engagement has a lot of more um, interest and focus now. And, and um, was it Kelly who commented on people uh, uh, she knows is working with in that area, but it does take a certain um, thoughtful approach such that you, you may want to be engaging more in the social science and community expert space, but once you have that relationship, there are probably going to be trusted representatives who will who will come forward and talk to you. And I think that can then potentially set up a long, some long-term input. And I was even, I was brainstorming to myself, so I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna throw it out there, thinking about whether there's the potential to have some kind of panel, EJ panel, who who can give input to you. Um, maybe there's room for that, maybe there isn't. 
Well, those are those are a few thoughts to add to the conversation. Carl, go ahead. Thank you, Emma. Uh, thank you, Emma, um, and thank you for the, this. Is um, really important to us because it's new for us, and we we are looking for active ways that we can explore how to better meet these goals, which are fairly clear to us. But the how do we get there, and how do we prioritize, and how do we make decisions? And I did want to share that you know one of the things we've been doing uh, when we held um, a workshop on. Um, hair care products for women of color. Uh, that was a really great learning experience for us. We worked with our Office of, Extre of Environmental um, Equity uh, and we had staff in the LA area um, working, um, doing some outreach to actually hear from women who use these products, you know, what were they, and, and to educate us on, on their perspective. Uh, and we've also uh, started doing some survey work uh, for um, in salons uh, for the same types of products. And we've been also uh, recently talking to um, folks at Breast Cancer Prevention Partners about the possibility of collaborating with them on some of the work they've done in the communities, working with um, manufacturers of personal care products for black women. And to your point, Helen, talking to those small businesses that are that both part of that community and serving that community in developing the products. So we're starting that process of trying to figure out how we can have some of those conversations. Um, and again, back to the work, it's great we have people who now are gonna have the time to do that. Um, and um, we're also really looking forward to collaborating with our partners in other states and with EPA and others uh, to learn about how best to do that and, and, and what other people have learned as well. So I really appreciate your, your input. It's very timely. Thank you, Carl. Um, and thank you again, Emma. I, I particularly wanna thank Emma for raising the thing that I was gonna raise, which is that I, I think the most important thing in, in terms of diversity, equity, justice, is really asking people what they want um, and not just asking, just input, but actually what do they want to own as their project? You know, what, what is the problem they want to solve? I know the department is really working hard on developing relationships uh, with communities disadvantaged and highly exposed and all kinds of all the other words we might use communities. And the, this program might be able to leverage some of those relationships um, it, it's a long journey to get from just hearing what people want and trying to filter it yourself to the point at which they feel confident saying, we want, we, we, we want to do this project and work with the department on it. Uh, that's something at my organization at SFEI has actually been really exploring ourselves internally, uh, how we can better support uh, our communities uh, with our group of scientists and the kind of work that we do. Um, and that's caused us to, before we did a lot of, here, let's go do a project that we think will help a group or we've heard or seen some data or something else. And now we're advancing to, uh, we'll, we'll work for a group to accomplish what they're, they're gonna do. So DTSC is never gonna work for a group per se, but it's a very different relationship to execute what people want instead of telling them, here's what we can do for you. So I, that's a challenge, I guess, I'm making. Um, and if Becky Sutton were here, she would have been able to articulate this much more clearly and could share some constructs to organize thinking that, that we've been using that have been super helpful. Anyway, um, are there any other comments on this? I, I wanna offer um, I, Art uh, the opportunity for a few words in closing um, today, but I just wanted to double check before we wrap up. Uh, this is Strack. Just one question on, you say prioritizing consumer products that may have disproportionate impact. I'm not quite sure what that means, but I'm, I'm thinking it could be along the lines. Do consumers in these areas use different types of products to different extent? Now, I'll go back to the uh, pesticide. Maybe they use twice as many pesticides as normal people, as non-disadvantaged communities. Do we? Have, I don't know if we have any data on that because that would, to me, help prioritize those consumer products. Uh, it it may not just be that they're cheaper. It may just be that they use a lot more of certain times for certain kinds for various reasons. Thank you, Jack. 
Um, I did promise if anyone wanted to say anything else, I'm kind of sensing no, given the antsiness in the room. And I wasn't sure if staff wanted to ask any other clarifying questions or wanted anything else from us before we move into the closing part of the meeting. Do you have any questions? I, I didn't want to take any more time. So I'll, I'll just say, um, put in more, one more plug for measuring. Um, it, and sometimes that does mean go, it often means going and asking people what they think problems are, but that, you know, we, we do know that, um, for instance, some of the PFAS chemical, PFAS, uh, chemicals redundant, PFAS are actually um, measured at higher levels in higher income communities, right? So it just, just, uh, just higher impact, who's, who's, you know, what are higher um, impacted communities really experiencing? And so, so you can learn a lot by asking questions, but sometimes we just have to go in and be a little deliberate. And so partnering um, with your, with your other um, organizations that to, to maybe do some, some dedicated screening kinds of occurrence sampling and just see if there's things there that, you know, we're not aware of, um, could be part of the uh, way to prioritize. All right. Well, thank you all. I, this was a very robust discussion again, even though we're all a little bit tired, I'm hoping we'll be able to be refreshed uh, with a good night's sleep um, for tomorrow morning. Um, but now I'm gonna turn it over to Art. Yeah, for I think for those of us who have been part of the Green Ribbon Science Panel uh, from the beginning, it was just really impressive and rewarding to see what has been accomplished. So just congratulations to Carl and to the entire team. And also, you know, the, uh, seeing the outstanding game plan you have going forward, uh, just again, really impressive. Um, what was it that you want me to say? I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm really tired. You can say whatever you want. <laughs> <laughs> and um, uh, as exciting as tomorrow's uh, session is going to be on regulatory response, it's something that I've been wanting to see for a really long time. Unfortunately, I'm not going to be here. I have another, uh, I have a scheduling conflict. So it's just, it's been a pleasure to be a coach here on this panel, so. Well, let me just add our, um, I know I speak for everyone and for Meredith too, that uh, how much we appreciate your leadership and participation. It's been a long journey um, and we've made a lot of progress and, and you've been a big part of that and we really appreciate it. So thank you. So uh, again, I just want to thank everyone, um, the committee for the thought and preparatory work that you did for today. Uh, looking for some forward to robust discussions tomorrow as well. Um, I want to thank the staff team and leadership for organizing and supporting a really great meeting. And most importantly, I want to thank the staff team for doing the work because that's what's really making the difference for California. We will continue to challenge you um, in all kinds of new ways. And that um, I hope you will take that as a, a, a a challenge and not an indication of criticism. I think you heard a lot of support today and that is true, that is where we are. So our, our jobs as an advisory committee are to help the department succeed um, and to do the best we can to help the department do the best job it can for California and beyond. So um, the staff have already mentioned that they might reach out to us individually and I hope we're prepared to do that. Um, and finally, I just, I cannot thank Art enough. I'm sad that you won't be able to be here tomorrow and uh, we will soldier on in your honor. <laughs> Do tomorrow, 
No, <laughs> that's I got the wrong words. So I, I won't be gone. I'm I, actually a couple other people won't be able to be here tomorrow. Uh, but it, tomorrow is also the day where we're uh, we'll be turning over to new leadership, and I'm looking forward to that event at the end of the meeting because it is um, a wonderful joy to um, be part of leading this group, and also it's a joy that should be shared by others and rotated on a regular <laughs> basis. <laughs> So with that, um, I, uh, let me just make yeah. one other comment. So one of the privileges of being the coach here, it's actually getting to see uh, something that Kelly just mentioned, the amount of work behind the scenes that the staff does. It's just tremendous. Um, their, their tireless efforts and their uh, energy, uh, just it's amazing. So, yeah. So the final bureaucratic before we adjourn is as a reminder, in order to comply with the Bagley Keene Open Meeting Act, we ask that panel members refrain from discussing the agenda topics outside the meeting, and we will see you at 9 a.m. tomorrow. Thank you very much. The meeting is adjourned for the day.